Audio Sorceress presents the unabridged recording of I Was Born Ruined, Death by Daybreak, Book One. Written by C.M. Stunich, narrated by Brooke Daniels and Alan Carlson. What sort of girl loves sin like I do? What sort of person thrives in it? I'm the princess to a dirty throne of motorcycles and madness, daughter of the president of the Death by Daybreak Motorcycle Club. My father's four closest officers, men dressed in blood and death and sin. They're my honor guard, cloaked in leather vests and tattoos. Only there's nothing honorable about them at all. They're all wrong for me. Every motorcycle club has its old ladies. These guys, they share one. They share me. Chapter One My first memory is of feeling protected, safe. Even now, the scent of leather and motor oil calms my nerves. The roar of an engine, a siren song that I can't resist. For years, I lived under the blanket of a lie, knowing that there were people out there who would protect me, no matter what, who had my back. It made the world seem less scary, more manageable. Then one day, I can't remember when, I woke up and realized it. My protectors, my family, they were the monsters, and their protection came with a hefty price. My legs are cloaked in black, smooth lines of leather that hang over the edge of the crumbling brick wall. In one hand, I have a cigarette. In the other, a small paper bag wrapped around a bottle. Inside, there's about half a liter of Jameson with lipstick smudges around the rim. Jump, Gidge! My best friend, Reba, says from below. She's dressed like a nun, in a long navy skirt that tangles in the brambles, and a white cardigan slung over slim shoulders. It's why we get along, me and Reba. I'm sin, and she's salvation. That's why we work. I don't think I could handle two of me in the same town, let alone the same school or party or sleepover. I know, you're afraid of hats. She starts but I'm already taking another swig of the whiskey and hopping down to land in a crouch beside her. I might be wary of heights, but I'm not sure that I'm afraid. I'm not sure that I'm afraid of anything. Not anymore. That's what growing up around monsters will do to you. There must be easier ways to get to the bonfire, she says, unhooking a stray thorny blackberry arm from the shoulder of her sweater. Black say, in a car? I take a drag on my cigarette and give her a look. Nobody in their right mind would risk giving me a ride, I say, pushing past her and following a narrow trail through the brush. And even if we could find somebody crazy enough to pick us up, there's always the chance Kat or somebody else in the club might see us on the road. Can't risk it. Reba sighs and pushes some of her wavy red hair over one shoulder. Yet another reason we're friends. Her father's the pastor of a local church. Mine's the president of an outlaw motorcycle club. She's been trained to hate him from birth. I've hated him since I was 15. We might be complete opposites, but we have that in common. Everybody else in this town, they're too scared of my dad to hate him. Reba thinks she's got God on her side. I'm not sure that I believe in God, but I sure as shit believe in the devil. I've seen him. Him? and his demons. And they all ride in Cat's Motorcycle Club, Death by Daybreak, MC. They wear leather vests and smoke cigarettes, fuck groupies and drown themselves in booze and the skunky sweet scent of pot. They tame wild beasts made of chrome, bury men in the woods behind my grandmother's house, and they don't lose a wink of sleep about any of it. I used to think of them as giants, guardians, 
Big men with beards and tattoos and arms rippling with muscles that stood watch over me, like an honor guard over a princess. I don't think that anymore. I can't believe you talked me into going to this, Reba whispers, her southern accent as thick as the humidity clinging to the late evening air. It's getting dark, and in the distance, I swear, I can see fireflies. They don't live in the Pacific Northwest, but a girl can dream, right? I lead the way through the brush, alternating drags of my cigarette with sips of the whiskey. It burns my throat going down, but it's the only thing that keeps the memories at bay, locks them up and throws away the key. I'm only 17. I shouldn't have to deal with this kind of shit yet. Hang-ups and nightmares and emotional triggers are for people who've lived and loved and experienced and traveled. I've been trapped in a cage my whole life. So why is this happening to me? Old memories flicker up from the darkest depths of my soul. Blood drips to the floor in thick crimson drops. It pools around the knife, stains her white shirt red. It's too personal, the way she watches that blade like she knows. She knows she's going to die. And I know it too. Ain't nobody wants to relive that shit. I shake my head to clear the image of my dead sister. It's our last big hurrah before senior year, I say, looking up at the yellow-brown leaves on the trees. It's been a hot summer, too hot. Everyone in our neighborhood has a dead lawn and shriveled bushes, dusty driveways, and a newfound hatred for the sun. Our little Oregon town is more than ready for fall. We have to make an appearance. We don't have to do a darn thing, sugar, Reba says with an exasperated little sigh. I glance back at her and see her pinching the scooped bridge of her button nose. She's the perfect southern belle, Reba is. A Tennessee transplant with a closet alcoholic mother and a proselytizing father. I'm not judging her or them. I don't have room to judge anyone. But I can sense that this is where the conversation's heading. We're better than them. Then all of that nonsense. You might be, I say, giving her one last look before I turn my attention back to the trail, but I know I'm sure as hell not. I ignore Reba until I finish my cigarette. As much as she complains, I know she wants to be here too. Everybody else will be. The whole goddamn senior class. She wouldn't miss it for the world. Reba and I might be best friends, but she's also friends with three other girls. Dina, Shardu, and Amaya. She'll want to see them. Let them know that even if she hangs out with me, she can just as easily slip into their group and be one of them, too. A few minutes later, I'm starting to feel the Jameson in my blood and my steps get a little wobbly, my leather boots stumbling to the edge of the path as I weave my way through pines still green with needles and deciduous trees with sun-bleached leaves. Buzzed like this. The whole landscape looks prettier somehow, less dead and dry and more, I don't know, magical. Despite the heat, a chill runs down my spine. Do you hear that? Reba asks from behind me. I do. Music, I say with a sloppy, whiskey-laden grin. The sound of an 80s rock ballad sneaks through the trees, weaves itself into the wind and teases my hair. Johnny R. must be DJing tonight. He's the only person I know under the age of 30 who still listens to Leonard Skinner. But since he's also the only person with a professional DJ for a dad, a dad who lets him borrow his equipment, mind you, he gets to play whatever he wants. We hit the edge of the trees and break through to the flickering light of a bonfire, built up and burning in an old swimming pool behind an abandoned country house. According to my mom, the family that lived there lost it to foreclosure in the 70s. It's been empty for so long that even she used to party here. There are people everywhere, at least half the senior class and some of the juniors, too, mingling around the edges of the pool, sitting on the weathered old deck with the missing railing, even lounging on the roof. I don't wait for Reba. She'll want to check in with Dina, Shardu, and Amaya first and head straight across the patchy, shriveled stretch of lawn and weeds over to where Johnny K is sitting, smoking a joint 
and watching his friends feed wood from a stack of old pallets into the flames. In sixth grade, both Johnny R. and Johnny K. wanted to simply be Johnny. Our class organized a fight out on the blacktop, right over the faded mural of all 50 states in bright primary colors. They beat the shit out of each other, so bad that by the time the teachers caught on to us, both boys had to pay a visit to the local emergency room. After that, it was pretty obvious that both Johnny Rainier and Johnny Kinner were going to have to settle for sharing the name. It hasn't been an issue since. Mind if I have a drag? I ask, sitting down next to him and not caring that the school's star quarterback is checking out the low plunging V of my shirt. I wore it on purpose. Not for him, but for me. It's my body, and I'll decide how it's dressed. Not my father, not the club, not anyone. God, if he knew I was here tonight. I laugh, and Johnny K gives me a strange look, his blue eyes flickering like he wants to fuck me, but also like he thinks I might be crazy. Yeah, sure. Johnny passes over the joint and then runs his palm over the short, shaved brown hair on the top of his head. He's got a nice wide chest, big arms for a high school boy. But I'm not interested. I'm ruined for high school boys. I think I was born ruined. I take the joint from him and pause at the sound of squealing tires. Glancing over my shoulder to see our school's running back, Trevone Hunley, coming down the curving dirt and gravel road like a bat out of hell. A plume of dust rises in his wake, highlighted by the two massive floodlights posted near the road. It curves past the collapsed fence of the old house's backyard and winds its way down the hill into town. I have no idea what Travone and his crew were up to in the woods back there. Frankly, I don't want to fucking know. I ignore him as he climbs out of his car with a hoot, dragging his best friend, Kellen Doty, and the girl they're always fighting over, Tina Flacco, behind him. I haven't seen the three of them at all this summer, but last I knew, she was sleeping with them both. Good for her. I doubt either of those football douches saves it just for Tina anyway. Whoa, look what the cat dragged in, Travone says, flashing a white tooth grin my direction, dropping his legs over the side of the pool and reaching for the joint. I take a long, hot drag, smoke burning my lungs as I hold it in as long as I can and then pass it over. Miss Daybreak herself. Dad, you let you out of his cage for the night? Let's just say I pick the lock, shall we? I tell him with a smile, leaning back and enjoying the warm summer air on my bare shoulders and arms, the silver bracelets on my left wrist tinkling. Raven dark hair falls down my back in a silken wave as I look up at the stars, silver pinpricks of light in the navy wash of sky. Good deal, Trevone says, taking two drags before giving the joint to Tina. He hops down in the pool and within seconds, the bonfire is climbing with orange and red fingers, digging its claws into the darkness and driving it back to the fringes of the yard. More people arrive, big groups of them stuffed into cars, bringing coolers and kegs and unbridled laughter. I watch them all, part of the group but somehow still alone, sitting in my red satin halter top and leather pants, kicking the soles of my black-heeled boots against the side of the pool. For a while there, I almost forget who my dad is, laughing and drinking and smoking until my head feels like it's spinning. Well, somebody sure is having a good time, Reba says, sitting down beside me, proper in all the places that I'm improper, almost indecent, really. Cat would so kill me for this. Some people, ignorant people, think that having a dad named Cat is a little weird, especially considering his chosen profession. But the guys call their president that for a reason. Cats are some of the most efficient hunters on the planet, taking down a wide variety of prey. And also, everyone knows that well-fed house cats kill for fun. Toy with their prey, play with it, torture it before they kill it. That's my dad. That's Cat, president of Death by Daybreak MC. And sometimes I think he's just as hard on his daughter as he is his enemies. A really fucking good time.
I say, leaning into her. The acrid smell of smoke curls around the pair of us, me with my Jameson and Reba with her plain old Coca-Cola. We sit there for the longest time, until Johnny K asks Reba to dance, and she accepts, joining the crowd to the right of the pool and hitting the makeshift dance floor with moves that were probably outdated by the time this old house was built. A few minutes later, Johnny R. gives up on trying to convert us all to records and old school rock and sets up a playlist on his iPhone, leaving the DJ station to invite me to dance next. I abandon the now empty bottle of whiskey, run my tongue over my teeth to make sure there aren't any lipstick stains, and take his hand. It's warm and sweaty and unsure. Joining Johnny R. in the empty dirt patch where my classmates grind and bump and grin and grope, I know I'm dancing with a boy instead of a man. Flickers of a different party, a different moment, a different dance partner skitter around the edges of my mind, but I ignore them, letting the booze and the weed keep control of my brain and all the horrible things crawling around inside of it. After a few songs, I push Johnny R. away and stumble over to the edge of the yard, where the black silhouettes of trees stand guard like silent ghosts. Putting my hand on the faded white paint of an apple tree trunk, I lean over and try to fight the sudden, overwhelming nausea spiraling through me. It doesn't help that on the ground near my boots, the plump corpses of rotten fruit litter the dirt like splotchy scabs. The scuff of a rubber sole on the ground nearby draws my attention up and over to the black-on-black -black shimmer of a shadow hiding in the trees. As sick as I feel right now, my head still spinning with THC and alcohol, my hand drops to my boot and the hunting knife buried in a sheath behind the leather. Shouldn't mix pot with booze, Gidge, a rough voice says, just beyond the orange-yellow pool of light cast by the bonfire. It dances through the dark, vertical bars of the forest, highlighting the dry, brown sea of undergrowth. Lifting my head up, I try my very best not to puke. Crown? I ask, but I already know it's him, because there's nobody else in this town that's as big as a house, but that moves like a cat, padding on soft paws through the night. I swear I can see his smile before I see his face, just the Cheshire's grin floating in the darkness. What are you doing here? I whisper, heart pounding, beads of sweat sliding down the sides of my face. Crown is my father's right hand, the vice president of Death by Daybreak. Looking for you? He says, stepping into the light, all six foot five of him cloaked in black leather and bullshit. Oh, don't get me wrong. Crown is as brutal as Cat on a good day. On a bad one? He's twice as dangerous and packed with enough emotional issues that he may as well be walking dynamite. But he's charming, and he's handsome, and the man all the club horrors fight over. My stomach turns and I lean over, planting a hand across lips painted ruby red. Crown knows I'm not allowed to wear makeup. Ever. It's just another one of Kat's archaic, sexist, fucked-up rules. As soon as I heard there was a senior class bonfire happening tonight, he says, leaning his forearm against the apple tree. I knew you'd make the great escape. I fall to my knees and throw up, the sickly sweet smell of overripe apples making the situation ten times worse. I just hope Reba doesn't see me and come over here. It's already pretty damn clear how she feels about the drinking and the smoking. I don't need further confirmation that what I'm doing is wrong. Finish up and let's go. My bike's parked down the hill. I raise rust-red eyes up to glare at him, wishing I'd never touch that joint. Pot on its own is fine. Alcohol, I can handle. Crown is right. I shouldn't have mixed the two. I can't just leave Reba here, I say, even though I really could. Not only can she take care of herself, she says all good Southern Bells know how to kick serious, booty, if needed. But pretty much everyone here likes Reba. There's not a soul on this property that would refuse her a ride. Except, you know, maybe Crown. Reba's just fine and you know it, he says, his moss green eyes taking me in with a flicker of amusement and just the tiniest spark of anger. 
He rubs a hand over his mouth and the dark stubble surrounding it. Gid, you're already in deep enough shit as it is. Cat knows, I say, and the words come out a breathy sigh. Yeah, Cat knows. Crown tells me as I look up and up and up toward that handsome face of his. He has a nice square jaw, a full mouth and green eyes that drop panties with a single glance. And trust me, they drop a lot of panties. In my humble opinion, Crown is a whore. He got his name by getting drunk on a whole bottle of Crown Royal whiskey, back when he was still a hangaround with the club, and ended up butt-ass naked on the roof with a groupie sucking his dick. Whore. That's what he is, no matter how charming he might seem at times. Fucking great, I say, getting to my feet as Crown just stands there and watches me stumble. Thanks for keeping your mouth shut, you asshole, I think, as I take deep, steadying breaths and watch the world tumble and spin around me. But I know better than anyone that Crown, as well as the rest of the club, doesn't owe me shit. The only reason they associate with me at all is because of Cat. I'm going to tell Reba I'm leaving so she doesn't worry. Crown crosses his big, muscular arms over his chest, leather vest crinkling with the motion. What? Your friend's just fine, Gidge, and putting it off won't make it any easier. I close my eyes and resist the urge to punch the apple tree in frustration. Once upon a time, I liked having Crown watch out for me, knowing that he'd be there if I needed him. Now I realize that he's more like a glorified prison guard. He's there not only to keep me safe, but to keep me, period. I feel like screaming. Instead, I open my eyes and start hiking into the shadows of the trees, Crown silent and steady behind me. Chapter 2 Walking into the clubhouse after dark is like walking into a brothel. The whole place smells of smoke and sex, booze and leather and motor oil. I used to find these smells comforting. How disturbing is that? But I didn't know any better, and at the time, Kat didn't care much what I saw, so long as I was safe here. After my sisters died and he became president of the club, that's when everything changed. Grief chokes my throat, but I ignore it. What's the point? Crying won't bring Queenie or Posy back. This is far enough, Kat says, intercepting us just inside the doors of the old warehouse. He acts like I've never seen people having sex before. Men in leather, with flies undone, grunting in time with the yowling moans of groupies. One look at the red eyeliner and black shadow on my face— Lips the color of blood, my curly hair straightened into a dark satin wave. Cat stares at me like I am one of those moaning groupies with her skirt pushed up around her hips. What the fuck is wrong with you? He asks me, looking at my scarlet halter top and leather pants like he wants to burn them. This from a guy who lives his life dipped in sin, who is sin incarnate. He's the master of drugs, weapons, and prostitution. A kingpin, practically a mafia boss. And what am I? Just a symbol of all that he's lost. I open my mouth to respond, pausing, when one of the side doors opens and several more members of the club walk in, dressed in denim and leather cuts, motorcycle jackets and boots. I recognize three of them right away. Sin, Granger, and Beast. Three more of my father's officers, road captain, sergeant at arms, and enforcer, respectively. While the rest of the men veer off, heading for the large bar in the corner of the warehouse, it's open 24 7 in this stupid fucking place. The three officers make their way straight to us. Shit. I curse under my breath, but Cat hears me anyway. Shit is right, he says as the five men make an intimidating circle around me, cloaked in their matching leather vests. Each one has a patch on the front right side with their name and position in the club. I can't see any of their backs, obviously, but I know that if they were to turn around, I'd see a big decorative patch in the center with a black moon and a red sun, eclipsed so that only a sliver shows on the right side. A devil's grin dipped in blood. 
You run off on me and you've got more than just one person to answer to. I stand there with a straight back, eyes fixed straight ahead. On my right, Sin taps his tattooed hand against his forearm, this rhythmic motion that threatens to steal my attention away from the corrugated steel wall. These men work overtime to keep you safe, Gidget. I don't respond to Kat's statement. My heart is racing, and I feel, well, I don't know what I feel, but it's definitely not a comfortable feeling to stand in the middle of a warehouse with a black floor and a bar and men doing coke on tables in the corner. Out back is my daddy's chop shop, and beyond that, warehouses filled with shit I don't want to know about. Worst of all is the hotel on the far side of the property, where both men and women sell their bodies for the club. My stomach turns, and I have to shut my eyes again to hold back a rush of bile. You need a run from your daddy's devil about twice as fast as I need a run from my daddy's version of God. Reba is always telling me to leave. I'm always telling the same damn thing to her. But where she feels a familial and religious obligation toward her parents and her little brother, my family is blood in and blood out. My eyes open and I glance around at my father's men. What do you want me to say? I ask. My voice is quiet but strong. My mother taught me that. She taught all us girls that. It's just, I'm the only one left. Does sorry work? I ask, realizing too little, too late that there's too much attitude in those three words for Kat to let this go. I see my father's jaw clench tight, muscles ticking behind that dark beard of his. Holy shit. Crown curses from behind me. That's when I know I'm truly in deep crap here. You sure got a mouth on you, Kat says, maintaining that gruff, wise man bullshit he developed after my sisters were murdered. Before that, he was as much a loser as the customers he sells to, just another addict who cheated on my mom and drank too much. The difference between my father now and two years ago, night and day. Believe it or not, I was born with it, I say, and that's when he snaps. Something happened in the club today. I'll never know what. Even the president's daughter isn't privy to that information. But whatever it was, it was bad. You smart mouth little shit. Cat snaps, his red brown eyes flashing with anger. The lines in his face crinkle as he leans down toward me. At six foot three, he's not quite the hulking monster that Crown is, but I'm only five ten, so all the men surrounding me, they tower up above like leather bound trees with dark frowns and blurry pasts. Get your ass home and clean your fucking face before your mother sees you. Cat pauses and looks down at my shiny, skin-tight leather pants, molded to my legs, and the round curves of my hips like a dozen groupie girls that probably hung out here today. I want you to leave those clothes with Beast. He's taking you home and staying there. Cat looks up at Beast, a man who makes people disappear for a living. Fan-fucking-tastic. Maybe my dad hasn't changed at all. If that's the man he entrusts to keep his wife and only surviving daughter safe? The thing is, there aren't any souls on this earth who'd even think of challenging Beast. Born Catcher Coffee, isn't that a great name? In Nashville, Tennessee, the man's a former MMA champion turned death by daybreak henchman. He's tall, wide, muscular, and covered in tattoos and piercings, like model for GQ level bad boy. One half of his head is buzzed short, the rest of his dirty blonde hair combed over to one side. With the beard, the nose ring, and the massive black and red eclipse tattoo on his right arm, he looks like a fucking beast. A flutter takes over my belly, and my breath catches a little. With five asshole bikers around me, I can only hope nobody notices. Beast. Burn him, Cat says, and then he's walking away, just like that. Thing is, if this was it, the only punishment I'd get from him, I'd be happy with it. But this isn't over. Cat saves his dirty laundry for our home, not the clubhouse. And anyway, since he stopped the drugs and actually decided to step his ass up as leader of the Daybreakers, he's honed his patience to a fine point 
one that seems specifically designed to drill me in the skull. He'll think of an awful punishment and hit me with it later. Cat, I say, turning to follow his path as he walks between empty tables and meanders toward the back door where the rest of the boys came in earlier. As soon as he twists the knob and opens it, I know at least one of the punishments he's rigged up to swing my way. He's going to sick Gaz on me at some point. My brother, Gaz, storms in, sees me, and lets this look of pure rage flash over his features. We lock eyes for a moment, and it takes me what feels like forever to remember that once upon a time, we used to be friends. Once upon a time, before I realized that even if I was the princess in the fairy tale, I was locked in a tower. And the four guards I thought were there to protect my honor, they were really monsters, destined to destroy my glory. I'm gonna have a really fucking awful senior year with you four shadowing me all the goddamn time, I snap, not looking at any of them and turning to head out the warehouse door. See you at breakfast, Sin calls out and I glance back to see Beast lift two tattooed fingers in acknowledgement. Breakfast. Fuck. If Sin thinks he'll be seeing Beast for breakfast, then they're on shift again. These four assholes. It's like sophomore year, all the hell over again. Thanks for the ride, I snap sarcastically, as I open the front door and find yet another daybreaker in my mother's living room. Beast relieves him from babysitting duty at the same time my mother appears in the doorway to her fancy new kitchen, bought and paid for with blood money. The whole thing makes me sick, twice as sick as the pot and booze that are just now starting to wear off. I wish I'd stolen two bottles of Jameson from the club's bar and drank them both. Maybe then I'd be in a coma, instead of standing here watching my mother look at me like I'm some kind of club whore, like she used to be. Are you hungry, baby? she asks, trying to keep her voice even, neutral. It's a nice act, but I'm not about to fall for it. My dad might have an infamous temper. My mother's is legendary. Now, in her late 40s, with a soft smile and an apron, she looks like the domestic sort. But I know the truth. I've seen my mother fucking other men in the club while my dad plowed a groupie not 10 feet from her. I've missed days of school because both she and Kat were too busy partying to take me. And I lost my sisters because of this awful life and all the awful strings attached to it. Don't act like you care, I tell her, and see her mouth tighten into a thin line. I move past her and up the stairs, Beast following along behind me. You shouldn't treat your mama like that. He tells me when I hit the second floor and pause, turning to look at him like he's stupid. We've been through this before. I know how dangerous Beast really is. He might have a warm southern drawl and eyes the color of a robin's eggs, but he's just like all the rest of them. Dangerous, unpredictable, deadly. Why are you up here? I ask, and then pause when he reaches out and hooks an inked finger under the narrow strap of my top. Cat wants the clothes, he says, and I grit my teeth. No way in hell I'm giving up $120 leather pants. Fine, I snap, and then I tear the red satin over my head and throw it at him. Even though I'm not wearing a bra and my tits are exposed, Beast doesn't skip a beat. He catches the fabric in his hand and then just waits there, looking at me like he expects me to strip off my pants next. I feel my nipples pebble hardening painfully in the suddenly charged air between us. I don't want what happened last time to happen again, I tell Beast, crossing my arms over my chest. He watches me, like he's still in the ring, sizing up his opponent. The way he watches me turns my body to ice and then fucking melts it. I don't, I repeat, and I can't tell if I'm talking about the fear, the murders, or the sex. Beast, who always smells like books because he spends so much goddamn time sitting in my grandmother's library doing whatever it is he does for the club, leans in close to me and puts one large hand on the wall near my head. This close, I can feel the heat of him, hear the rustling of his leather vest, remember the way he tastes. It won't, he says, 
and the finality that rings in those two words almost scares me. I step back suddenly, heart racing, warmth flickering between my thighs. I feel hot, almost like I'm burning. My skin feels like a shell I want to crack open, just so I can escape. Disappearing into my room, I shove my leather pants to the floor, kick them under the bed, and then grab a pair of cheap pleather ones from my dresser, tossing those into the hallway. I keep my eyes locked tight and refuse to look at Beast again. From experience, I know what happens when we're alone together. Beast. He'll ruin me. They'll all ruin me. Hell, they already did. Chapter 3 Eight Years Ago The hazy smoke used to bother me, but I'm used to it now. It smells good, I tell Queenie and Posey, watching as they exchange a glance I won't understand for years, like Daddy. Daddy's an asshole, Queenie tells me, trying to put a pair of white earbuds on me. Gidget, she warns when I shy away, trying to peep around the corner of the partition, blocking off this part of the room. Queenie and Posey put it there a long time ago. I don't remember when. What I do remember is that I used to be able to see all the kissing and hugging, the cards and the glasses filled with amber liquid. I can still hear the laughter and the screams, the shouts, that I don't understand, but I can't see anything anymore. I want you to wear the headphones. But why? I whine. Because I don't understand why my sisters look so nervous being here, why they hate it so much. We've been coming here after school for as long as I can remember. Later, of course. I'll realize that bringing a 9-year-old, a 14-year-old, and a 16-year-old to sit in a den of fucking, drinking, snorting, and shooting up is probably one of the more disgraceful acts a parent can commit. In that moment, it's all that I know. It'll keep you smiling, Queenie tells me, because she's the oldest, so of course she knows better. Her red-brown eyes look into mine, crinkling at the edges. I love you, Gidgey, she tells me and I feel my lips split into a grin. I might be missing teeth, but I know that Queenie thinks I'm pretty anyway. She tells me every day. After that, I know I'm going to wear the headphones if that's what she really wants me to do. It won't stop Mommy from stumbling over here drunk, wearing high heels and swinging her bleach blonde hair around in a glossy wave. It won't stop the crashing horror of a bar fight, smashing through our partition and knocking it into Posey's face so that she gets a nosebleed. And it won't keep my dad's friend. Sin, from popping his head around the corner to check up on us. He looks different than the other guys, because his face is all smooth instead of scraggly like Daddy's. I like that. His arms are decorated with all sorts of fun things. An American flag, a pair of bright red lips with white, white teeth, a black ball with the number eight on it. I could stare at him forever, I think, and keep finding new things to look at. I've got Nellie's keys, Sin says today before I get a chance to slip the earbuds in. I'm taking you girls home. I know that Sin's just a prospect. Daddy says so. But for whatever reason, I trust him. He smiles a lot, lets his lips quirk to the side in a way that reminds me of a wolf. I love wolves. They're my favorite animals. We're not supposed to be there alone, Queenie says, perking up at the news and lifting her chin like she's the matriarch of this family. I suppose that she is. After all, Mom is usually sleeping or drinking or hanging out at the clubhouse. With her long, dark curls and her rust-colored eyes, Queenie looks almost as regal as her name sounds. Sometimes, I wish she was my mom instead. I'll hang around a while, Sin says, leaning against the side of the partition with a strange look on his face, like maybe he's the only person in the room that's bothered by us being there. I've noticed that whenever we show up at the clubhouse— Sin stops drinking, puts down his cigarette. If he's got a girl on his lap, he pushes her aside, and he watches us with eyes the color of stars, a light silver gray that seems to twinkle if he looks at you too long. Just for a while, he repeats. But what he really means is all night, because my parents won't be coming home. They never do on Saturdays. Get your things, Gidget, Queenie tells me, putting her iPad back in her bag and standing up. Her short skirt swishes against her thighs, and I notice one hand clench into a fist in the fabric. 
It squeezed so hard that when she notices me looking and releases her fingers, I can see moon-shaped crescents on her palm. That's the first time I understand that maybe, just maybe, our life isn't exactly normal. I've got your bag, Sin tells me, grabbing my white and purple backpack with one hand and watching me carefully. He looks at the three of us like he'd die to protect us. At first, I thought, that was just because he was part of the club. It was his job to make sure the vice president's kids were okay. Later, I realized it was because he had a sister once upon a time, and that he didn't anymore. Now. The next morning, I stay barricaded in my room until I hear the roar of an engine, that violent bestial growl that lights up the night like the sound of a wild animal, one made of steel and leather and rubber. I grit my teeth as I listen to Beast pulling out of the driveway, tearing down the street like a shotgun blast. It's only then that I risk slipping into a pair of sweats and a tank top and heading downstairs. Cat isn't here, is he? I ask Sin, when I find him sitting on the couch with his arms thrown across the back, spread wide like the pair of wings he has tattooed on his hips, nice and low, and tempting. Too tempting. I've been tempted by Sin since I was 14 years old. Looks like it's your lucky morning, he tells me, his voice as smooth and practiced as a rock star's, like he must use those beautiful vocal cords to entertain an audience. Since all he ever does is use them to lull women into his bed, it's a real shame to hear him speak, like I can see all that wasted potential leaking from his tattooed throat. I grab a sweater from the coat tree near the front door and sling it over my shoulders, wrapping it tightly around me. When I'm with Sin, I feel like I need more clothes, more insulation between us, which, you know, is ridiculous considering he looks at me like a sister, like a girl instead of a woman. Except for that one time. I lick my lips and I don't think about that. I think about Sin driving my mom's SUV with the lucky pink rabbit foot hanging from the rearview mirror, and I think about him watching as Queenie tucked me into bed, of his face at my window, gazing into the yard with his jaw tight and teeth clenched. What's he gonna do? Besides sick my brother on me, I mean. I say as I set foot in the kitchen with its white marble floors. Heated floors, too. Like a real crime family with money and all that. I don't use it, though. The money. Not any of it. Those $120 pants? I earned those by working at the Raptor Center. That's birds, not dinosaur fossils, as well as the ice cream shop downtown. If I had the choice, I wouldn't live in this house either. Use its electricity, its water, its internet. It's all dressed in blood, every single square foot, each acre, all of these shiny silver appliances. It's red and dripping and stinking of copper, even if nobody but me can see it. The couch creaks and I cringe, closing my eyes for a quick moment and opening them to see Sin standing in the entrance to the kitchen. He moves too fast, almost inhuman. If I believed this world was anything but ugly and gray and desolate, I'd think he was something special. A demigod or a prophet or some hero sent like Hercules to save us all. I shouldn't have made conversation, I tell myself as I break open a new jar of peanut butter and set it on the shiny stone countertops. I shouldn't have talked to him at all. I move to a different cabinet, a fancy custom one with scroll work on the edges, and open it, grabbing a plate. Back in the day, we had orange linoleum counters and an avocado-colored fridge that froze things on the bottom shelf and let ones on the top go bad. Mom and Cat were always drinking and shooting up and leaving us to party at the clubhouse. I'd give anything to go back to that time. My arms, my legs, my eyes, my heart. Because it was ripped out and crushed when my sisters were killed. It was smashed to a pulp and stolen into a night of blood and hate and criminal pissing matches between men like Cat, like Sin, like Ranger and Beast and Crown. Nellie trying to be a real mom. Cat trying to be a real dad. This big house with all its fucking stuff and that Escalade in the driveway? I hate it all. I'd rather be that little girl stuffing earbuds into her skull to block out the fucking and the fighting and the drinking. That little girl didn't know how screwed up her life was. But I do now. 
You shouldn't have gone to that bonfire last night, Sin says. And even though he's the least intimidating as far as looks go, clean-shaven, younger than the other officers, with a scar that pulls the edge of his right lip up just enough that it looks like he's smiling, I have to remember that he's dangerous. Hmm. Or really? That he's a fucking asshole. Really? I ask, as I lay out two slices of bread and start spreading peanut butter across one of them. You're on cat's side now? After all this time? I'm always on cat's side, Gidget. He's my fucking president. I glance over at him, at those stormy silver eyes framed by a bronze-skinned face. You didn't seem to be on his side when you were rescuing me and my sisters from the clubhouse, spending your nights at our place, putting your hands on my hips and... Right. I screw the cat back on the peanut butter and head to the fridge for a jar of blueberry jam. Because the club comes before all else. Because you'd suck Cat's dick if he told you to. Because you'd kill me if he asked you to do it. Sin's semi-crooked mouth twists into this weird semblance of a smile like a ghost. No, like a demon. Because that's what he is. Some leathery-winged monster riding a red-eyed black stallion behind my pointy horn father, heading into battle against a host of angels. God, I wish I lived in a fantasy novel. Sometimes I think my life would make more sense if I did. I slop a gob of blue jam on the bread. Don't be ridiculous, Sin says, his voice this dark, angry buzz that somehow never manages to rise above a sensual whisper. I'm just the road captain, Gidget. If Cat wanted you dead, he'd send Beast. I slap the two slices of bread together, refusing to look back up at him again. There's no secrecy about how Sin managed to earn his nickname. Hilarious. Cat, the ex-addict and the womanizer and the... I start turning with sandwich in hand and finding Sin's long fingers cupping the side of my face, hard, pulling me in making me drop my food on the floor. Without even realizing what I'm doing, I raise up on my toes and meet the hard, wild press of his lips. Sin's mouth is like the blade of a knife, double-edged and so easy to cut myself with, so sharp, so shiny and irresistible. His tongue sweeps mine, just one hot, aching arch, and then he's drawing back and drawing me in, face dark and closed off and empty. Fuck. I hate that about him. My breath comes in harsh pants and my hands shake. God, I'm just trembling inside. Between my legs, I feel that answering heat, the response to the hard bulge in Sin's dark denim. You asshole, I snarl, and then I'm digging my feet into Nellie's wool clogs near the front door, grabbing the dog's leash and going out for a walk. Sin follows along behind me both physically and metaphorically. Chapter 4 Y'all can stand there and look down at me like I don't matter, but I'm made of tougher stuff, Reva says, walking between four men dressed in leather death-by-daybreak vests and into the house. I can hear her through the crack in my window, sitting on the edge of my bed with my dog. Feminist. Yes. I named my male husky Feminist. Cat refuses to say the word. He calls him that fucking dog most of the time. And Nellie just calls him Fem Fem, which I hate. I'm not sure why it's a debate on whether men and women are equal. Must be because of ignorant AWODs like my dad and his club. Nellie's baking an apple pie, Reba says, pausing in my doorway with red waves tucked behind one ear, wearing a white skirt that hits her at mid-calf and a green button-up that looks like she borrowed it from the school secretary. Weird, isn't it? I ask, as I glance out the window and see Sin, Crown, Gaz, and Cat standing in a circle on the driveway, their bikes lined up behind them like soldiers. I have no idea what they're talking about, and I don't care. At least, I'm sure it's not about that kiss. That kiss. That fucking kiss. I dig my fingers into my hair and Reba's eyebrows go up. Way up. She kicks the door closed behind her and moves to push the dog off the bed. 
He growls at her, but Reba just stares him down until he moves, slinking into the corner to curl up on his pink and purple dog pillow. It's the only thing in my room with the color pink on it. What are they doing here, Gidget? Where did you go last night? They're either the four horsemen of the apocalypse or else Kat's got some new business venture cooking and he's afraid I'll get stabbed to death like my sisters. Reba cringes and I feel this creeping wave crawl over my shoulders like a cloak of spiders. Lifting my head up, I stare at her through a few loose strands of dark hair curled and clinging to the front of my face. Sin kissed me in the kitchen today. Reba closes her eyes and takes a deep breath reaching out to slap the pack of cigarettes from my hand when I reach for them. I pick it back up and slide out of smoke. <gasps> Colton kissed you? Reba repeats in a low whisper, using Sin's real name. She says it's not a badge of pride to wear your mistakes as a name tag. I think the name fits him like a goddamn glove. Gidget, are you? I'm not looking to repeat sophomore year, I reply lighting up and using my left foot to push the window up a few more inches. I leave a footprint smudge on the glass, but I almost like it there, because it blurs out Sin's face a little bit. As I lean over to blow my smoke out into the orange-yellow afternoon sky, he glances up at me, and our eyes meet. I'd flip him off, but then Kat looks up and so does Gaz. I turn away and focus on Reba instead. Her eyes are the color of sea glass, open and inviting. I can see everything that Reba's thinking right there in that clear, sharp gaze of hers. I know what she wants, how she feels, if she's trying to fuck me over. Hint, she never is. What happened at the bonfire? She says softly, and I sigh. Nothing. Crown picked me up on an errand for Cat. He had Beast burn my clothes. Sin burned my lips. And Granger? You aren't spending any time with him, are you? She asks, this sharp quality to her voice that makes me remember all sorts of things that I told myself I'd never think about again. He has the morning guard duty shift tomorrow, I say, closing my eyes and wishing my dad hadn't decided to start caring all of a sudden, that he'd put prospects or even hangarounds as my bodyguards instead of fucking officers. Sometimes when I lie in the dark and think about it, I figure maybe Kat does give a shit that the reason he's posting his officers instead of his lackeys is because he's actually worried about me, because he doesn't want to bury another daughter, because Queenie and Posey died horrible deaths. Horrible. My breath comes in a quick pant and my eyes sting. I don't cry, though. I haven't cried in years. The last time? I won't think about that either. It's an unfortunate inevitability, I say pausing as the matte white Indian chieftain outside revs to life and peels out of the driveway. Goodbye and good riddance, Sin, you stupid fucker. But Cat is pissed about the clothes and the makeup and the sneaking out. I'm grounded with my own personal biker bodyguards. There's a long pause before Reba kicks off her shoes and lies back on my bed. Please come to church with me on Sunday, she says but she's been asking for years and I've never gone. Can you imagine that? I ask, as I ash my cigarette out the window, dragging one of those assholes to church with me. Reba's nostrils flare and she breathes out a long sigh. So long as it's not Granger, you can bring one with you. I just want to see you in those pews. I smoke my cigarette and think about it for a minute. As long as it isn't Granger, I repeat. It's fucking goddamn Granger. Please don't talk to me, I whisper, as I climb out of the back of Reba's mother's van and find Granger standing there in his sunglasses, a metropolis of memories and scalding heat, the scars on my soul burning and twinging at the sight of him. Just don't. I'll talk to you if I goddamn well feel like it, he says. And that's why I've been avoiding him because I hate him. Let's not make God wait, shall we? Reba says, standing near the foot of the church steps and looking at Granger like she'd kill him if the Bible didn't explicitly say not to. I'm not going in that fucking building, Granger says, lifting his glasses up so I can see the sole deep umber color of his eyes. 
They kill me, those goddamn eyes of his. Why? Afraid you'll catch fire? I ask moving back a few steps and wondering how the hell I managed to get permission from Kat to attend church. The only church he attends is the one in the back of the clubhouse, the secret meeting room for him and all his boys to sit around and act like they own the world. Because I'm not exactly excited about the prospect of being surrounded by a bunch of self-righteous assholes who think they have all the answers. If Kat hadn't asked me to bring you here, your ass would be locked up in a fucking tower. Oh, fairy tale references, I say, clapping my hands in a slow, sarcastic way that makes Granger grit his teeth. He bites down so hard on his lip rings that he draws blood. How manly. Your dad lets you get away with too much shit. Maybe I'll suggest a leash next time I see him. Maybe he'll say yes. After all, seems like you're already wearing one. Really? Granger asks taking a position up on the left of the stairs and planting the rubber sole of his boot against the wall. He lights up a cigarette and scoffs a harsh laugh in my direction. I squint as the sun catches on the silver crescent moon of his belt buckle. You want to go there, sweetheart? I grit my teeth and try to ignore him, heading up the steps in a pair of red flats and skinny jeans, missing my leather pants and high-heeled boots already. But Cat, he is on the warpath right now, if he sees that the pants Beast burned the other night in the backyard aren't the only pair of skin-tight black booty huggers I've got in my closet, he might just raid my room. Or have the guys raid my room. I don't ever want any of those bastards in my fucking room. He taints the air he breathes, I tell Reba as we step inside the small foyer onto a sea of faded burgundy carpet and walls the color of that salted caramel ice cream I've been obsessed with all summer. The room smells like the stale floral perfume my grandmother left on her dressing table when she died. The bottles that even now, ten years later, are still sitting there collecting dust. When Queenie and Posey were murdered, and the four fuckers from hell were dragging me around the city like a dog on a leash, I spent a lot of time at my grandma's place— digging through boxes of mementos. At one point, I popped a gold top on a bottle filled with pale pink fragrance and gave it a sniff. I almost choked to death on the stench. It smells like ancient history in here, I say, but in the back of my mind, I'm just glad that it doesn't smell like Granger, that blazing sensuality that radiates off of him like light from the sun. He's got this fiery bite to his scent, like cumin and saffron, black pepper and vanilla. It's too much. Just get on up here and take a seat, Reba says, putting her arm through mine and tugging me down the fairly sparse aisles to the front row. Even though her relationship with her dad is rough, Reba says the one thing that he knows how to do is inspire others. I'll believe it when I see it. I told you, Reba whispers, as soon as she gets my butt situated on the faded, threadbare cushion of the front right pew. No, Granger. Why in heck is he here? I sigh and lean my head back against the wood, dark hair hanging like a sheet behind me. Cat won't talk to me, I whisper back, staring up at vaulted ceilings and wood beams dripping with cobwebs. As usual, I add, because there's nothing unusual about my asshole father withholding information from me. I'm not part of his club not privy to his secrets. But whether it's just a punishment for the bonfire or some new threat, I've got the boys around the clock. Can't you ask Leroy to give you a different bodyguard? I lift my head up and tuck strands of black on black hair behind my ear. Both my sisters were blonde, but somehow I ended up with Kat's, Leroy's, hair color. What a drag. And then he'll want to know why, I say, biting my lower lip filling my mind, flood, with the memory. What am I supposed to tell him then? That Granger and I... Good morning, y'all, Wesley Keller says, coming out a small side door and jogging his way to the front of the altar. Just the sight of him makes my lip curl. I cross one denim-clad leg over the other and glance to my right, to where Dina and Shardu are sitting. They both look back at me, and Dina curls her bubblegum pink lips into a smile. Standing up and scurrying across the aisle, the two girls take seats on my right. Hey, 
Dina says, grinning and giving Wesley a sidelong glance. Her voice is low and conspiratorial. I've never really admitted this to Reba, but I sort of hate her. You guys want to hang out with us after? Travone and some of the guys are heading to the lake in a caravan. There's plenty of room. I give her a raised brow, like I'm thinking about it, and try to refocus on Wesley. Reba and I have known each other since kindergarten, and I've never, never liked her father. Not only does he think he's better than everyone else, but I've always gotten this vibe off of him, like maybe he doesn't really practice what he preaches. The sermon starts, but all I can do is sit there and stare at the man who leaves his drunken wife lying in puddles of her own vomit, who judges his daughter based on the length of her skirt, who had a bake sale to raise money for a local billboard so he could print premarital sex is akin to murder on the front of it. There's nothing he could say that would inspire me. Nothing. I'm not completely opposed to getting involved in some sort of religious or spiritual something, most likely Buddhism, because it sort of goes against everything my father's club stands for. But this church, this man, this isn't it. Why did I agree to come here, I think, picking at the strap of my ribbed tank? When he starts warning the congregation about the dangers of marijuana, it's the devil's lettuce, apparently. I lean over and whisper in Dina's ear, my lips almost touching the row of silver rose earrings lining her lobe. She reeks of perfume, almost as badly as the building itself does. We're in, but I can't use the front door. Is there another way out? Dina bites her lip and pushes my hair back to whisper. Head to the bathroom and then turn right. There's a storage room that nobody ever uses and it's always unlocked. Go now and we'll meet up at the baby. It takes every ounce of self-control I have not to roll my eyes. Dina's mom is a wealthy patent lawyer who lives in D.C. and never comes home, but who sends massive hordes of money back to Dina and her father. As a result, my bitchy little classmate drives a brand new Mercedes convertible that she calls the baby. I have the strongest urge to slap her. Instead, I squeeze Reba's hand and whisper, let's bail. She gives me a warning look, but I know that if I leave, she'll follow. I don't think Reba trusts me on my own. I don't blame her. Look what happened after my sisters died. I went full on batshit. I get up and head for the bathroom. As I pass by the entrance to the church, I can smell the sweet tobacco scent of Granger's cigarette. For a second, I pause and consider heading out there to join him. If this was sophomore year, I might have. I might have gone out there and flirted, winked and tossed my hair, licked my lips. Look where all of that got me, I think, as I shiver and shove my way into the ladies' room, this meticulously clean little four-by-four four square of old orange tile and dried flowers. This is where that old lady perfume smell is coming from. I decide to piss before making a run for it. There's no way in hell I'm using that shady outhouse at the lake, and peeing in the water? Let's not even go there. I wash my hands real quick and let myself out into the hall where, of course, I run straight into Granger. As soon as I close the bathroom door behind me, he's there, pinning me against the faded wood with both hands. What do you want? I ask, leaning back, feeling that dangerously seductive scent of his roll over me. Heat flashes through my body, sharp and sudden, like lightning bolts in a night sky. All of a sudden, I go from bored and apathetic to electrified. What are you up to? He asks, his dark brown eyes simmering. It's the only part of him with any softness. The rest is just hard, including the shape of his cock behind his leather pants. That and all the gloriously rippling muscles in his abs and chest, in those strong arms braced on either side of me. I saw those bitchy little prom queens climb into their convertible. Your religious friend was right behind them. Don't call her my religious friend, I say, even though that doesn't really matter at all. Her name is fucking Reba. Granger's lip quirks up at the corner. It's not a smile, though, just a smirk. Wow, not even trying to deny it, are you? He asks, dropping a hand to push some hair off my forehead. I wonder if I look different to him now, my face clean and clear and free of makeup my clothes simple and unassuming. I wonder if he sees me differently like this. 
Since when do you give two actual fucks? I whisper back. The sound of Preacher Wesley's voice echoing dully around the corner and down the hall toward me. Back the hell off, Grange. Since your father entrusted me with your goddamn life, Gidget. So yeah, believe it or not, I really do give a hell of a lot of fucks. He says, our gazes connected in this confusing tie of emotions. Two years and I've barely spoken to him. And now here he is, penning me in against the door of a church bathroom. A woman with a crying baby passes by and Granger pauses a second to glance back at her. I use that moment to duck under his arm, reaching for the door to the storage room. If I can slip in and lock it behind me. But he's right there, shoving his way in and slamming it closed. Mm, sorry, Gitch, but you're not bailing on my watch. He says, swiping his tattooed right hand down his equally tattooed left arm. I take a step back, stirring dust motes in the dusky afternoon sunshine. It leaks through the stained glass windows and bathes the old wood floor at my feet in brilliant color. Behind me, rows of pews sit stacked haphazardly with boxes and bags, right next to an ancient organ with rusty pipes and two pulpits with flaking paint. You want to tell me what's going on? I ask, even though I know it's futile. None of these guys give a shit about me, especially not compared to the club. Sin might have turned my words into a joke, but if their president, my own father, decided I needed to be hushed up and buried, I'd end up six feet under. I can never let myself forget that. Not particularly, no, he says, folding his bulky arms over his chest and looking at me with that, that fucking look. Like he knows he has an effect on me and he loves it. His rust red hair is buzzed short on both sides of his head, slicked back down the middle. He runs a hand through it and smirks. Again. I'm surprised his face hasn't frozen that way. With a sigh, I sit down hard on the edge of a dusty pew and hope that even though Dina and Shardu are bitchy cunts, that Reba will make them wait for me. I'm not an idiot, Granger. I say, sweeping my hair back from my face with both hands. Dad's been a protective asshole since. I don't have the energy to say it right now. No, I'm saving my energy for an escape to the lake instead. But he hasn't plagued me with round-the-clock bodyguards either. You can't tell me details, fine. At least tell me how worried I should be. Not at all, he says, his voice just dripping this overconfidence that makes me sick. Out of the four of them, Granger is the worst by far, the bossiest, stupidest alpha male prick to walk the planet in a death-by-daybreak cut. As long as you stop trying to give us the slip. He runs his tongue over his lower lip and scrapes his hand across his red-brown stubble. Granger takes a few steps closer to me, leather riding boots stirring up more dust from the floor. He's the cockiest, the most willing to take risks, the least concerned about going up in flames. You've barely spoken to me in two years, he says. But not like he's upset about it, just observant. I lift my head up and suddenly it just feels like he's close. Too close. Way too goddamn close. Pain cuts through me like a knife. That night rising up inside me. A specter of the past that's both pain and pleasure. This awful hybrid that I despise the same time as I'm drawn to it. You've hardly looked like you cared, I say, wondering if Granger and Beast and Sin and Crown, if they talk about me when I'm not around, if they remember that night and the part they all played in my sinful, seductive ruin. Granger stares down at me from a face made of sin, that mouth of his a slash of heat that warms up all the cold places inside of me, and his eyes, the color is soft, but the set is stern, the faintest dusting of lines at the edges, a testament to how goddamn hard this life is. His skin is tanned and slightly weathered from the sun, but all it does is make me painfully aware of his beauty, this wildness in him that can't be contained, that I wouldn't want to contain, even if I could. Let's go, he says, and there's this edge to his words that makes me wonder what he really wants to say. If Granger's holding back, there's only one explanation, either club business or cat. I don't think the man's afraid of anything else. 
or if afraid is even the right word. This place is fucking creepy. He turns to walk away and I stand up, too quick, too sharp. Granger turns back around and looks at me, stares, narrows his eyes. His breath huffs out in a rush. You've been avoiding me for two years, I say, standing my ground when he takes a step closer, that biting, blazing scent of his wafting around me, drawing me in. Why am I just standing here? Being around Granger is dangerous. It goes both ways. Does it? He asks, taking another step. Another. My eyes flutter closed and my heart thunders like a herd of horses. As soon as his hand touches the side of my neck, I know I'm in trouble. Fire races through me, searing, agonizing. It incinerates me from the inside out. It melts me. It makes me wish I could blaze so long and so hot that there'd be nothing left at the end but ash. Granger curls his fingers around the back of my neck and draws me in close, each fingertip burning a small brand into my skin. That's one of the things that drove me crazy about him before, how possessive he is. I both loved and hated it. I want to fucking kiss you, he says, and then... I'm going to goddamn fucking kiss you. I keep my eyes closed, but the feel of his breath against my parted lips makes them open. We're so close, I can see the tattoo near his right ear, the one that's partially buried under his hair. I can't quite make out the design in this dusky light bathed with the colors from the stained glass, but I know from memory that it's of a sun and moon intertwined like they're fucking. Granger leans down, cuts the distance between us, kisses my mouth and taints it filthy. Fucking filthy. Sin kissed me in the kitchen the other day. Granger won't stop at a kiss. I stumble back a few steps and he follows me, bumping my thighs into the high, curved back of one of the old pews. Without preamble or question, he drops his hands to my hips and lifts me up parking me on the narrow edge so he can wedge his big body between my thighs. Granger, I start, but his lips have captured mine, taken them hostage with prurient fervor. I knew I should fucking stay away from him, I think, but it's too late. My hands are on his chest and his smell is mixing with the warm leather of his vest, the tobacco from his cigarettes, the distant burn of motor oil. My thighs part of their own accord, and he leans in, grinding his sex to mine, rubbing against the carnal heat at my core. Granger and I exchange groans, growls, snarls of pleasure. It occurs to me that we're in a church. We'll burn in hell for this, I gasp as he tears the button on my jeans and sends it flying. Honey, hate to break it to you, Granger says, sliding a hand tattooed with the moon and stars into my jeans, cupping my pussy, slicking a finger across my opening. But this is hell. Might as well enjoy the sins. Granger takes my mouth, like he's fucking me with his tongue, slipping his finger inside of me and teasing the tender walls of my cunt. My own hands drop to his belt, fumble it open, slip inside. My fingers find the long, velvety length of his cock, teasing the hot heat of his body with messy, groping strokes. I'm too out of practice. I've only had sex once before this, and too riled up to care about details and intricacies. Messy, hot, desperate. That's what this is. Maybe if I do this, then I'll be able to fucking think again, like a logical person. When I start to moan, nice and loud, Granger clamps a hand over my mouth to keep the churchgoers on the other side of the wall from hearing me. Warm liquid drenches the hand that's inside my jeans, the fingers that are inside of me, as I gasp and fight the wild flickers of pleasure crashing into my body. Like shooting stars, the sensations pummel me, bury me, take me to a place that's either hell, as Granger suggested, or heaven. Maybe both. My fingers strain to keep pleasuring him, my grip loosening as Granger grinds the heel of his hand to my clit, 
using those oft-used skills of his to bring me to a violent climax, one that hurts almost as much as it feels good. It does absolutely nothing to sate my feelings, to make me forget that two years ago, something happened with Granger and me, with Sin and me, Crown and me, Beast and me. It happened. Happened, happened, happened. And this is just more proof of that. I lean my forehead into Granger's warm chest, listen to his heartbeat, but he's not anything close to comforting. And he grabs my hair with his hand, yanks my head back, and kisses me so hard and fierce and fast that I feel dizzy. My own fingers keep moving, working him up, encouraging his hips to thrust as I work the cum right from his balls and into my hand. Fuck, he snarls as he comes hard and fast and messy against me. As soon as he's done, he pulls back and keeps cursing. This is goddamn it, Gidget. Fuck you, I say, standing up and pausing as he reaches out and grabs my arm with a rough hand. You're not fucking skipping out on me, he snarls, still panting, sweat dripping down the sides of his face. His cum is all over my hand and my pants are undone, my panties soaked, my lips swollen. And here he is, doing his clubly duties. I just want to wash this, I say, lifting up sticky fingers. Off in the bathroom? Granger lets me go, his dick hanging out of his leather pants and watches, as I open the door and head straight into the restroom. As soon as the door's closed and locked behind me, I wash my hands, use the toilet, wash them again. And then, I fucking climb out the window. What the hell took you so long? Shardu asks, putting on a pair of shades and grinning at me. Get lost in the toilet? I hop into the back of the convertible next to Reba and notice her eyes immediately lock onto the missing button on my jeans. Gidget, she warns in a quiet whisper. I ignore her and reach over Shardu's shoulder, stealing her shades and slipping them onto my own face. Let's get the fuck out of here, I say, watching over my shoulder as Dina revs up the car and peels out of the dusty parking lot. The two girls in the front seat laugh as the wind steals our hair and makes it dance around our faces like autumn leaves. Reba glares at me. I breathe a sigh of relief. And this is exactly why I hate. Ranger. Chapter 5 Two and a Half Years Ago Cat thinks moving us into a new house will fix things, will make this broken unit of ours into a family again. I don't think it'll do a damn thing. After all, we've never really been a family. Have you seen my bathroom? Posey asks, standing in the doorway to my new bedroom and beaming like crazy. Her blonde hair is messy, random pieces sticking out of her bun in every which way, but she's still pretty. Her and Queenie both. Gorgeous. I don't look anything like them. I'm too pale and my hair is too dark, my eyes too red. One of Dad's asshole officers said I look like a vampire the other day. I think his name's Cade Granger. I'm sure it's palatial, I say as I flop down on my new mattress and take a deep breath of fresh paint and cardboard. Everything in this house feels forced, like it's trying too hard to be nice. I miss our old place already. Gidget? Posey says, popping out a hip and tilting her head to the side. I can see from her facial expression that she wants to comfort me, ask me what's wrong, do what Queenie does as easily as breathing. But that's not her job. Queenie takes care of us. Posey makes us laugh. I point out flaws. This is a really nice house for a guy whose only job is being president of an MC, I say. But we all know that dad's dirty, that the club's dirty, that drugs and hookers and guns paid for the nice bathroom and the new wood floors and the canopy bed that I hate. Mom picked that one out. No matter what you do, Posey says, dropping her hands to her sides and sighing, no matter how much you complain, it won't change what or who dad is. You might as well enjoy this, kid. She gives me a bitchy look, 
lifts her brows, and then spins on her heel, walking down the hall in heels as tall as mom wears, big and red and shiny. Posey is like a mini Nellie, right down to the flirting and the fucking and the occasional hit of whatever the hell's on hand. Fuck you, I murmur, curling up onto my side and looking at the sea of cardboard boxes around me. As soon as I identified that my life was a fucked up, disturbing warp of reality, I started hating it. I don't understand how that can happen, how a person can be happy and content with what they have, and then just not. I sit up with a huff, shove my hair back from my forehead and stand up. When I pad down the stairs for a drink, I find that the fancy kitchen is full of bikers. As soon as I enter the room, the conversation stops. What do you want? Cat asks in that gruff, weird way of his, staring at me from the direction of the fridge. I stare back at him and then let my eyes trail to the others. There's Renee, the gray-bearded treasurer of the club, a man I've known my entire life. He's like an uncle to me, twice as warm as my own father. Of course, twice of zero is still, you know, zero, but he feels about a billion times more approachable. The other four guys, three of them I know, crown, sin, beast, but one is new. Nobody bothers to introduce him, but I can see from his name tag, Granger, Cade Granger. Right, that's the vampire fuck. Hi, yeah, my day has been great. No thanks, I don't need any help unpacking, and yeah, it does make me uncomfortable when you act like my vagina makes me too weak to carry even small pieces of furniture. Oh, fuck. Cat says with a sigh and a hand to his forehead. Here we go with the feminazi crap again. I curl my lip at him and walk right through the center of the bikers in their black vests and boots, feeling tiny prickles take over my skin. A rush of heat slams into me like I'm stepping into a sauna, and I almost freeze. Go completely still and stand there in the middle of the kitchen, dumbstruck. Glancing back, I take a little extra note of the men on the right side of the circle, slightly separated from Renee and Kat. Jesus. Except for Sin, they have all got to be at least in their 30s. Way too old for me, but also, like, fucking hot as hell. I should probably get my head examined. I ignore them. Boys, this is my youngest and the biggest pain in my ass, Gidge. Gidget, actually, I say. Because I don't like people, I don't know, calling me Gidge. Pulling the fridge door open, I pause and bend down, searching for a soda. I find several six-packs of beer and yank one of those off instead. Cat doesn't give two shits. Fucking Christ, Gidge, get the fuck out of here. We're trying to have a conversation. I grit my teeth at Cat, popping the top on the beer and tipping it back. I finish it, crush it up, and then grab another. This rebellious shit is gonna come back to haunt you. Cat warns as I pad barefoot out of the kitchen, dressed in cut-off jean shorts and a white tank with no bra. As I'm leaving the kitchen, I look back and notice that four sets of eyes are watching me, all of them hungry. I could feel intimidated, but I've grown up around the baddest of the bad, the biggest assholes known to man. Instead, I could give a crap less. I smirk, open the beer, and take another sip. Deep down, I know that I could have them if I wanted them. All of them. And that makes the darkest, most wicked parts of me grin. Now. Tugging the edges of my borrowed hot pink bikini top up, I fucking hate pink. I make my way down to the pebbled beach at the edge of the water, gazing out at the rich blue surface of Darina Lake. It stretches to the horizon, to a craggy shore lined with trees, the occasional house peeking out from the sea of green needles. You want to tell me why you came out of that church, with your cheeks flushed and your jeans missing a button? Reba asks, putting her hands on her hips and giving me a look. She is wearing a tasteful vintage one-piece while I'm stuck in one of Dina's itsy-bitsy, teeny-weeny, slutty pink and gold bikinis. Yes, there's a song reference there. I'm bloated. I think I'm starting my period soon. Gidget, Reba warns, 
but I'm already starting down the hill towards the water, joining the raucous of my classmates as they float in orange and green and yellow rings with beers stuffed in the cup holders. Amaya is lounging on a towel on the small sandy stretch between the rocks and the water. I take the one next to her and hold out a hand for the small plastic bag she's clutching. In it, there's a brownie she's taking tiny nibbles of. How cliche, I say, leaning back and enjoying the way she looks at me with just a little bit of fear in those brown eyes of hers. A pot brownie. Give it here. Amaya passes over the bag and grins at me as I dig in. Sure you want to do that? She asks, a little bit of her usual snootiness creeping into her voice. I saw you puking all over at the bonfire. I'm pregnant, I say, and watch as her eyes widen in shock. I shove a piece of brownie in my mouth and grin. Must be one of those burly bikers from my dad's club, if only I knew which one. Only part of that statement's a joke. Are you... Are you fucking serious? Amaya asks as I roll my eyes and toss the bag back at her. Um, no. I'm about to start my period, and if I am pregnant, it's the second coming of Jesus. I stand up as Amaya blinks stupidly at me, grabbing a spare ring off the shore and setting off into the water. The sun is high and the air is warm, even if I can smell the faintest tinge of smoke in the air from all the fucking forest fires nearby. Sometimes I think about doing something reckless and random, like running off and becoming a volunteer firefighter. If I thought they'd take me at age 17, I'd go. Floating off into the middle of the group, I join some stupid game that's like magical chairs only with loads more drinking. Basically, Johnny R. plays some music from shore and we all float around trying to get close to each other, When he turns it off, we all shove each other into the water. Once everyone's been dethroned, we all try to snag a new ring. Last person in has to paddle their way back to shore and watch. After a few rounds, it's down to me and Travon. We knock each other into the lake at the same time and then both scramble for the nearest black ring so quickly that we end up sitting side by side and laughing our asses off. It's all fun and goddamn games, until I hear the echo of a bike bouncing off the water and chilling me to the core. One more round? Trevone asks, raising his eyebrows at me. Next time, I say, pushing off into the water and booking it for sure with long, graceful butterfly strokes. I used to be on the swim team before Queenie and Posey were dead and I stopped giving a crap about anything at all. I mean, I hadn't given a lot of crap before that, but after they were gone, life was a void. I emerge from the water, stumbling and scrambling up the bank before he can get down here. I just want a normal senior year. Do not need this shit. Granger, I start, when I get into the dry grasses behind the trees, wet and dripping and wearing Dina's stupid suit. The way he swings himself off his bike and storms toward me, I know I'm in deep shit. Don't make a scene, I growl when he gets close to me, breathing hard, his inked hands curled into fists. His body's so warm, I can feel the heat radiating off of him and into me, twice as scalding as the rays of the sun from above. Not here. Let me grab my stuff and we'll go. Gave you that chance before, Gidge. Sorry, I'm not falling for it again. Where are your clothes? His blue eyes slide down to mine and catch me. Breath hitches, pulse thunders, heart pounds. I'm standing here, wanting him, at the same moment I'm wishing I could take a blade and plunge it through his chest. And I know, I just know, that all of my classmates are staring at me, watching this bullshit unfold. I'll be the talk of the school come Monday. I always am. Swallowing hard, I turn and point at the crumpled pile near the base of a tree. Grange grabs my wrist burning us both so badly that he curses and I jump. There's too much heat for us to touch casually like this, just a stick of dynamite bobbing in a sea of flames. Something's got to give, and energy like this only leads to one of two things, violence or passion. With Granger, it's usually a little bit of both. He yanks me over to the pile, bends down and grabs my stuff, shoving it against my chest. My silky red panties fall to the ground near our feet. 
and I see the man's jaw clench. There's a muscle in his tattooed neck that's ticking with rage. I slip my clothes on as fast as I can, but before I can pick the underwear up, he's already done it and shoved them into his pocket. Granger lifts his umber eyes and meets my red-brown ones. Get on the bike, Gidget. That is, if you don't want me to make a scene. I stare at him, tall and wide, with moons and stars and suns tattooed down both arms, trailing across his hands and fingers, climbing up his neck. He's 32, and about as fucking mature as a ten-year-old. Do you think Cat would make a scene if he knew you'd finger-fucked his 17-year-old daughter in a church today? Bike. Now. Granger snarls, nostrils flaring, the smell of warm leather perfuming the air around us. His vest is hot to the touch when I put my fingers on it. Don't push me, I say, stepping back and turning to grab my shoes from Dina's convertible. Granger grabs me around the waist to, I think, toss me over his shoulder or some other stupid chest-pounding machismo thing. But then he stops and breathes in the scent of my hair, tightens the circle of his arm. There's a war, Gidge. There's always a war, I whisper, remembering Posey's screams, Queenie's blood. My eyes fill with tears, but I blink them back, focusing on a family seated across the day use area at a picnic table. They look happy, seated over there, eating hamburgers and hot dogs, like maybe their sister's blood didn't leak under the pantry door and stain their feet on an easy, breezy Saturday night in June. This is really bad. Worse than before. Gidge, it's them. They're back. My entire body goes cold, despite the sun, despite Granger's warmth. Now get the fuck on the bike, he tells me, as he steps away and leaves me shaking in the middle of a 90-degree afternoon. They. Them. Those people, my sister's killers, the Grey Wolf Mafia is back in town. Crown will be here in 15, Granger says, pausing in the doorway to my room and watching me smoke a cigarette on my bed. I glance over at him and I don't know what to say. When I look at his face, all I can think about are his fingers inside of me, my hand wrapped around his cock. Cool, I say and I like that he grits his teeth in anger. Cool? That's it? Nothing else? I know you have a penis, Granger, but if you want to talk to me, you have to actually, you know, talk. He steps into the room and stares at me like I'm both a treat and a treasure, a nightmare and an open wound. What am I supposed to make of that? Fuck. Fine. He says glancing over at Feminist when the dog stands up and raises his hackles in response. Fem's never liked any of the guys, not one of them. I should take that as a sign, right? Aren't animals supposed to be like compasses guiding us to those with good hearts and warning us away from bad ones? Then again, I've always known these guys were assholes. I guess I'm just addicted to ruination. Now that I've told you what's going on, are you going to stay put? Probably not, I say, blowing smoke out the window. Honestly, you act like you did me a favor by tipping me off, but guess what? I know you must have gotten permission from Cat first. That means you've been holding on to that shit all day without telling me. Actually, I'm pissed. Fucking A, Gidget. You really want to do this? Granger takes a small step into the room, runs his tongue over his lower lip, and then throws his hands in the air. I'm not playing games with a 17-year-old girl, he murmurs, turning to leave. No, but you'll fuck one, I say, and he pauses, going completely still. Granger's had more lovers than I have fingers and toes and hair follicles and skin cells and drops of blood in my body. But I know that no matter what, he won't forget that night. Never. Thanks for stopping by. Granger stares at me for a long moment, squeezes his hands into fists and leaves. A few minutes later, I hear Crown pull into the driveway, and Granger pull out of it. Chapter 6 
The first day of school is a welcome relief from the cage of Kat and Nellie's house, even though I know Crown is sitting on the ridge just above the school, waiting and watching. Doesn't matter. He can't see me in the courtyard. There's basically only two things I give a shit about this year, Dean is saying, leaning back on a blanket outside the lunchroom. It's actually nice out here, full of flowers and trees, bird fountains and feeders, all maintained by one of the on-campus gardening clubs. It's the only green oasis in a sea of brown, yellow grass and dead things killed by the summer heat. Somebody's been keeping it watered for the last few months. Winning prom queen and getting laid by Trevone Hunley. You'll have to fight Tina to the death, Amaya says, her hair coiled on the top of her head like a glossy black snake. I can't believe I'm sitting here with them, but there's nowhere else to go. With the guys on my ass, I can't leave campus without being followed. Or with Grey Wolf in town, without dying. How about you, Gidget? Dina asks, sitting in a black bikini top, her shirt tossed aside in a heap. She's sunbathing, like she doesn't care who's looking. I imagine she cares a whole hell of a lot. Anyone you plan on nailing before graduation? More like who I don't plan on nailing, I think. But I'm not about to tell Dina Muller that when I was a just-turned 16-year-old, I screwed four bad boy bikers in one night. Four of them. I lost my virginity four times over, in a hot, wild mess of heat and turmoil. And now, day in and day out, I have to deal with them watching me, following me, wanting me. At least, Granger and Sindhu. I dig my nails into my forearms until the pain pushes the memories away. Ryan Reynolds, I say, even though I actually sort of hate his face. Dina and Chardu laugh. Amaya stares at me, as strangely as she did that day at the lake. Reba, she scoffs and glances away. What are you doing after school? Dina asks me, lifting her chin in my direction, like a princess acknowledging a peasant. Going back to my place to get high, I say, because I'm not sure that I can take another night sitting in my room with Crown outside in the hallway, leaning against the wall and trying to make conversation with me. Why? Aren't you going to invite us? Dina asks, with a sharp smirk, the cruelty in it highlighted by the bubbly pink color of her mouth. Sure, I say, because screw Cat. He can keep me in, but he didn't say anything about keeping my friends out. And if they're there with me, then I won't be tempted by crown, by beast, sin, granger. I won't be tempted to take a dip in that hot, awful well of sin, that toe-curling, sin-searing, burning ache. One man with his hands wrapped around my heart, that's painful enough. But four? How am I supposed to survive fucking four? Maybe I'm not. Supposed to survive, I mean. Maybe... I was never supposed to. Crown doesn't look too happy when I climb in the back of Dina's convertible, but as promised, I go straight home and lead the girls out to the back deck, to the pool I barely use. This is really a nice place, Dina says, pretty grudgingly. I thought your dad was... A criminal? I ask, and hear Crown grunt from behind me. The girls all jump except for Reba, but I just pretend he's not there. He is. What do you think pays for all this shit? Gidget. The vice president warns from behind me. Who the fuck is that? Shardu asks, looking back at Crown like she wishes he were naked and lying out in the sun on one of Nellie's wooden Adirondack chairs. Honestly, I kind of wish the same damn thing. Him? I ask, glancing over my shoulder like Crown isn't one of the hottest men I've ever seen in my life. If he were any less hot, then maybe I wouldn't have gotten myself into trouble with him. Maybe I wouldn't have lost my virginity to four fucking bikers on the same night. That's Crown. He's a dick. Ignore him. I move over to the edge of the pool, reach my fingers under the tattered misfit shirt I'm wearing. Yes, I actually do listen to them and pull it off. As soon as I do, I swear I can feel Crown's eyes boring into my back, running over my body like spotlights. That's the introduction I get, he says, 
sauntering over to the edge of the pool and making me grit my teeth. I sort of want to punch him in the nuts, but I'm not sure that touching him below the belt in any capacity would be a good thing. Beyond that, he could definitely kick my ass if he wanted to. His arms are wide as my fucking waist. Oh, but I'm so much more than that. Crown looks me in the face, those mossy green eyes of his sparkling with mischief, and then slowly, agonizingly, he takes his cut off, setting the leather vest on one of my mother's chairs. His chocolate brown hair glistens with auburn highlights in the sun, gently tousled and lightly curled against his forehead. It's the hair of a model, not an outlaw biker. The asshole could star in a shampoo commercial. Don't, I whisper but my heart is beating like crazy in my throat and my skin is pebbled with goosebumps. My nipples are like rocks, and down below, a fire is being stoked by long lashes and a strong jaw, a face stubbled with dark hair and a smile that could kill a girl, stop her heart right in her chest. Good thing I'm more than just a girl. Crown reaches his fingers down and takes hold of his shirt. Take it off! Dina shouts, heading over to the diving board and climbing the stairs. With a whooping shout, she dives in and splashes water across the fancy brick surround. Oh, I intend to, he says, that manic grin of his making me seriously reconsider punching him in the junk. What's your game? I whisper, but Crown just tears his shirt off and, well, just like I said, heart officially stopped. This time, it's me looking at him like I want to jump his bones. Shit. If Cat comes back and sees you swimming, I start, but Crown doesn't care. He continues stripping, kicking off his boots, tearing his belt out of the loops, peeling tight denim down his muscular legs. They're sprinkled with dark hair and blanketed with tattoos. I swear, there's not a guy in the whole damn club that isn't covered in ink. Even my mom has a full sleeve, sort of clashes with her new pretend Betty Crocker trophy wife mentality. Crown steps up to the edge of the water in boxers with skulls on them. Everything about him I find attractive. I feign indifference. That's sort of my thing. I might be an apathetic bitch, but remember, it was beaten into me by the harsh hand of life. Joy is just too fragile. It breaks like glass. For a while, it's pretty to look at. It's waterproof. It holds all the tears, lets them collect in a wet and salty pool. But one drop, one fall, one tumble, and it shatters to pieces, cuts and makes you bleed. I won't let myself have it. Not anymore. Then again, I'm not sure that I could ever call the thing that happened between those men and me joy. It was passion and pain and heartache and cocks mouths and hands and hate and want. It was lust. It was agony. It was... Crown leaps into the water and splashes me from head to toe, dragging dark hair around my face. Fortunately for him, I'm not wearing any makeup. If I were, I would finally give in and give him that cock punch that he deserves. Oh, are you having a pool party? Nellie says from behind me. I glance over my shoulder at my mother, smoking a cigarette in a dress that costs more than Reba's mother's car. It's fancy, but it doesn't make her look fancy. It doesn't take away the lines on either side of her mouth from smoking too much, or the haunted glaze in her eyes from burying her daughter's still bodies. It doesn't cover the scars on her inner elbows from the drugs, or the tightness of her face from too much drinking. Nope. Nellie Kesselring won't fool a soul not even with an Alexander McQueen gown on her thin frame. No, Nellie, I'm not having a pool party, I say. And deep down, right behind all that bone and sinew and hot red beating pulses of my heart, I feel bad for treating her like shit. She looks so sad right now, her blue eyes like pools of tears, just sitting in the middle of a face that says hard, tough, awful little life with every blink. But then I remember that she made me sit outside the room once while she screwed one of my dad's club buddies. I remember her laughing and blowing smoke in my face as I coughed and cried and told her I didn't want to sit at the clubhouse anymore, that I wanted to go home. 
If she'd cared about me then, even one-tenth as much as I want to care about her, then things would be different. Things would be good. Maybe Queenie and Posey would still be alive. Please go away, I tell her as I snatch the smoke from her fingers and walk the edge of the pool, watching Crown's big, thick body part the water as easily, as easily. I sit down on the chair next to Reba, hard. I can't do it, I tell her, feeling my breath pick up, my skin tingle. I can't be surrounded by them every goddamn day and not think about it, Reba. Reba pauses and puts her magazine in her lap, glancing over at the three girls fawning over Crown in the water. He's eating it up, giving Amaya, Shardu, and Dina a ridiculous amount of attention and praise for their stupid lip-licking, hair-tossing, and giggling. He'd probably fuck them all, too, if they really wanted it. I hate him. Them. All of them. Sweetheart, you need to calm down and listen to me. She starts, plucking the cigarette from my hand and stabbing it into the ashtray on the side table. Reba turns to me and throws her legs over the side of her chair, planting her bare feet on the pavement. She's the only one who knows what happened that night between me and Crown, Sin, Beast, and Granger. The only person who knows the truth. Do you remember what happened last time? She asks and I feel the shivery heat take over my skin, like a blast of hot, desert wind. Yes, I certainly do. Only maybe not in the way that Reva's intending me to. Of course, I remember the awful aftermath, the way I fell to pieces, the way my body ached and craved and dreamed. I remember how hard it was to walk away, to distance myself. I remember being afraid the cat would find out, that I'd get my heart broken. I remember everything else. But I also remember mouths as hot as the sun, thick curved cocks of velvet and steel, hands on my hips, stubble against my thighs. Heat, heat, heat. Are you even listening, sugar? Reba asks me as I blink red-brown eyes at her and sit back, my black bikini studded with small silver skulls. Annoyingly enough, it sort of matches Crown's boxer shorts. I need a fucking break, I tell her. Sounds almost like I'm pleading, but I don't plead. Sorry, just not in my DNA. I feel like I'm living in a cage, Reba. Yeah, a cage of muscles and lust and the sweet smell of tobacco. Come with me to the Christian youth retreat, she says, and I raise my eyebrows. Oh, don't give me that look, Gidget. You could use Jesus in your life right now. Badly. And we both know it. I don't know about Jesus, I say, as I glance over and see Crown swim to the edge of the pool, folding his tattooed arms on the bricks. His ink is bright and crazy, popping off his skin like a comic strip. I hear his whole body tells a story. At least that's what the club whores say. But I've never actually seen him naked with the lights on. But a weekend in the woods? Away from men in leather vests? That sounds like fucking heaven. I'll convert if it means I get to go. Well, my daddy's still angry about us skipping out on the sermon last week, but maybe if I tell him you've decided to drag your heathen butt over to the bright side, he'll let you come. Reba leans back, watching as my eyes lock on Crown and stay there. Heck, never mind. You're coming whether he locks it or not. It's this weekend? I ask, my voice quiet enough that there's no way Crown can hear me over the girl's splashing. A quick glance over my shoulder shows that Nellie is still there, smoking a new cigarette and watching my friends with a wistful look, like maybe they remind her of the daughters that won't be swimming in this pool ever again. The daughters whose laughter will never ring inside these walls. Pain and anger wash over me in a tidal wave, a tsunami of emotion that I toss aside like trash. I have no need for it. What good will it do me? To think about Queenie and Posey. The only thing those memories make me do is hate. Hate my mom, my dad, the club, the guys, the world. It is, so what's the plan? And you'd best come up with one because I swear on the name I shall not take that if Granger ends up at this retreat, I will skin you like a hog. I give Reba a look and try not to laugh. 
Her smile says she's only half serious. I can't have any of them there, Reba. A weekend in the woods is perfect. It's away from the boys and... I pause because I can't make my lips say it. Gray wolf. Gray wolf. Gray wolf. Murderers. Rapists. Thieves. I want to puke. But they won't find me there. Not in the woods on some Christian youth camping trip. No fucking way. I so wish I'd been wrong about that. Don't think I don't know you're planning something. Crown says when I open the door to my bathroom and step out, cloaked in pajamas and wishing he wasn't standing just inches from me. How the fuck am I supposed to deal with that? He flashes a sharp smile, mischievous and playful. What a bunch of crap. I move around him and I swear I can feel the molecules vibrating in the air between us. Why do you guys always say that shit? You act like I'm some sort of escape artist. You are an escape artist, Crown says, following me into the hallway and pausing outside my bedroom door. When I move to close him out, he blocks the swing of the wood with his shoulder. You're a teenage girl. Don't you kind of specialize in escape plans? Maybe I wouldn't have to come up with an escape plan if you guys and Kat would just leave me the hell alone. Crown purses his lips as I step into the room and grab my iPhone off the nightstand. Maybe if I plug my earbuds in and turn my music up, I can drive him out of here. Crown is not a big fan of Eminem. Isn't it time for you to switch shifts with Beast? I ask, giving him a look as I flop down on the edge of my bed and try not to think of... that. That. Fucking that. I just can't seem to stop fantasizing about that night. I felt worshipped, powerful, in charge. Right now, I feel like a prisoner. Grey Wolf isn't a joke, Crown says, crossing his arms over his chest in what I call bad boy biker pose. It's ridiculous. They all do it. Every single one of them. I feel like it's almost part of the uniform. Gidget, you know this is for your own good. Really? I ask, patting my bed and trying to encourage feminists to join me up on the mattress. The snotty little black and white husky takes his time, stretching and yawning and patting over, but not before pausing to growl and lift his lip in Crown's direction. Good boy, I say, before I refocus back on Crown. Because... For your own good is one of those patriarchal bullshit phrases that say, I'm not independent enough, not smart enough to think for myself. Not everything is an attack on you, Gidge, he says, getting irritated with me. As jovial as he is, as friendly as he pretends to be, he's an asshole, just like the rest of them. This isn't about you or women or even your age. No. This is about a war that my dad started that he doesn't know how to finish. I reply with cool indifference, putting my earbuds in and cranking the music up before Crown can say another word. He watches me from eyes as pale and beautiful as the pond behind the high school, the one that's always mossy and crowded with water plants. They're organic, those eyes, so at odds with the rest of him. I turn toward the wall and stare at the purple paint, determined, determined determined not to cry. Gray Wolf, I know they're not a joke. I was there, hiding in a pantry when my sisters lost their lives. No, better than anyone else, I know how real this all is. By the end of the week, I'm starting to get suspicious. I know Gaz is still fuming about the bonfire thing. Luckily, nobody knows about the lake except Granger and, obviously, Cat but my brother is not the type to let things go. No, that man holds a grudge like nobody's business. On Friday, just before the youth group retreat, I come home and find him waiting in the living room for me, draped over Nellie's perfect white couch in his greasy jeans and dirty leather vest. Fuck, I say, as soon as I walk in. Gaz barely comes over here anymore, mostly only if mom cooks something and guilts him into it. More often than not, He's at the clubhouse, fucking groupie girls and snorting coke. What do you want? My brother ignores me for a moment, taking a drink of his beer. He thinks he's better than me, 
and he doesn't do a damn thing to hide it. Gaz drinks from the club's anti-woman Kool-Aid on a regular basis. I hate him almost as much as I hate Kat, and much, much more than I hate Granger, which is a whole fuck of a lot. I don't wait around. If he wants to talk to me, then he can open his fucking mouth and speak, and head for the stairs. Beast follows slowly along behind me, checking the street briefly before he closes the door. He doesn't follow me up the stairs, but Gaz does. I don't have time for this, I say, as I throw my backpack on my bed and start pulling things out of it. Really, I'm planning on packing for the retreat, but my lips summon a lie as easily as I breathe. Sometimes I wonder if I was destined for hell from the day of my birth. What chance do I really have with a family like this? A family that lies and cheats and murders and parties like the devil himself. I have a research paper I need to get started on. We'll make time, Gaz says, like I owe him the world. Granger told me what happened the other day. I pause, and my skin goes cold. A hot, warm hand drenched in ink, covered in the wet heat of my desire, clutched in my own fingers, the velvet curve of a cock, the air punctuated by grunts and growls and moans. You mean the lake? I say refusing to break stride, pausing only to pat Femme on the head. My brother hates my dog almost as much as my dog hates him. What about it? Grange was there. According to him, you snuck off. Footsteps sound behind me, but I don't care. Gaz has been trying to intimidate me for years. He says I don't know my place. What he doesn't realize is that I know it all too well. To him, To my dad, to the club, I'm just a piece of property, a pawn on a chessboard to be moved at will. I have no decisions to make or goals to aspire to. I simply am. Any action I take is just an extension of my brother and father. You'd never know by asking my male relatives what century we're living in. A hand grabs my shoulder and spins me around, the grip so rough and painful that I actually cry out. What the hell, Gaz? I ask as he shoves me violently against the desk. Fem goes completely batshit, launching himself at my brother's leg. With one easy backhand, Gaz sends the husky flying against the closet doors. Leave him the fuck alone, I scream. But my brother's already dragging me forward by the arm, leaving bruises in his wake. As Fem struggles to stand, shaking his head like he's really taken a serious blow, Gaz shakes me so violently that my teeth rattle in my skull. I am done with your shit, he snarls, and I can see from his pupils that he's completely strung out. This rebellious crap, it's over, Gidge. You hear me? I jerk my arm from his grip and hit him, closed knuckles and all, right in the face. At the same moment, Fem finally gets his feet and savagely lunges for Gaz, Before I can stop him, my brother pulls his gun out, takes aim at the husky, and puts his finger on the trigger. My scream is deafening. That's about enough of that, Beast says in that quiet, menacing way of his, grabbing Gaz's arm and twisting it so that the pistol falls uselessly to the floor. Them snarling and barking soothes when I drop to my knees and throw my arms around his neck, burying my face in his fur. Get on your bike and go, brother, he says, releasing Gaz and taking a small step back. My heart is thundering, and my arms are aching like they've been locked between the harsh metal teeth of a vice grip. Sweat pours down my back, and suddenly I'm just panicking. Shaking, trembling, quivering. I can't stop my mind from rolling through the thoughts. Those thoughts. Those awful thoughts. I slump away from Femme and put my back to the wall, covering my ears with my palms. Memories rush over me like flames, consuming the last of my tentative sanity. Two years ago. I'm standing in the kitchen wearing a black pleated miniskirt, black lipstick, and a pleather vest that barely zips up over my padded tits. I've got nice, healthy A cups that I wish I could trade for Queenie's G cups. Why do I get small boobs and my sisters are both rocking massive racks? When is this goth phase gonna end? Posey asks, 
bouncing into the kitchen in a pair of Daisy Dukes and a yellow tank with no bra. Now that she's turned 21, she's spending all her time at the clubhouse, flirting with bikers and drinking. I can see her becoming Nellie right before my eyes, and it's scaring me. I don't want that for my sisters. I don't want that for me. It's not a phase. It's an identity, I tell her, because I'm 15 years old and I know everything. Everything. That's how most teenagers feel, right? But when I'm surrounded by people like Kat and Gaz and Nellie and Posey, it's hard not to see it as pure truth. The decisions they all make are just ludicrous. I feel like Queenie and I are the only normal ones in the family. Um, okay. And even that sounds weird and goth. Fuck off, Pose, I say. And those are the last words I ever say to my sister. Fuck off. Fuck off. Fuck off. How can those be the last words? How can those be the final syllables that fall from my lips and squirm into her ears? They're so awful, like snakes, like a venomous bite that I'll have to carry the scars of for the rest of my life. Posey grabs a beer from the fridge and disappears into the backyard, throwing her legs into the pool and popping some shades on her face. That's my last image of her alive but it's not the one that sticks in my brain when I close my eyes and call up her name. Like a ghost, a specter from the past, I can only see the way she died. I'm home, Queenie calls, letting herself in the front door. She's 23 now and finally looking for a place of her own to move into. She found an apartment last week and even went so far as to put down a security deposit, but Kat didn't like it. He said that part of town was too sketchy that a ground floor apartment was too dangerous. If he'd only let her move, if he'd only let her go, maybe she wouldn't have died that day. There's not a second that passes that I don't wish it was me. Have you started dinner yet? She asks me when she walks into the kitchen and raises her brows at my outfit. Could be the spiked boots with the three-inch platforms, the fishnet tights, or the black and pink feather eyelashes. I'm not sure. Have I started dinner yet? I ask, picking crackers out of a red Ritz box and popping them into my mouth. Um, no, I won't cook for those people. And by those people, I mean, of course, Gaz and Kat and Nellie and Posey. I'd rather starve than cook for them. Queenie twists her blonde hair up on the top of her head and sighs. <sighs> Spaghetti or fettuccine? She asks, because she's totally into pasta right now. I think it's a pregnant thing, but I could be wrong. I don't know anything about pregnancy, except for the fact that Queenie, she's getting ready to pop. Her belly looks like a beanbag, and she sighs a lot when she walks, putting her hands on her lower back and murmuring curses under her breath. None of us know who the father is, but I wish I did. I'll cook, I say with a sigh, because although I'd rather starve than make food for my asshole family, I'd rather take care of Queenie than perpetuate my grudges and bullshit. Thank you, babe, she says, giving me a kiss on the forehead and heading for the stairs. I'm going to go lie down for a bit. I nod and grab an apron off the wall, one that Queenie made herself. She's been really into sewing since she got pregnant. She says that she's nesting. Fine, but don't expect anything edible. Love you, Gage, she calls playfully as she makes her way slowly up the stairs. Later on, I'd wonder if I'd been a little more selfish, would she be alive? Because then it'd have been me that was upstairs, me that saw the first man crawl through the window with his guns and his knives. Queenie would have been in the kitchen. I could have protected her and her future child. Love you too, I whisper, but only loud enough that I can hear it. I start by plugging my iPhone into the dock on the wall and setting the agonist up to blast through the speakers into the kitchen. Yet another mistake. Loud music. Loud music. Hid the screams. Yanking open the wide steel doors of the fridge, I start to dig through all the groceries that Queenie stocked and find something that I might actually be able to cook. I decide salads with pansier chicken could be manageable. I mean, I just throw leaves on a plate, a breast on the stove, and then cut it up right? That's how Queenie does it. Grumbling under my breath, I rock to the music and start to cook. 
feasting on more salty crackers as I drench a pan with olive oil and drop a few raw chicken breasts into it. It's only when I turn back to the fridge to grab a beer that I realize that Posey's not by the pool anymore. I pause for a moment and then take a few steps forward, pushing open the door and glancing around. Last time she disappeared in the backyard like this, I snuck out and caught her climbing the stone wall behind the property. It used to be that Kat and Nellie let us get away with murder, but since Queenie got pregnant, they started acting a little off. Pose can't bring guys into the house anymore, so she sneaks out a lot. I roll my eyes and turn around, only to see Queenie stumble into the room, bright red blood dripping on the floor in front of her, staining her white t-shirt above the big, round bump of her belly. At first, I think she's having the baby, that something's gone wrong. Then, I see the knife. In the pantry, she mouths, and I can barely hear her because of the music. Racing over to the iPhone, I quickly turn it off and spin, finding Queenie's red-brown eyes wide and terrified. Pantry, Gidge, she says again, almost ferociously. Queenie, now, she snarls, her face as white as her teeth. Queenie stumbles against the wall and glances over her shoulder. I hear laughter and footsteps. Backing up, I grab hold of the pantry door and open it gesturing for her to join me. I don't speak again. I can hear men's voices coming down the staircase. Growing up the way I have, I know what that means. I duck inside, and the doors close behind me just before I hear the sound of a lock sliding into place. Queenie's locking me in. When we moved into the house, the realtor told us the previous owner had put a lock on this door to keep her kids from getting into the snacks. Fucking weird, right? Fucking lucky for me, though. But not for my sisters. Not for my fucking sisters. Boots pound into the room and I hear Queenie make a strangled cry, the force of her body slamming into the pantry door, knocking a few cans onto the floor. I know there are guns around the house, a whole shitload of them, but in my panic, I suddenly can't remember where they are. Scrambling on my hands and knees, I start to dig through the food in the pantry. There's a massive bag of rice in the corner, which is weird because everybody in my family hates rice. That's it, I think, feeling a small surge of hope as I tear the plastic bag open and dive into it with my fingers, getting a dusty film all over my sweaty hands. Buried deep in the bag, I find my dad's magnum and check the magazine. It's loaded. I stand up and move over to the door, trying to peek out through the small slats. On your knees. One of the men says, cool as a fucking cucumber. He doesn't care that he's just stabbed a pregnant woman. My sister, Queenie, the most important person in the world to me. Dropping to my own knees, I lean down and peer under the door. I can see Queenie, slowly lowering herself to the marble tiles, her eyes wide, her lips stained with blood. Everything goes into slow motion then, a world of shadows and smoke. The man standing in front of her drops the barrel of a gun to Queenie's head, pressing it into her forehead. This is for Kian, he says firmly. And then, without any preamble, any requests or threats or rants, he pulls the trigger. My own gun falls from my hands and hits the floor, but the sound is masked by the awful noise of Queenie's body crumpling to the side, going limp in a pool of bright, red blood. If there is a God, he steals the words from my throat, the breath from my lungs, the love from my soul. It's like a specter passing through me and chilling me to the bone. My hands start to shake and I try to stand up. Instead, I stumble back and fall to my knees again. My kneecaps crack and pain ricochets through me, bright and white and hot. Even that isn't enough to jolt my addled brain, wake me up from a world of nightmares and pain. What's happening, I wonder, completely lost in denial. Why is this happening? I'm making chicken. I need to check the chicken. It'll burn if I don't. That fucking chicken. A wail escapes my throat, this penetrating sound that echoes around the pantry like a banshee's scream. 
Underneath the door, my sister's blood pools still warm from her body. When I reach out to touch it, it's sticky and thick and so completely surreal that for several minutes, I have no idea what it is that I'm looking at. I surge to my feet and throw my body at the door, smashing through it, dislodging the flimsy lock. Right away, I slip on Queenie's blood and crash to the ground, my chin hitting the stone with such a violent impact that I can feel it all the way inside my skull, right in that mushy bit that used to be my brain. Queenie! I scream as I drag her into my lap, her body limp but still warm. Warm. That's good, right? The warmth? I love you, okay? So much. So, so much. I hold her and push strands of loose blonde hair back from her face, my tears falling on eyes open and wide and locked on the ceiling without a shred of acknowledgement in them. I don't have to check Queenie's pulse to know that she's dead. Setting her aside, I take the gun with me and stand up, my entire body quivering like I'm in the middle of a grand mal seizure. I almost wish that I were, that I were unconscious on the ground, that I didn't have to think through my own pain. Since I have no idea if the men are still here, I move as quietly as I can over to my phone and pull it off the speaker dock. Instead of dialing 911, I call Kat. I'm the daughter of an outlaw motorcycle club president. This is just what we do. What? He asks gruffly oblivious to the pain and violence and suffering that's filling up the room around me, choking me, making me sick to my stomach. Queenie is dead, and I can't find Posey. There are men here. I whisper, my voice detached, coming from my lips but not registering in my ears. Am I really talking? Is that me? Am I the one saying those awful things? The phone falls to the ground at my feet and the screen shatters. Its broken pieces mesmerize me for several seconds. Broken pieces. Shattered. Is that what my heart looks like? I wonder. But then a warm breeze crawls through the cracked sliding door behind me, caressing my skin like a hug. Posy. I need to find Posy. I wish I'd never had that thought. I wish I'd never gone out those doors. Posy! I scream because at this point, I don't care if those men are still here. If I see them, I will kill them. All of them. I burst out the French doors in the back, holding the gun in two shaking hands, looking for my older sister. What's left of my heart begs the universe to spare me from more pain. She left. She went over the wall and bailed. She's out with some hang around, and if I just wait, she'll come back. She'll come home, and even though I can barely imagine living without Queenie, I'll have Posey to hold on to. But around the corner, there she is, her blood snaking across the ground and into the inset drain in the bricks. Naked. Battered. Dead. My only thought then is that I wish it were me. Now. Big hands close over my own and tug them away from my face, snapping me out of the awful memories with a rush of heat and flame. I lift my face up and find Beast watching me, his blue eyes darker now, a deep sapphire like the sea without the sun. Normally they're as bright as a summer sky. He must be pissed. Where's Gaz? I ask, blinking and dropping my hands into my lap, trying to pretend like my heart isn't racing so fast that I feel like I might puke. Fem presses his head hard against me, offering comfort that isn't laced with innuendo like beasts. I push his hands away from me and reach up to touch my face. Good. I didn't cry. I don't cry. Not anymore. He left to cool his head. Beast responds carefully, his accent thick and hot and sticky. I want it all over me, that voice. I want to bathe in it, let it fill all the cracks inside my heart. But I know that if I do, I'll regret it. That sort of comfort is just temporary. It makes you feel so goddamn good and then it dissipates, like dandelion fluff in the wind, or like blood, down a pool drain. You all right there, sugar? He asks, and the word sugar just calms me down like nothing else. 
It reminds me of Reba and makes me forget for a second that I hate Beast. I'm fine, I choke, standing up and feeling my knees get weak. Beast catches me before I can fall, my palms hitting the leather of his cut, my head spinning from the musky masculinity of his scent. The spicy tang of bergamot nectar mixed with orange blossoms, patchouli, musk. It's a rush of sensory overload that turns my already weak limbs to jelly. As smooth as a sailor, he picks me up like I weigh nothing. Fem, I say sternly as he growls, pulse thundering, body rebelling against me. Such a traitor, such a fucking traitor. She wants beast inside of her almost as much as I wish I could get away from him. He sets me down on the edge of the mattress but doesn't move back. Instead, his calloused fingers find the bruises on my arms, these purple-yellow splotches left by Gaz's hand. He even clawed up my skin with his rough, blunt nails. Most importantly, though, he hit my fucking dog. I'm gonna kill him. I snarl through gritted teeth, jerking my arms away from Beast's surprisingly gentle touch. I'm gonna fucking blow his balls off. I'll give him a talking to, Beast tells me, which actually gives me pause. A talking to from Beast is, well, like getting your face slammed into concrete. Literally. Basically, there's not much talking at all. Will you tell Cat? I ask but the enforcer of Death by Daybreak MC just stares me in the face, runs a hand over his beard, and stands up. I'll tell Cat, I say, because I will, but I know that he'll let his officers handle it, that he won't say or do a damn thing to control his son. Problem is, if I tell Cat about Gaz, we'll have to talk about the lake, too. And again, there's not a snowball's chance in hell he doesn't already know about that. I'll be downstairs. Beast tells me as I check Fem for injuries. I don't see anything, but his head got hit hard. I want to take him to the vet. This is one thing I will happily spend my dad's blood money on. You need anything? Get out, I tell him, because I don't have a lot of fight left in me. Every second, minute, every hour that I fight my desires, I start to lose a little. My self-control bleeds away like the blood from my sister's bodies. My mouth tightens. Out, I repeat, but my hands are on Beast's vest, clenching tight. Get out of my room. There's a long moment of silence. Will you take me and Fem to the vet? I want to get him checked out. The words are hushed, quiet, breathy. Beast slides his hands down my arms and then takes a step back. I'll follow you, he draws turning away and leaving me with this tingling warmth in my body that refuses to dissipate for hours. Hours. Hours I suffer in sticky, unrelenting lust coupled with a migraine. I hate my life. Chapter 7 The next morning, I wake up before anyone else, even Kat, and get ready for a camping trip. Gidget style. I shower and blow my hair out, turning the crow black strands into one glossy sheet of darkness. My eye makeup is thick and hazy, a deliciously wicked cat eye that makes my irises seem more red than brown. Lips as red as the red, red fucking rose. When I'm done, I dress in lingerie, leather pants, a Harley tank, and a motorcycle jacket. Fuck you, cat. I think, as I check myself out in the mirror. Fuck you, Gaz. After I get back from the trip, I'll probably be chained to my bed. But if I'm going to get busted by Cat, I may as well go all the way. Break every rule. I live for breaking rules. Come on, Fem, I say, grabbing my backpack and opening my bedroom window. Cigarette smoke drifts up from down below, and I pause noticing B standing at the edge of the driveway, watching the sun come up. I curse when he glances back at me, ducking low into my pillow so he won't see the outfit and the makeup. Digging into my jacket pocket, I get out a cigarette and light up, blowing smoke through the window. I need a valid fucking excuse for opening the window. After I finish my smoke, I check to see if he's still out there. He's gone. Okay, boy, this is our chance. I whisper to Femme, 
grabbing his harness and slipping it over his head. I tie a rope to the back clasp and then hook it to the leg of my heavy wooden desk. Using the rope like a pulley, I lower the husky down to the ground and then cut the line. I've been doing this with Femme since he was a puppy, so he doesn't freak out, just lets me lower him a whole 20 feet and then stands there, waiting patiently. I didn't originally plan on taking him, but after what happened with Gaz, I refuse to leave him here. I wait a few quiet minutes, watching Femme's body language, seeing if he takes note of anything or anyone, if he growls. When all he does is sit there, I decide to go for it. Using a separate line, I slip into one of Posey's old rock climbing harnesses and literally rappel down the side of the house, snipping the line at the bottom with a hunting knife. Leaving proof of my escape on purpose, as much as I dislike Nellie, I don't want to cause her undue worry either. I head to the left, down the small slope and past the empty lot that my dad purchased and purposefully left undeveloped, over to a small side street where Reba's waiting with her mother's van. I was wondering when you were going to show up, she says, studying me as I first let Femme hop in and then climb up behind him. Get out of here, I tell her as I glance back at the house. If I'm lucky, I'll have a five-minute head start before Beast notices I'm missing. I'm just hoping that he'll have a hard time tracking me down. This place is remote, I ask again, and Reba nods, starting the engine and heading down the street toward the highway. It's not on any maps, church-owned land, she assures me for the millionth time. But even if all that's true, the boys might still find me there. I feel like I can run, but I can't hide. The beast? He'll track me wherever I go. Do you think your dad would throw holy water on me if I showed up wearing an upside-down cross? I ask Reba as she parks in the hard-packed dirt lot and pulls the emergency brake. Now don't you get started antagonizing him on day one, she warns me, pushing some red hair behind one ear and looking like she always does, like some 50s pinup. And no upside down crosses. You want to invite the devil inside of you? Reba pauses as I raise both brows at her. You know, I've already invited the devil inside of me. Four of them, actually. Another dramatic pause. At the same time. Don't get started on that, she says, throwing up her hands like she's 67 instead of 17. Reba opens the driver's side door, props a white kitten heel on the step, and then turns back to me. At the same time? Is that physically possible? Wouldn't you like to know? I respond coyly, swinging out of the van and wondering which camp counselor I'll manage to piss off today. I've been to a lot of Christian camps with Reba in my life, and not once has it ever gone well. I do not want to know, Reba says, slinging her white sequin purse over one shoulder and giving me a look. Dappled sunlight peeks through the trees and paints designs across her pale face. I'm waiting until marriage to find out. She starts off across the grass with me and Femme jogging to catch up. Daddy is going to flip his lid when he sees you here, she murmurs pulling her sunglasses off the top of her head and parking them on the scooped bridge of her nose. But you need this, Gidget. She cast another look at me, and I'm glad I can't see through the shades, especially after you and Granger defiled our church. I pursed my lips, but I don't really have much to say to that, do I? His hand was in my pants. Mine was on his cock. Pure poison. That's what Granger is. Reba's right. We tainted that poor church. At least I know I'll have plenty of company in hell. Please tell me we're making bird cages out of popsicle sticks, I ask, bumping her with my shoulder and watching her lips twitch at the corner. See, even though I'm a filthy heathen, I have the power to do that, to make Reba smile. And believe me, it's a lot more difficult than it sounds. You know how everyone and their grandmother says they have a good sense of humor? Reba's one of the few people in the world that will freely admit to not having one. You're the only person I know who can tame four burly biker boys and then want to do arts and crafts afterwards. What can I say? I'm a woman of many talents. Reba's mouth twitches again as we head out of the bright haze of sunshine and into the shady coolness of the lodge. Honestly, it's as nice as any ski resort I've ever seen. 
vaulted ceilings, a fireplace that's as tall as I am, and brown leather couches covered in teenagers I've never met before in my life. This weekend is free for anyone to sign up, whether they're part of the church or not, Reva explains when she sees me dubiously scoping out the competition. Several of the girls eye me the same way. The boys look at me quite differently. Converting all the lost souls in Lane County, I joke. But this time, Reba doesn't smile. She just gives me another warning look. Sorry, I say, holding up my hands in surrender. Because even if I'm not here to buy into Wesley's proselytizing ways, I appreciate the offer of escape. Reba's taking a huge risk by bringing me up here. There is always, always the possibility that one or more of the boys will come after me and make a scene. Daddy, Reba says politely, pausing behind the pastor as he leans over a wooden counter and speaks quietly to the girl on the other side. Slowly, Pastor Wesley glances back and notices that I'm standing there too. His mouth turns down in a frown and I smile. Reba, he says carefully. You're late. I had to make a pit stop, she replies, raising her chin and daring him to defy her. Although Reba's oddly obedient to her parents, she also has certain things she won't relent on, one of those being passing the word of God along to anyone who will listen. She still believes that one day, I will convert, and I have a feeling that she'll never stop trying. I see, is all that he says, giving me a once-over with eyes crinkled in disgust and a mouth that's turned into a thin, white-pink line. Fine. Pastor West doesn't like me. I don't give a shit. I'm just here for the scenery and the peace and quiet. Feminist steps forward and sniffs the man's knee, the edges of his lips pulling up in a snarl. Hmm, maybe he just doesn't like men in general? I wouldn't blame him. What happened the other day with Gaz was not the first time. Both my father and his son have been known to land a punch or a kick on my dog. Told you, they're fucking cruel. Well, I need your help organizing the bonfire for tonight. There are brand new boxes of hymnals in the back that need to be passed out, and we need to get some of the boys on chopping wood. Oh, I'm excellent with handling wood. I chirp, just because I know it'll piss him off. I'll round up some people and get right on that. Wesley just stares at me like I'm demon spawn, which technically, since I'm Kat's daughter, I am, and then watches as I turn and snap my fingers, calling Femme along behind me. It doesn't take long to gather up a bunch of boys, guess sexism runs strong here and none of the girls want to help, and head outside to the woodpile. It feels good to pick up an axe and sever phallic objects with it. I could psychoanalyze that desire, but why bother? There's no doubt in my mind that I've got issues. About halfway through the pile, I realize that Trevone's arrived, posse in tow, and is making his way over to me. Tina looks pissed. Hey, Gidget, he says, leaning against a tree and watching me for a moment. I can't decide if I like him better for not trying to step in and take over, or less. Does that make me a hypocrite? Hey, I reply, raising the axe over my head and severing another log. Splinters fly and I feel this little tingle run through me. It feels good to be doing something with my hands, something productive. Or maybe I've just been cooped up so long that chopping firewoods become fun to me. How sad is that? Didn't know you were religious, he tells me, coming over to stand on the opposite side of the stump. Trevone's eyes trail the length of my body, from my black combat boots all the way up to the black tank with the mesh neckline and the bright red bra underneath. His smile is slick and polished, like he's aware that he's the hottest guy at the high school. But like I said, me and high school boys, it's just not right. I want men. Note to self, see a fucking psychologist. I'm not, I respond evenly rubbing the back of my hand across my sweaty forehead. I just needed to get out of the city for a while. You mean away from Kat? He purrs, and I grin, nice and sharp. Out of the way, tree. He steps aside and I bring the axe down, twice as hard as before. If I imagine that particular piece of wood as Kat's head, well, who the fuck's gonna know? Dinner that night is fucking atrocious but I try to enjoy the bonfire, singing at the top of my lungs and making sure that Wes can hear my every word. 
After that, that's when the real fun starts. Never in all my years at camp, Reba starts as I drag her down the hill towards the river. There's drinking and pot and making out sessions galore, as usual, but there's also some skinny dipping and ghost stories that I'm showing up for. Plus, Trevon's going to be there, and at this point, I'm pretty sure he's into me. I wonder what it would be like to try dating someone my own age. I mean, to really date someone at all. Even with everything that happened between the guys and me, I'm quite sure that I never actually dated a single one of them. Imagine that. Dating someone who actually attends high school. Someone who's really fucking good at it. Perfect grades, sports star, on track for college. All of that, instead of men dressed in leather and bathed in debauchery and depravity. Wouldn't that be nice? Sneaking out after curfew, Reba continues, tisking under her breath. All these years, I felt like I was a good influence on you, but maybe in reality, you were a bad one on me. My mouth curves up at the corners as we push our way through the brush and into the real party. This is the main reason most of these teens are up here. Sure, maybe some of them, like Reba, really are into the good Lord's word, but over half the camp is here and dressed in bikinis and swim shorts. Miss Gidge, Dina says, handing me a beer and not bothering to offer one to Reba. We all know she doesn't drink. I stare at Dina for a minute, her lipstick so pale she looks like a drowned girl, and force my mouth into a smile. It's Gidget, I say, with a flirty hair toss, moving past her and leaving Shardu and Amaya to gossip behind my back. Hey, Trev. I pause next to Trevone and notice that, at least for the moment, he separated himself from Kellen and Tina. Good, because I'm in the mood to flirt tonight. He glances back at me, mouth splitting into a big grin. Firelight dances across the dark ebony color of his skin, little flames playing in the deep brown depths of his eyes. What's up, Gidget? He asks, taking me in again and trying to gauge the reaction on my face. I make sure to give him a warm smile, a licentious one. Why not? What do I have to lose anymore? My life's already been broken into a million little pieces. What's left of it? Not worth fighting for. So, you jumping in, or what? I ask, nodding my chin at the long stretch of dock sitting in the darkness. Moonlight dances on the surface of the water, little silver puddles of light that somehow make the darkness seem even more ominous. But I was raised in the dark. I know there's nothing about it to fear. No, the real monsters aren't bound by light. They're as likely to strike in a warm, sunlit afternoon as they are in the velvety blackness of night just as likely to spill blood during the day, just as likely to kill. I blink the memories back and tip the beer to my lips. I was thinking about it, he says, licking his lips and stepping back, gesturing with an arm for me to step onto the dock. Why, you think you're brave enough to take the plunge? I raise both my brows and try to hand Reba my beer. She refuses to take it, so I pass it over to Travone and move across the splintered wood boards in my boots and bikini, taking my cover-up off at the end and tossing it onto the ground. Holy shit! I hear him exclaim behind me as I put my hands together and leap into the water. Perfect swan dive. Even though it's been years since I was on the swim team, I've still got it. Fucking Christ, that's cold! I scream as I break through the water. It feels like I've dropped myself into an Antarctic lake or the space inside my father's chest that holds his heart. It's so cold in there, I wouldn't be surprised to find I was swimming in his blood. Travone's laughing at me from the dock, but I've drawn a crowd. And in just a few minutes, there's a good two dozen people in the water with me, screaming and splashing and kissing with lips frosted in ice. I join them just a short time later, putting my arms around Trev's neck and pressing my mouth to his, tasting him and trying my goddamn best not to compare him to sin, to Granger, beast, crown. It's impossible. Travone's a good kisser, but holy shit, he's a boy and not a man. That much is obvious right away. Stop it, Gidge, I tell myself, pressing myself harder into him ignoring Femme as he swims circles around us. Stop thinking about those assholes. What do I think could ever come of that? The best I could hope for is that one of them would take me as his old lady. 
marry me, and drag me into club life for the rest of my miserable existence. I'd rather die. I should just graduate and get the fuck out of here, I tell myself, wrapping my legs around Trev and wondering if I should take it further, if I should have sex with him. I mean, why not? I've already gone to the edge of sin and watched the sunset on any last shred of innocence or guiltlessness I had left. You wanna go back to the cabin? Trev asks, moving his lips from my mouth to my neck and pressing hot warmth against my cold skin. It feels good, touching him like this, but only as good as a hug from a friend or a pat on the back. His kisses don't incinerate my spirit, smother my logicality, smash my heart to splinters. And I want that. Some wicked, dirty part of me is addicted to that emotional pain. I want to hurt. No, I need to hurt. Fuck. I gasp, pushing away from Trev and scrambling up on the beach, moving across the wide, flat surfaces of rocks, slippery with mud. I almost fall twice, but manage to make it back down the dock to my cover-up. What the hell, Gidge? He asks me, turning around in the water and folding his biceps on the surface of the dock. What the fuck's the matter with you? It's Gidget. I tell him, snatching up my discarded beer and moving back down the deck, the warm evening air a bomb against the coolness of my skin. You all right, sugar? Reba asks me, but I just shake my head and trudge up the dirty riverbank to the dark stretch of green lawn that takes up the center of the campground. I'm not all right. I haven't been all right in years. And it looks like this poison might just finish me off after all. The cabins are segregated based on gender, of course they are, and lined up on opposite sides of the lawn. The church and mess hall sit in the center, silent partners in the night. I see a couple of church volunteers with flashlights taking on the night guard, walking around and trying to prevent teenagers from doing what it is we do best, get into trouble. You're doing a really shitty job, by the way, I mumble as I walk up the ramp to my cabin and open the door glancing over my shoulder and flipping off the guards, who have yet to notice that there's a huge fucking party down by the river. The entire cabin is dark, the bunks filled with peacefully sleeping girls. The pastor, in all his infinite wisdom, decided to grace me and Reba with separate sleeping assignments. Not a surprise. So I'm here by myself. Well, me and Femme. Come on, boy, I say, tapping the top bunk and watching with amazement as he launches himself up with ease. Huskies are fucking boss, you know that? I crawl up after him and try to resist the urge to turn my phone on. The second I do, they'll find me here. I know they will. Instead, I get to lie there on my back, staring up at the ceiling and doing my best not to notice the musty smell and the cobwebs collecting in the corners. Moonlight filters in the skylight above and turns the web silver, these brilliant little clusters of light. The one directly above my bed has a spider in it, carefully rolling up its prey. It's fucking fascinating, watching it happen like that, like I'm staring at my past written in silk. Some fucked up Charlotte's Web where the spiders are the officers in my father's club, and I'm the moth, wings straining against their wicked threads, desperate to fly. Sometimes I wonder if Cat will ever really let me leave. If he'll sit back and watch me go off to college, let me live my own life, or if, like the moth above my head, I'll be trapped forever, just a silken mummy with broken wings. Drifting off, I start to remember bits and pieces of that night, how some simple flirtations escalated into a moment I'll never be able to forget, no matter how hard I try. I roll onto my side and do my best to fall asleep letting the soft breathing sounds of the other girls lull me into a false sense of security. It's so peaceful out here, the night sounds of crickets and frogs drifting in through the open windows, the breeze rustling the branches of the trees. If it weren't for feminist, I'd have never known that something was wrong. Two years ago. I hate funerals. All the black clothing, the shiny coffins, the parade of bikes to honor the dead. The dead. My sisters. I hate you, I tell Kat, a veil covering my face to hide the tears. I've been crying nonstop since it happened. 
It feels like I'm still in that pantry with blood leaking under the door, like I'll never escape that dark, closed space. Every time I close my eyes, I relive it. Even the smallest blink, the simplest flutter of lashes, flashes me back to that space, that moment. There are so many things I could have done differently. If I'd grabbed the gun from the rice bag right away, maybe I could have defended Queenie. If I'd pushed her into the pantry and locked the doors, maybe she'd be alive and it'd be me lying in that coffin on that stupid pink silk that doesn't matter because she's dead. Dead, 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 dead. Nothing will ever change that. Shut your trap, Gidge. Cat grumbles, staring across the cemetery toward the forest beyond it, like he too wishes he were anywhere but here. I'm not going to take shit from you in front of the club. His hands tighten into fists on his jeans, but that's the only sign that he's suffering. Or hell, maybe he just doesn't like the light drizzle settling on his head. That's how upset Cat looks right now. As in, not at all. Maybe he doesn't give two fucks. Why? Because then they might start to think about what a failure you are? I growl, interrupting the monotonous drone of the priest. We're not even Catholic, so I don't give a crap about some guy in a white robe spewing quotes from a book I don't believe in. Any chance I had of believing in God went out the window when my sisters died. No loving creator would allow that sort of thing to happen to such sweet souls. I'm cutting you slack because of the circumstances. Cat growls, dropping his dark gaze on me. This is your last chance to quiet up. A motorcycle club president who can't even protect his own daughters, I snap. And Cat lunges up and out of his chair. He grabs my wrist and yanks me up, only to pause when a big, warm hand lands on his shoulder. Prez, Crown says, his voice both soft and hard at the same time. He's protecting me from my dad? This is a first. Usually nobody bothers. My father backhanded me once in front of his crew, and not a single man raised a fist to defend me. Some badass bikers they are. Must take huge balls to throw around a sad, confused teenage girl. Anyway, if anyone were to stand up for me, it'd be sin. And yet, he's nowhere to be seen. I think he's taking Queenie's and Posey's deaths harder than Cat. Let me handle her. Crown continues, as Cat throws him off with a scowl giving me a look that's equal parts love and hate, anger, resentment, I have no idea. When he stormed in the front door with his posse behind him, toting guns and tattoos, cigarettes and scowls, he found me kneeling in Queenie's blood, petting her hair back from her forehead. I was crying when they ripped me away from her body. And then Kat was screaming at me, demanding answers that I didn't have. How could I let this happen? Didn't we know where the guns were? Why were my sisters gone when I was still standing? Questions I couldn't answer. Questions that he had no right to ask me. Years later, I'd realized that, and my hatred for him would morph from antipathy to violent, transcendent rage. It would burn so hot, it would turn me to ash from the inside out, just like the gray flakes floating through the cold cemetery air like dirty snow. Forest fires, burning far away, drifting down and poisoning everything. Not that it matters. Everything here is dark, tainted, unsavable. You fucking better. Cat snaps, curling his lip at me, the double coffins behind me laden with white roses and covered in ash and drizzle. Before I lose my temper. He stalks off with my brother trailing behind him like a trained dog. Two seats over, Nellie puts her face in her hands and weeps, smearing mascara behind her veil. Come on, Gidge. Let's take a walk. Crown says, gesturing for me to follow along behind him. He turns, flashing the logo on the back of his cut. I stare at the eclipse for a moment before I get up, pausing next to Queenie's coffin and tickling my fingers against the shiny wooden surface. They buried her with her unborn baby. I wonder sometimes if I'd called 911 instead of Cat, if maybe the paramedics could have saved her child. Turning away, I trail after Crown, staring at the back of his auburn head and wondering how it is that the gray glare of the afternoon can make it seem so much more red, like blood, 
like fresh blood spilling around a knife wound. I choke and cover my mouth with a black-gloved hand. Teasing cat like that. Crown starts, and I scoff, dropping my hand to my side as I move up to walk beside him. He weighs easily twice what I do, maybe three times. Crown is all rippling muscles, tattoos, and good intentions gone wrong. He used to be a cop, you know, Crown did. But then he found himself on the wrong side of the law, lost his job, and ended up as Cat's right-hand man. Is like teasing a rattlesnake, I whisper, looking down at the toes of my shiny black boots on the wet gravel. Just a few seconds later, it starts to rain, and I feel cold droplets spattering on the back of my neck. Shouldn't it be more like confronting a grieving father? He's the president first and a father second when he's in public. Crown says, his face clean-shaven for the funeral, his green eyes full of, I told you so, and I know better. He's the type who likes to joke and smile, but really thinks he knows best. Drives me nuts. I know you're hurting. I snort, and hysterical laughter breaks from my throat, driving a murder of crows into the gray sky. I whip around to glare at Crown, and his face softens. It's the kindest expression I've ever seen him wear, and I won't see anything like it anytime soon. He feels sorry for me today. Tomorrow, I won't get a free pass. People die. That's part of club life. Sucks, but get over it, right? That's the attitude I'm getting from the daybreakers. Did you? Crown says, reaching down to put a hand on my shoulder. It'll get better. You'll see. Every day that passes will be a little easier than the one before it. I throw his hand off, catching Sin's dark eyes from across the cemetery. He's leaning against a tree, the rain dragging his dark hair into his face. Smoke curls from his cigarette as he stares at me, and I slip around Crown to head his direction. When I glance briefly back at Crown, I see his green eyes burning like embers from that faraway forest fire. But then I blink, and the emotion's gone like storm shutters thrown across a window. I could see inside, break the glass, climb in. But now, not even a hurricane could get through. With a shake of my head, I turn away and forget all about it. Besides, Sin is much closer in age to me, and he had a sister, or maybe sisters. He doesn't talk about it, but I know it's true. Shouldn't you be enjoying the service? He snaps, much less kindly than I'd expected. He's clearly as upset as I am. Shouldn't we be able to commiserate together? Sun took care of me and my sisters for years, but for the last few, he's mostly stayed away. My 14th birthday is the last time I can really remember seeing him around for more than a few minutes. What's to enjoy? A weeping Nelly? A droning priest? A scowling cat? I hold my hand out for a cigarette. In the past, Sin and Crown have always refused to give me smokes, even though they both know I'll find some other way to get them. This time, he just lets me have it. It's hard to light up in the rain, so I step close to him, toe-to-toe, hiding underneath the foliage of a massive pine tree. Fuck, Gidge. You're all wet. Sin reaches out and touches a loose strand of my hair, tugging on the sopping tendril and then wrapping it around his finger. He looks me over in a strange way, one that I barely recognize. His look takes my breath away, makes my chest feel hollow and my heart feel like it's bursting with new and strange emotions. I find my eyes drawn to a few beads of moisture on his full lower lip. So are you, I state, rather unhelpfully. I'm drowning in pain and sadness and anger. So what is all of this newness flooding my body? What is this useless garbage taking over my limbs and making them tingle, Am I crushing on sin at my sister's funeral? What the fuck is wrong with me? Maybe I was born wrong. Cat is poison, so his seed must be rotten too. I look away sharply, but I don't move from sin's circle of influence, standing there and smoking my cigarette as I watch the water come down in sheets. The rain is so thick, so relentless, that for a brief moment it blocks my view of the coffins, All I can see are the gravestones nearest us and the smoke trailing from my cig. Why don't you hang around us anymore? I whisper, and then realize what I've just said. 
Us. Huh. There is no us anymore. Just me. Just me, myself, and fucking I. Sin makes a sound low in his throat, and when I turn to look at him, he's scowling at me in the worst way possible. You're a young woman now. You don't need me anymore. He finishes his cigarette, stabs it out on the tree, and drops it into the mud. When he crushes it out with his boot, I can tell there are layers upon layers of feeling inside of me, trapped so deep down I'll never be able to free them. Clearly, we did. I snap back, and Sin grabs me by the shoulders, turning me to face him. I look up into his silver eyes, and I feel myself start to shake. Tears roll down my face, mixing with my mascara, tangling with the raindrops already wetting my cheeks. He turns me around then and pushes me against the tree, leaning down and putting his forehead to mine. I'm so sorry, Gitch. He whispers, choking on the words, nuzzling me. It's the strangest thing to see the self-proclaimed badass, this 23-year-old asshole rubbing on me like a puppy. No, no, not like a puppy at all. One of his hands falls to my hip and the other lifts up to cup the back of my neck. If I were there, then none of this would have happened. Of course he can't know that. That's a privilege none of us are afforded in life. Answers to all of those horrible what-ifs. There's no way to know. Constantly focusing thoughts on it is psychological torture that nobody needs. It's not your fault, I choke out, closing my eyes. It's not. It's Kat's fault, and Nellie's, and the Grey Wolf Mafia. This is for Kian, the man said, just before he pulled the trigger with cool indifference, ending my sister's and her unborn baby's life in an instant. Kian. Kian, Kian. Who the fuck is Kian? My eyes open again and I find Sin staring at me with this quiet sort of desperation. I stare up at him, at his slightly parted lips, his breath making little clouds in the air between us. All of a sudden, I find myself wanting to kiss him, and I don't know why. There couldn't be a worse time for a kiss in all the world. There couldn't be a more awful day. And yet, I reach down and put my right hand over his tattooed left one, pressing his fingers into my hip. My left arm curls around his neck, and then Sin and I are clashing together in a storm, all mouths and teeth and tongue. It's so cold out that my nipples are already hard pebbling into even tighter points as he presses his body against mine, slamming me into the tree. Even through the rain and the grief and the ash, I can smell the magnetic notes of his natural scent, leather intertwined with cinnamon and blood mandarin, touched with a hint of tobacco and cloves. Sin's hand slides down, pushing my skirt up in a very dangerous way, as our tongues tangle together and his hips thrust against me. What we're doing is obscene. It's disgusting. It's so fucking wrong. And yet, all of this sin wipes away the melancholic agony that has a chokehold on my heart. So long as I'm being bad, I don't have to remember that things can never be good again. If I'm dancing in the dark and the shadows, I don't have to keep missing the light. This is so awful, I think. Even as I moan and Sid tugs at my panties, he rips the fabric just enough that I hear it rend and flick my eyes open, catching his. I'm pretty sure that's the moment he remembers that I'm not a groupie or a club whore, but his boss's daughter. It's that terrible second when lightning crashes into a gravestone and makes me jump that he remembers I'm only 15 and he's 23, and the two of us together is a twisted, fucked up mockery of everything that's holy in life. Jesus, fuck. Sin curses, shoving off the tree and stumbling away. He swipes his hand down his face and then spits into a puddle, like he can't stand having the taste of me on his tongue. The rain comes down in sheets, drenching him, as I stand there in the semi-protective embrace of the tree. I take one small step forward, and he holds up a palm to stop me. No, don't touch me. Don't touch me ever again. In fact, just don't fucking talk to me, Gidge. 
Sin turns away as a choked sob escapes my mouth, and I fall to my knees in the mud, just crying and crying and wailing in a quiet cemetery where my heart and soul are buried along with my sisters. It wasn't just two spirits that were put into the icy ground that day. No, it was all three of us. That's when I knew it was time to embrace the darkness. Because if I was a part of it, then it couldn't hurt me anymore. If I was wicked and awful, then I could pretend that I was untouchable too. I only cried once more after that, on the night I took those devils into my bed. And then, never again would a tear grace Gidget Kesselring's cheeks. Not in this lifetime. Chapter 8 A few hours after my head hits the pillow, I hear a faint growling sound from beside me. I was born into a world of horror and nightmares. I'm too smart to ignore a warning of any kind. My body goes stiff and my eyes slide open. I listen carefully, but the only thing I can hear are the low snarls of my dog and the coral snoring of the other girls. In the distance, there's the faintest burble of the river. What is it, boy? I whisper, so low that I know only Femme can hear me. One of his perky ears swivels in my direction as he stands up, hackles raised. I'm a smart girl, though. I know that one dog isn't near enough to take care of whatever's stalking me in the night. I've seen the monsters that prey on the weak. They take no prisoners. Sliding my right hand under the thin, shitty mattress, I pull out Cat's magnum. After that day in the kitchen with Queenie, he never asked for it back. He can barely stand to look at it. But I keep it with me because one day, in some fantastical future that I dream of but don't dare let myself hope for, I'm going to blow the brains out of my sister's murderers with this thing. I'm going to look down at them on their knees with that same cool indifference in my eyes, and I'm going to send them straight to hell. There's the very faint creak of the screen opening, and then the sound of the door. Two sets of footsteps move across the floor, just before I hear the distinct metallic click of a hammer. Femme howls in rage as the sound of a gunshot explodes through the cabin, making my ears ring. My heart thunder. The men in this room have just shot a girl in the bunk two rows down and below me, and they did it without taking a single breath to contemplate their actions. The Grey Wolf Mafia is back indeed. I'm choking on fear and confusion and pain before I swallow hard and get myself together. I asked Carol Briggs to switch bunks with me because Anne Maxwell is allergic to dogs, and she didn't want Femme sleeping so close to her. In a way, I've just killed Carol Briggs. There's blood on my hands, but I'll be damned if there's any more. Girls are screaming and crying, but I'm already throwing my feet over the edge and pointing the magnum with both hands in the direction of the retreating men. They don't need to take any extra blood. That's not what they're here for. No, they had one mission, and that mission was to kill me. They think it's done, and they're hauling ass. I whistle to keep Fem in check, because if I give him the slightest indication, he'll leap off the bed and go for the throats of these assholes. Instead, I squint in the shadows and the yellow beams of porch light leaking through the window, and I fire at the first man's face. My shot makes contact because he doesn't expect it, turning around to see who was whistling and ending up with a bullet in the brain. His body slumps to the floor like boneless jelly, but I'm already refocusing and firing on the other guy. Too bad these men are as ruthless and as skilled as the dickheads in my father's club. He's already anticipating my shot. The shadow man rolls forward as I fire, just narrowly missing him. He's fast, too so fast that he stands up and grabs onto my ankle before I can pull the trigger again. I find myself being dragged off the top bunk and onto the floor, my skull cracking against the wood and leaving me with little white ghosts flitting around in my vision. Thank fuck I brought my dog. Feminist throws all 60 pounds of his muscular body at my attacker, knocking the man on his ass. There are teeth at his neck before he even manages to collect himself. Me? I'm used to working through pain, so I push up to my feet. 
My head is spinning, girls are screaming, and I can smell the sweet copper burn of blood, but I don't let any of that distract me. I might have been raised by demons, but they taught me better than that. I won't let myself falter twice. Maybe, if I'd been this on top of my shit the last time the mafia was in town, my sisters would be alive. I'm not taking any chances this go-around. I've already learned my lesson, been bitch-slapped so hard by life that whatever damage I just took to the head from my fall is nothing. Less than nothing. I raise my weapon up, move the barrel from the man's face down to his knees. I can't fire anywhere else for fear of hitting Femme. With a single twitch of my finger, I blow a hole in my attacker's leg, and he howls like a banshee. Doesn't stop him from lifting his weapon up and putting it to my dog's side. With a whistle, I call Fem back, and he releases the man with blood staining his white lips. The mafia asshole takes another shot and ends up hitting a girl in the shoulder, a girl I don't even know. By coming here, I killed a teenager and wounded another. This is my fault. This is all my fucking fault. Carefully, but quickly, I line up one more shot on the man's arm and shoot. He drops the gun as blood sprays across the floor. I'm jostled by girls shoving past on their way to the exit, slipping and sliding in crimson puddles, as mindless as Impala being chased by lions. They don't even know what the real threat is, or where they're going, only that they want to run, get out, escape. I stand there until they're all gone, leaving me with nothing but the creaking swing of the screen door the moans of the injured girl, and the screams of the man on the floor at my feet. The magnum is still in my hand when Granger shoves his way into the cabin, followed closely by Beast. The look Grange throws me is acrimonious rancor. It's like he wants me dead or something. Motherfucking son of a bitch. He snarls as Beast moves over to stand beside me, his sapphire eyes dark with the taste of a hunt. He's mad. Oh, and you bet your ass he's mad at me. But he doesn't show it with a freaking temper tantrum like Granger. Instead, my father's enforcer, the man in charge of keeping the rest of the club in line, gives me a once-over to make sure I'm okay, pulls out a gun of his own, and puts a round through the skull of my attacker. Thought you might need an informant, I whisper, my voice much shakier than I want it to be. I engage the safety on my pistol, and let it hang loosely by my right side as Granger growls instructions into his radio, and a sea of bikers descends on the cabin. Give him fifteen minutes or so, and they'll have the blood cleaned up, the bodies gone, and the cops greased. How they're going to deal with the death and serious injury of two Christian camp teens, I have no idea, but this is one moment where I'm glad I'm not in charge of the Death by Daybreak Motorcycle Club. None of that is my problem. What is my problem is the heavy mantle of punishment that's going to fall on my shoulders. That is, if the guilt of what I've just done doesn't overwhelm me. Glancing over my shoulder, I see the blood stain spreading across the floor near Carol Briggs' bunk. She's her mom's only daughter, a woman who was so shamed by having a child out of wedlock that she dragged her and her kid up from the deep south to hide in the forests of Oregon. What? Have. I. Done. We already have three, Beast says, his voice like thunder. It shakes me to the core, and it scares me, too, because I don't want to see the lightning strike. Should I start counting down the seconds to see how far away the storm is? Let's go. He steps over the body toward the door, expecting me to follow along behind him. Granger, however, is not so hands-off. He storms over to me, through the blood and the gore, and he gives me this look that's carnal fucking hell. With his teeth gritted and his umber eyes flashing, he reaches out and grabs my arm, yanking me toward the door. I don't need your help, I snarl, jerking back from him and slipping in the blood. I go down hard on my ass in hot, sticky red and feel my heart clench and shudder in my chest. Turning my head to the right, I see the girl with the wound in her shoulder, eyes rolled back in her head, moaning and moaning. I want to help her, but there's no time for that. It's best that I go with the club and get them the hell out of here, so this girl can get medical attention. 
Clearly. Grange begins, leaning down low and giving me this awful, awful sort of look, accompanied with a dark smirk. There's no joy in that expression. You do. He reaches down to grab me, and I lift the magnum up, putting the barrel to his forehead. To my credit, the move surprises the shit out of him. Granger stares back at me, just a shadow in the night, his rust-red hair bathed in darkness and starlight. Do it. He purrs, staying right where he is, bent over me as I languish in a puddle of fresh blood. I press the gun hard against him, leaving a mark in his skin, no doubt. But I don't disengage the safety, and I most definitely don't pull the trigger. I hate you, I choke out, as I drop the gun by my side and am forced to find my own feet. Granger isn't about to help me up now. I hate all of you. I hate this life. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I'm mumbling under my breath as I stand up, dripping crimson across the pine needle strewn floor. My very presence here has turned this sanctuary into a pit of perdition. The very fact that my DNA is a byproduct of cats, wrinkly old balls, has caused yet another death. I wish I'd never been born. Literally. This is not me having an existential crisis. If I could snap my fingers and erase myself from existence, I would. Hate me while you walk in. Grange snaps, yanking the door open and shoving me out. The first person I see waiting for me is Cat. Girl, he says, nostrils flared, dark eyes wide. You are in for a world of hurt. I'm forced to ride home on the back of Granger's bike. I'd much rather go with Sin or Crown or even Beast, but no. No, I get Grange. Again. He's like a disease I can't cure, a poison I can't treat. I couldn't even take Fem with me. I had to leave him with Crown. Half of me is terrified that Cat will shoot him to teach me a lesson. You are so fucking lucky you're still alive. He tells me, as Nellie meets us at the front door, sobbing and throwing her arms around me. I stiffen up, and I only let her hug me for the span of a single heartbeat. Then I push her aside, trailing blood across the floor as I head for the stairs. Some of it dried in the punishing wind as we drove home at manic speeds, but not all of it. I start stripping right there in the foyer, tossing aside my leather jacket and sopping tank, the bra that has gore inside of it. Can't think about what exactly any of that gore is, because if I do, I'll stop walking, sit down on the stairs, and refuse to get up for days. What happened? Nellie's asking. But even though I sort of feel sorry for her, the truth is this. Neither Granger nor I think she's worth talking to. Neither of us like her. Fuck, that's awful, isn't it? Shouldn't a girl love her mother, especially when she's the only daughter that's left? But I can't. I'm sorry, but I can't forgive and forget just like that. When mom found out she was pregnant with Gaz, she should have ran from Kat and saved us all, the heartache and the pain. Are you listening to me? Grange continues, following me up the steps as I kick my boots aside, peel off my socks, I try to take a stare or two between each item of clothing, but I feel so gross. I just need it off. Off, off, off. No. When I get to the top landing, Grange digs his fingers into the back of my leather pants and yanks me back toward him, putting my back to his front. My breasts are bare. My breath is a panting, gasping mess, but none of that matters. The heart wants what it wants, even when the heart is black, broken and bleeding. Kissing Sin at the funeral stole all my pain away. What would happen if I fucked Grange now? I hate him. I hate myself. I hate what just happened. I'm full of it. All of this wild, wild hate. Nellie is watching us from the bottom of the stairs, but what is she gonna say? Kat is 15 years older than her. Granger is 15 years older than me. My mother's fucked other men in front of me, while my dad returned the favor with other women in the same room. What pedestal does my mom have to stand on? Granger shudders from behind me, his breath stirring my hair. When he leans down and puts his lips near my neck, I almost fall to the floor. My legs are already shaky enough as it is. He leans into me, the bulge in his pants pressing into my bare lower back. 
His mouth moves to my ear, making me shiver. Get in your room. He growls, letting go of my pants and giving me a small shove in my lower back. I'm proud of myself for managing to keep my feet as I storm toward my room. Suddenly, full of rage as well as hate. And get used to it, because you won't be leaving it for months. Despite what you might think, I quip as I pause at the door, turning and bearing my breast to Granger's hungry gaze. You are not my father, so stop acting like you are. With my usual rebellious flair, I slam the door closed as hard as I can, but Grange catches it. He shoves his way in and yanks it closed behind him. When have I ever acted like your father? He asks me, stepping forward and expecting me to move back. That's just proof that he doesn't know me at all. How could I expect him to anyway? We spent a few months hanging out on and off, smoking pot together, getting drunk. Once, Grange sat back and watched me snort some coke. And then, there was that night. That horrifically beautiful nightmare. That dream made of shadows. Get out of my room, I snarl, looking down at my bloodied toes, pressed against the steel-toed fronts of Grange's boots. I can feel him staring at me, this hot, achy feeling creeping over my naked flesh. If only his big, hot hands would palm my breasts, trace down the curve of my waist to my hip. That would make this pain go away, wouldn't it? So you can sneak out the window again? Fat fucking chance. Granger pulls a multi-tool from his belt and heads over to the door, opening it and starting in on the hinges. What? The? Fuck? What do you think you're doing? I snap, as I cover my breasts by crossing my arms over my chest. Finally, finally, I'm starting to get real boobs. I may never be as big as Queenie or Posey, but that's okay. I pause next to Granger and watch in horror as he removes my door from the jam, screw, by agonizing screw. Cat's orders. He barks as I stare at that little moon tattoo on his hairline. If Cat said I was in for a world of hurt, he means it. The fact that he sent me home unmolested means he's either planning something or he's so pissed he doesn't know what to do with me. If he sends Gaz again, fuck. I just hope my dog is okay. He wants to strip me of my dignity now, as well as my freedom, huh? I ask. But Granger doesn't answer. No. He's too busy taking away my last level of defense against Cat and Nellie. A door might not seem like a big deal, but in this house, with this crowd, it's huge. My throat closes up and I take a step back, purposely flicking the button on my pants in a way that draws Granger's attention. The zipper comes down next, and I oh so carefully peel the bloody leather over the generous swells of my hips. Without another word, I kick the pants off and challenge Granger's dark gaze with one of my own. His is filled with violence, lust, shadows, pain. I wonder what mine looks like. Does it reflect back like a wolf's eyes in the dark? Do I look like a predator too? Or is it just Granger that looks that way? I turn and head into the bathroom, not bothering to switch the lights on, and climb in the shower before the water is even warm. The ice-cold spatters hit my back as I stare at the shadowy porcelain floor. The freezing spray reminds me of that day in the cemetery, with ash instead of leaves swirling in the wood, shiny coffins, dead girls. I feel like a dead girl right now, standing in a shower of melancholy and regret. Granger moves over to the doorway, rimmed in light from my bedside lamp. I can see him through the plastic shower curtain. The bottom is frosted but the top isn't. Can he see my breasts from there, or is it too dark? I tell myself it doesn't matter either way, but I want him to come after me, because I'm too chicken shit to go after him myself. Too afraid to fuck the hurt away, because once that's gone, then what's left? What if I'm just empty inside? I'm not supposed to take my eyes off of you. Granger snarls, like he's just so damn pissed about the statement he can barely remember to breathe. I don't think Kat meant to stare at me naked in the shower, I quip, because even when I'm falling apart on the inside, I can pretend that I've got it together on the out. Reva, she'll never talk to me again after this. No way. Not a chance in fucking hell. 
I've ruined the one positive relationship I had in my life, besides the one I have with my dog. There's not a single other person around that I don't hate. What am I going to do? Can't believe I'm stuck babysitting a kid. He whispers under his breath, just loud enough that I know he means for me to hear that. Ire surges up inside of me like a tsunami, just as the water goes from cold to hot and scalds my naked flesh. I throw aside the curtain and step out into the white rug, moving over to stand in front of Granger and not caring that I have to tilt my head back to look at him. You didn't seem to think I was a kid two years ago. What's changed, huh? Granger curses, swiping his hand down his face in frustration. Or at the church just last week. Have you already forgotten about that? He looks at me then, and his face is just all sorts of sadistic and savage. Gidget, you are in way over your head. Granger steps back, his arms rippling with tattoos, his eyes half-lidded, and his gaze cruel. You might have a lush body and perky tits, but you have no fucking clue what you're doing. Don't I? I ask, moving forward until we're standing front to front. When I breathe, my hardened nipples brush against his chest. Grange scowls at me, but when I curl my fingers under the waistband of his jeans, he doesn't stop me. You're so easy to read, Kate Granger. I find the thick, hard length of him, trapped behind denim and straining to get out. As I stroke him with my fingers, I undo his belt with my other hand. The leather whips out of the denim loops with a hiss, and I toss it aside. He just fucking stares at me. Playing games you can't win. He scowls, reaching down to grab my wrist. Instead of pushing me away, he uses it to pull me closer. Kate Granger leans down and crutches his mouth to mine, running his tongue along my lower lip and spreading an ardent wave of heat through my body. My right hand finishes undoing his jeans, and since we're already so close, and I'm already so naked, Grange just picks me up and parks my ass on my desk. There's no door to my room. Nelly is down there. Cat could be home at any minute. If he caught us like this, I'm not sure what would happen, but Armageddon is a distinct possibility. Grange's eyes are so dark and pretty, his lashes so long. It's so not fair. Why would nature dress up a crazy asshole in such beauty? He's almost fuck. I don't want to say irresistible, but that's the only word that'll come to mind. Who says I'm playing a game? I ask as I push Grange's pants down and free his hard length. He's sweaty and he smells like cumin and saffron, black pepper and vanilla. Just a little bit of sweet with all that spice. Too bad none of that translates to his personality. Our eyes are locked as I work him with my hand, watching his breath as it shudders between his lips. He wants me. I can see it written into every tense line in his face, in the tightness of his muscles, in the hard press of his fingers against my ass. Only, this doesn't feel like the hate fuck I wanted so badly. No, it's like it's transformed into something else, and that's scaring me. Granger must sense it too because he reaches up, skims one palm over my full breast, and then shakes his head. Oh, fuck no. He snarls, pushing away from me and putting his dick back in his jeans. I try to grab onto his t-shirt, but he tears from my grip and spins away, raking his fingers through his hair. Jesus Christ, what is wrong with me? He looks back at me, and there's the strangest goddamn expression on his face. Stay away from me, Gidget. Stay away from you, I ask, lifting my chin. I refuse to feel shamed by my nakedness. I won't let Granger make me ashamed. You're the ones who won't leave me alone. Everywhere I look, there you are. Demons. Devils. I hop down from the desk, grab a robe from the back of my bathroom door, and slip it over my shoulders. All I've ever wanted is to be left alone. But Cat won't let me go. He doesn't even like me, so why won't he let me leave? Tears threaten, but I won't let them fall. My life is a mess, but at least I have one, right? I bet Posey and Queenie would rather be here, suffering, than buried in ice-cold ground with nothing to do but dream. I should be grateful. Instead, 
I'm Ruination Incarnate. You're his daughter. Granger snaps, nostrils flared, standing in my bedroom doorway like a prison guard. I'd give anything to go back to that time so long ago when I thought the Death by Daybreak Motorcycle Club was a safety net, a group of soldiers to guard a princess. What a joke. If I am royalty, then I'm the heir to a dirty throne of motorcycles and madness. My crown would be made of chrome thorns, and my dress would be sewn of leather. I'd ride a metal beast to battle, and rule the underground of the city with fear and intimidation. I don't want to be a princess at all, especially not that kind. I'm his property, I say, and Grange doesn't argue. So I pick up a wooden husky carving, a gift from Reba, and I throw it as hard as I can in the man's direction. He lets it hit him and grunts, narrowing his eyes on me. So what? There are worse things. The laugh I give in response to Grange's statement is so raw, so caustic, that it burns even my ears. I still smell like blood, by the way. I reek of it. Worse things than being trapped in a cage of chrome? I ask, shaking my head and moving back into the bathroom. I try to close that door, and there the bastard is again, stopping me with the palm and pushing it inward. When he starts to take the screws off with his multi-tool, I lose my shit. I grab the shower head and spray him in the face with hot water. Granger curses, and then he's up and at me in such a quick, hot second that I don't even have time to take a breath. He slams me against a wall with his hands on my wrists. You're gonna pull this childish shit after the crap you put us all through today? You gotta be fucking kidding. You think you're so goddamn mature, but you're nothing but a spoiled brat who doesn't know how good she's got it. Granger's hair drips in his face as the showerhead thrashes on the ground like a snake, spraying us both and sticking my robe to my body. Grange dips his gaze down and stares at my nipples, clearly visible through the thin, white silk. I do not expect his mouth to drop down and capture one. Hot heat surges over me as he sucks me through the silk, playing with my nipple through the fabric and keeping me on my feet with my pinned wrists. Is this what you wanted? He growls at me. Some hot, quick, dirty fuck. Will that make you feel better, Gidget? Will that make you feel more grown up? Eat shit, Cade. I snap, and I feel that hot rage spike through me again. Before I lose it, I grab his face and try to kiss him, but he jerks back, yanking me along with him and then planting me on the bathroom counter. He tears my robe unceremoniously from my shoulders, ripping his pants open and pushing my legs wide. I can barely breathe, my heart thundering so fast, the darkest, most wicked parts of me whispering horrible things in the back of my mind. Someone died tonight. Someone was shot. The Grey Wolf Mafia is after me. Cat is going to kill me. Fuck me, Granger, I say, and it's so hard to make even those words come out. You're going to regret this in the morning. You're going to regret this so hard, Gidge. Grange slips a condom from his pocket, slides the ribbed latex over his shaft, and thrusts into my aching core before I can even think to take my own advice. And oh, oh, it feels so good and so horrible at the same time. When he kisses me, it's like licking poison and loving it. I might die, but I won't stop. I won't stop drinking in this tainted water and wishing it would kill me. And his cock? That's beautiful poison too. He slides it into me with wicked thrusts of his hips, parting my folds, filling me up to the point of tears. These I try to blink back, but they're physical, not emotional, and so I can't stop them. One falls before I can catch it, and Granger licks it off, but not in a nice way. No, there's nothing at all nice about him. I'm fucking a monster right now, I tell myself, but it doesn't matter. I was raised by monsters. Fuck. Maybe I am one. As much as I know that I should run from this life, pack up in the middle of the night, steal some money, and start over somewhere else, I also know that I won't. I can't. Maybe I hate this life as much as I'm addicted to it.
Granger doesn't say a damn word as he grips my ass so hard he bruises me, thrusting deep and fast and hard. He joins his body with mine, and yet he doesn't look at me. When he kisses me, all I taste is the ashy darkness of hate. He hates me. He really fucking hates me. That's exactly what I want. I put my arms over his shoulders, but only for leverage. I don't need to touch Kate Granger any more than I have to, just enough to make this hurt go away. My lids feel so heavy I let them close, let him drive into me with all the ire and frustration that I'm feeling inside. With the hot burn of his shaft inside of me, it's hard to summon up old memories and impossible to contemplate new ones. For a moment there, I just pretend that I'm a club whore, and Granger is some face I won't remember in the morning. He sweats all over me, his groans filling my ears. Even if he doesn't like me, I feel good. Even if I hate him, I can't stop this craving, can't make myself hate the feeling of having him between my thighs. His inked fingers cut my breast, but he isn't gentle when he needs the soft flesh and rolls my nipples between his thumb and forefinger. The showerhead continues to spray water all over the bathroom floor, flooding it, but neither of us gives a shit. Cat has so much money now, he can just hire someone to fix it. The only thing that matters right now is feeling that release, that freedom from the pain. Fortunately, letting my body take over primal grunts and thrusts and pleasures means that I don't have to think or feel. Instead, my rebellious body clamps down around Granger's as a climax hits me. It seems almost scandalous to feel so good after everything bad that's happened, but the euphoria that scatters itself through my twisted veins is too much to resist. I come all over him, drenching his condom-wrapped shaft and his balls with my wetness. He curses like a madman, grabs hold of me again, and pistons his hips with an angry fervor, coming so hard he spasms against me. I'm going to be sore in the morning, but I don't care. No, for the briefest of moments there, I'm just bathed in sinful rapture. I push Granger off of me. Well, he's so goddamn strong that when I push at him, and he goes, it's because he wants to. He's still cursing, snapping the condom off, and then dropping it in the toilet. You're not supposed to flush those, I manage, because I'm naked and throbbing, and still, I smell like blood. Granger ignores me, flushing the condom and grabbing his discarded multi-tool off the wet floor. He pauses to turn the water off in the shower, but doesn't bother to replace the head or mop up the mess. No, he's too busy finishing what he started on my bathroom door. I just stare at his back, his t-shirt sticking to his sweaty skin, and I try not to hate him so much that I can't breathe. Instead, I hop down, grab all the towels from the bathroom's linen closet, and lay them out over the white marble floors of the fancy-ass bathroom I never wanted. What good is a fancy house and nice things if they're literally bought and paid for in blood? Liquid seeps down my inner thighs, but I know Granger was wearing a condom, so it can only be mine. The proof of my own desire. It pisses me off how much I wanted him, how much I still want him. Even if he's hardly the sort of man to hold a girl in the dark and let her cry. With a curse of my own, I climb back in the shower, turn on the water, and manage to close the curtain, just in time for Nellie to show up. She doesn't act like she knows a damn thing about what just went on in here, but if she does, she might tell Kat. My heart thunders as she offers up a cup of coffee to Granger. It's gonna be a long night, huh? She asks, and he grunts, taking the coffee and downing half of it in one go. Looking between the two of them, I realize that Granger, Beast, Sin, and Crown are some of the only men in my father's immediate circle who I haven't seen my mother fuck. Gross. Turning away, I start to scrub my scalp with punishing fingers, but no amount of soap can ever clean the filth that stuck to my soul. I brought you sandwiches and some lemonade and hot chocolate for after. Nellie stands on the sopping wet towels on the bathroom floor, looking perplexed. I stare at her over my shoulder, and I just cannot find it in me to respond or even smile. Is there a leak in here? She asks, not at all bothered by the big, burly biker dude in the leather vest hauling my bathroom door off to the hallway.
There was. I fixed it. Granger grumbles, and I turn away. I hate him. I hate him. I fucking hate him. After Nellie leaves and I finish my shower, I grab the sexiest silk pajamas I have, put them on right in front of Granger, and challenge him to watch me. He does, too. He stares at me with unbridled need, but he does not move from his post in front of my doorway. I curl up on my bed and fall asleep to the sound of him cursing under his breath. Chapter 9 Morning, sugar! The mattress creaks under someone's weight, and I smell the gentle, floral fragrance of Reba's perfume. I don't even want to look at her. That's how ashamed I am of what happened at camp. I brought monsters into her sanctuary. How could she ever forgive me for that? But I'm not a coward. So even though I know I don't deserve her friendship, I roll over to face her. There are huge bags under her eyes and a smile on her face that doesn't reach them. She's looking down at my blanket and not at my face. I don't blame her. I wouldn't want to look at me either. In this one instance, the club, my father, Granger, they're right. What I did was irresponsible. What happened was my fault. Morning, I say, but the word barely escapes my lips. It's like the flutter of a butterfly's wing, almost too soft to hear. Reba toys with the pearl necklace she's wearing over her black cardigan, but it's too somber of an occasion to make any inappropriate jokes about it. Glancing up, I find Sin, standing in my doorway instead, his back to us. I know he's listening, though. Of course he is. What happened last night, Shug? We have one camper in the hospital, one missing, and a dozen girls who say they saw that same girl get shot. The police are telling us it was a random act of violence from a jealous boyfriend, but why does that smell like a pile of turds to me? I sit up, taking note of the fact that Fem is still missing. If he killed my dog, I'll kill him. Well, I try anyway. Cat would gun me down in cold blood before I could even take a shot at him. That much is a fun fact of life. Grey Wolf Mafia, I whisper feeling like I might just throw up. As I adjust myself on the bed, I can feel the sore spot between my thighs. It's almost uncomfortable enough to make me want to pop a few painkillers. I pick at a loose thread on my black comforter with my chipped fingernail polish. God damn it, Gidget. Sin snaps, turning to look over his shoulder, silver eyes flashing with frustration. Keep your damn mouth shut. I don't acknowledge him or the blue faux hawk he's been sporting recently. He's taken mad shit from the club for it, so it's not even worth my time to tell him that I like it. He stands out from the other men with their beards and their brown, black, and blonde hair. Doesn't make him any less of a prick. Reba looks his way, studies the missing door, and then redirects her attention over to the bathroom. That just ain't right, she mutters, but she reaches out and pulls me into a hug anyway. Why she's friends with me, I really don't know. If I were her, I'd run as far and fast as I could get and never look back. Being my friend comes with a lot of strings, none of them good. I need her to leave and never speak to me again because if the Grey Wolf Mafia thinks killing her will get them closer to me, they'll do it. A lady needs privacy in the powder room. Please just say bathroom, I whisper, but I almost smile pushing dark hair back behind my ears and trying really hard not to think about Granger. It's not as hard as it should be with Sin standing so close. After all, I fucked him once, too. I could think about that, how his was the first dick I ever took between my lips, smearing red lipstick across his pierced shaft. Gidget, are you okay? Reba asks again, focusing her green eyes on mine. Her makeup is so perfect, so exact, but subtle, too. Her dark clothes, however, suggest a somber mood that's matched by the pouring rain outside. It's the Sunday just after Labor Day, and the world is a violent mess, a puzzle that I can't quite figure out. I don't need to know the details of what happened last night, but should I be worried about you? No. Sin isn't looking at us, but he thinks he has a right to participate in the conversation. I can see how tight his back is, though, the fabric of his cut pulled taut over his shoulders. 
Kids will be just fine. You'd be better off if you left the questions alone, though. Are you threatening me? Reba asks in total outrage. She literally clutches her pearls and stands up, confident that with God on her side, she can take on anything. I don't ever want her to learn otherwise, that sometimes, no matter how much backup you think you have, the devil can find a way in. Because I don't take kindly to threats, and I really don't appreciate eavesdroppers. If I had something to say to you, then, sir, you bet your buns, I would say it. Sin doesn't turn around, but the creak of the stairs signals a newcomer making their way into this little conversation. As soon as I see that it's Cat, I want to puke. My eyes widen as he appears in the hallway, and I reach out to grab Reba's wrist, the little silver bracelet her grandmother gave her jangling as I pull her back toward me and into another hug. My lips move next to her ear, stirring her hair. I love you, so please just walk out of here and don't come back, please. I let go and catch the shocked expression on her face as she pulls away. But in my gaze, she must see it, right? There's nothing but cold, gray gravestones and lonely ravens in my eyes. Please, I repeat, and there's a quivering in my voice that catches her stubborn ass off guard. Even when I'm serious, I'm never serious, you know? Right now, I'm fucking dead serious. Dead. I swallow hard as Cat sweeps into the room with Crown, Beast, and Granger on his heels. There's a prospect behind them that I don't recognize, but I can never forget the smell of blood. Blood on my sister's chest, blood on my hands, blood leaking beneath the pantry door. Miss Reba, I think it's about time you headed home. Cat says, his voice as dark and cold as the empty cavern where my heart should be. I'm shaking now, even though I want to stay strong. It's easy to throw up a force field of false bravado when you're pretty sure things are going to be okay. I don't feel like anything's going to be okay ever again. I don't rightly, Reva starts, rising to her feet and putting her hands on her hips in that obstinate way of hers that I've always loved. I pretend to be the tough bitch in this relationship, but in reality, it's Reva. Reva's the strong one, the one who knows who she is and where she stands. While I don't always agree with her morals and ideals, at least she knows what hers are, what she's fighting for, what she fucking stands for. Me? I don't stand for anything. I'm just a drift in a wind that blows so hard and so fast I can feel my bones being crushed to dust. Not today, Reba. Cat says, and Beast steps forward like he's going to escort her off the premises if she doesn't go. The way my dad looks at my best friend in that moment, I can see that he cares as much about what happens to her as he does me. That is to say, not at all. Go home and read your Bible. This ain't about any of that, Reba continues, and my hand lashes out to grab her sleeve to beg her to shut up. If she isn't careful, she could disappear just like that poor girl from camp. If she did, I'd die. I'd really die without her. Reba. She's fucking special. She's one of the last good ones left in the world. Besides, I don't exactly have an awful lot to live for. Beast, take her home, Cat says. And the bearded asshole steps forward, sweeping Reba up and tossing her over his muscular shoulder. She screams and kicks and flails, but railing against Beast is like kicking a brick wall in bare feet. I watch helplessly as my best friend is dragged down the stairs and out the front door. When Beast finally does put her down, she breathes deep and carefully fixes her hair, straightens her skirt. When Reba looks up, our eyes meet. With mine, I say a silent goodbye and turn away to look at Cat. The coldness inside of me overtakes the fear, obliterates it until there's nothing left but ash, drifting in an icy afternoon breeze. But this time, there's no tree to hide beneath, no sin to hold me in his arms. Instead, he's staring at me like all the rest of them. Gidget? Cat says my name, and it's an accusation, threat, and sentencing, all in one breath. Two syllables, an instant in time I will never forget. Where is that blood from? I ask, as hot, salty things drip onto my shaking hands. I'm crying. I'm crying. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck, fuck, fuck. 
Gidget. Cat continues, kneeling down in front of me, his head wrapped with a red and white bandana, his eyes covered with dark shades. He pulls them off and carefully closes them up, slipping them into the pocket of his cut. The way he looks at me, it's indescribably awful. You know what you did wrong, don't you? I just look at him because there's no right way to respond to that. Caper. He says, gesturing with his head for the prospect to weave between the other officers. They're all staring at me, these men, these demons, these devils who fucked and worshipped my body once upon a time. But none of them are really looking at me. No, the only person who's delving into my soul with their eyes is Cat. I feel violated. Caper, the prospect, moves up to the edge of the bed as I sob and shake. I can see there's a bundle in his arms and the blanket covering it is stained with blood and it's not moving. No, 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 no. Now, Gidget, I'm going to ask you one more time. Do you know what you did wrong? Cat adjusts himself, tilting his head slightly to one side, still staring at me. He could be any dad in the world right now, chastising his teenage daughter for making a mistake. Only, he's not any dad. He's a fucking monster. And I'm not any girl. I'm a tortured, captive princess. I'm a broken doll hanging from tattered strings, a puppet for him to play with, to mock, to bruise, to burn. Again, I don't answer. That's a mistake. Slowly, carefully, Cat reaches beneath his vest and removes his favorite gun, his Smith and Wesson Model 29. He taps it against his open palm for a moment, making a small humming sound under his breath in thought. And then, then he raises the barrel to my forehead and presses the cold metal to my skin. Boss. Crown starts, and there's a strange disconnect in his voice that I've never heard before. Shut your mouth, Crown, Cat says, as Beast re-enters the room and pauses with this unreal, almost supernatural stillness. What the fuck? Granger whispers, as Sin steps up behind Cat. None of them move to help me, though. Not a one of them. I stare down the barrel of that gun without flinching, eyes locked on my father's. If he's going to kill me here and now, I'm not going to make it easy for him. I reach up and dry the tears from my face with the edge of a sheet and lift my chin proudly. If I die here and now, he'll have to clean my brains from the wall. If I die here and now, he'll have to explain to my mother why he chose to do what he did. Seconds pass, but they could be hours. I have no idea. All I know is that the cold barrel of that gun quickly becomes warm from the press of my skin, that the steps creak, that my brother Gaz steps into the room and doesn't say a word. Boss. Crown repeats. But that's it. Just that. That's as much as he's willing to defy his fucking master to help a teenage girl with a gun to her forehead. My dad looks me straight in the face and pulls the trigger. To my credit, I don't cringe or scream or cry. What's the point? Instead, I sit there stoically as Cat stands up and pulls the revolver away, flipping the cylinder open to show me that it's entirely empty. I whisper, without meaning to. Next time, Gidget, it might not be. He says, turning away and nodding his chin at Caper. The prospect steps up next to my bed and then drops the bloodied lump in my lap as fresh tears fall and spatter on the red-soaked sheet. Next time, it'll be worse. Cat leaves with my brother, following along behind him as I peel back the sheet and scream. Chapter 10 The veterinary office is disgusting. I hate it here. It's sterile and it smells like bleach. And the people at the front counter were more concerned with getting my credit card than taking a look at my fucking dog. Fem's going to lose his leg, I say, to no one in particular, 
nostrils flared, hands curled so tightly into fists that my palms are bleeding. It's nothing, though, that pain, compared to the injustices I've suffered. Mm. Beast doesn't say much, sitting beside me with his arms crossed over his broad chest. He smells good, like bergamot, nectar, and books. But I couldn't give two fucks about that right now. In fact, I'm not sure that I'll ever give a single fuck again about any of these men. They stood there and watched. As far as they knew, Cat was going to kill me, and they did nothing to stop him. Nothing. After a moment, though, he adds, It could have been worse. I laugh, this caustic, bitter sound that burns my throat when it comes up. Please, I scoff, staring at a rack of magazines on the wall. Magazines. Huh. Who needs magazines anymore when there are smartphones? Only I don't have one anymore because Kat took it. He made sure to give me a shitty satellite phone for emergency calls, but only because he wants to know where the Grey Wolf Mafia is and what they're up to. He very clearly doesn't give any fucks about me. I used to think that in a weird, twisted way, Kat loved me. I won't make that mistake again. Don't act like what you did for me was a favor, I whisper, refusing to take my eyes off of the magazine rack. Where else should I be looking? At Beast with his animal tattoos curling around his massive arms? At his blue eyes catching the fluorescent lights from above and turning them into something so much prettier, like little gemstones in a hard, weather-worn face? I turn in the opposite direction from him, facing toward the bathrooms instead. When I went to pay for Femme's emergency care, my credit card was declined, and my debit card, the one with my own money in it. Cat has taken control of anything and everything that gave me autonomy and freedom and hope. So Beast paid for it, with his own card. I imagine he only did that because he wasn't specifically asked not to by Cat. Otherwise, I'd be fucked. I'd be so fucking screwed. Femme would die because of bullshit and money and hatred, and the last living little part of me would wither away. He was never going to kill you. Beast says, his voice this quiet thunder that just barely reaches my ears and yet makes me tremble at the same time. He could command armies with that voice, Beast could. If you think about it, he kind of does. My father might be the president of the Death by Daybreak Motorcycle Club, but Beast is the enforcer. He's the monster that tames all the other monsters. How the fuck do you know that? I ask, a little too loudly. The receptionist lifts her eyes to mine, dressed in pink kitty scrubs and sporting thick-framed black glasses with little rhinestones in them. I'd get my ass kicked for wearing something like that. Hell, I'd kick my own ass. My throat tightens up as the girl stares at me for a second and then flicks her eyes sharply away. She knows better than to stare at someone like me, a creature of the night. Not a monster herself, but one who rides with monsters through the inky dark of night. A girl who was born of monsters. A girl who fucks them. Curling my lip, I turn away sharply from Kitty Scrub Girl. Bet her daddy loves her. Bet he paid her way through veterinary school. Bet she's never had a gun pointed at her forehead. Loaded or otherwise. I bet she doesn't have to worry about being murdered by mafia men. My job is to ensure the club runs smoothly. That all members stay in line. I glance over my shoulder in Beast's direction, and I'm half certain that these are the most words he's ever spoken to me. I've heard him make plenty of other sounds, though. Sounds of wild pleasure. Only half tame and not at all civilized. He's staring at me with eyes like a lake in high summer, so calm, no ripples. See, this isn't a man who rages, who flips tables over, who breaks faces in bloody bar brawls. This is a man that breaks necks in the dead of night that walks on quiet cat paws, and you don't see coming until it's too late. Beast lifts his chin and reaches up to rub at the short, dirty blonde beard he's sporting. I remember the feel of golden stubble against my cheek and shift uncomfortably in my seat. Feels like a million years ago that I did that, that I lost my virginity to demons. No. No, lost is not the right word. I did not lose anything. I was in complete control. I gave it freely, willingly, sacrificed my soul to the devil's dearest demons. 
Keep telling yourself that, Gidge. I think, as my heart pounds and Beast stares at me for an inordinate amount of time before finishing his thought. He takes his time in whatever he does. He once paused next to me, looked down and met my eyes, and said, You don't owe anyone immediacy, Gidget. I've never forgotten that. That includes my president. Hurting you would kill him. I couldn't allow him to do that. I snort again, but I feel like a deflated balloon, my bravado leaking out of me instead of the tears I won't shed. Queenie would know what to do, I think, and my eyes darken with salt and sadness. Queenie would know how to handle Dad without getting herself killed. Glad to know you've got his back like that, I quip. But Beast doesn't scowl like Granger would, make excuses like Crown, or withdraw into himself like Sin. He just looks at me like an open book written in a language I don't understand. We stare at each other for a while until, surprisingly, Beast breaks the silence again. Cat would never kill you, Gidge, he repeats. But there's a darkness in his voice, creeping around my shoulders like fog in the night. But next time, he'll kill your dog. I jerk my gaze away from him chills creeping across my skin as the swinging door from the back opens and the vet gestures for me to follow after her. I don't think she wants Beast to come. He does anyway. The only reason Femme isn't dead is because a puppet with no strings is useless. Cat knows I love my dog. He knows I'll fall in line to protect him, even if I don't have the will or energy to protect myself. School glorified prison, but at least I'm out of solitary confinement for a while. Smoking is such a filthy habit, Mariva says, in my imagination, as I take a drag. She'll have to keep saying it there for a while, because in real life, she's sitting in the cafeteria eating a turkey and avocado sandwich with Johnny R, while he tries, rather fucking unsuccessfully, to hit on her. Our eyes meet through the grimy glass as I exhale, billowing gray smoke into the quiet, dreadful air. And yes, air can absolutely be dreadful when it's tainted with murder and threats and intrigue. I bet she's in the woods somewhere, half buried and rotting, Dina says in a voice colored with bubblegum, morbidity, and the peach schnapps she stole from her mom. As I stare at her with her shiny strawberry blonde hair, bird's eye blue eyes, and general bitchiness, I realize how much I truly fucking hate her. She's so turned on by the mystery of the missing Carol Briggs that her nipples are showing through her lacy pink tank. Her evil eyes glitter as she looks between Chardou, Amaya, and me, looking for solidarity, another wicked soul to revel in her gossipy glory. There are so many types of monsters in the world, aren't there? They don't all come in stripes. Some have spots. Some have leather vests. Others have pink Prada bags and convertibles. She was shot by the Grey Wolf Mafia and buried so deep nobody will ever find her body, I say. And even though it's 100% truth, it's too wild to believe. And the other three girls just giggle and scream and shove playfully at my shoulder while I smoke. I'm only hanging out with them because, to be quite frank, I don't give a lot of fucks as to whether they live or die, which means, of course, that neither the mafia nor the club will be interested in murdering them to make a point. They're safe in their suburban homes, cozied up under goose down and texting crushes until three in the morning. Huh. Is it weird that now I only live three houses down from her? In elementary school, I lived on the wrong side of the tracks, and Dina never let me forget it. She picked on me mercilessly. As soon as we upgraded to her snobby rich neighborhood, I was good enough to be a friend. Doesn't matter to her that my dad's a crook, so long as he's got money. Guess it shouldn't, considering her dad's a crook too. He's a politician, so really he just has to be. State senator or something, I think. Like, I give two craps. The club exists and operates entirely outside of normal society. Anything we do to play into it is either for our own benefit or to put up a front to keep outsiders out of our business. Maybe she ran off with a guy, Shardu says, her hair beaded with the school colors of black and gold. Go Vikings. Now her mom? I like. 
regardless of how pretentious their family is. Mrs. Dr. Michael Clepson, that's how she introduces herself, drives me nuts. Like being married to a doctor is any big deal. That, and she drives her daughter nearly six hours to the city to get her hair done by a prominent celebrity stylist. Like you have room to judge anyone else, Gidge. I tell myself, smoking my clove cigarette and staring at the shiny black surface of my nails. My black cable knit sweater falls over my fingers and I find myself enraptured by the glow of the cherry as I lift my smoke back to my lips. Filthy fucking habit. Let me have a drag on that, Amaya says, snapping her fingers in a way that grates on my nerves. I hand over the cigarette anyway, watching as she inhales and then coughs. I know for a fact the only thing this girl smokes on the regular is a little bit of pot. Oh my god, bitch, Dina says, laughing like a pink sparkly hyena that shits rainbows. I hate her so much. She takes the cigarette and does these tiny ladylike little puffs that make me raise a brow. So you know that Trevone's parents are out of town Friday night, right? Somehow, in the swirl of murder mystery and mayhem, Dina's forgotten that I almost rounded second base with Travone at the camp. And I've almost forgotten that I rounded all of the bases with Granger right after. Stifling a groan, I keep my attention on the girls and not on thoughts of Granger's hard cock pummeling me against the counter. And of course, I haven't seen hide nor hair of him since yesterday. Piece of shit. My hand shakes as I take the cigarette back. Dina notices and raises a single blonde brow, but doesn't bother to ask if I'm okay. Why should she? She doesn't care about anyone but herself. My eyes start to stray toward the cafeteria window again, toward Reba, but I won't let my own selfish want for love and affection send her to an early grave. He's throwing a party, Dina continues, oblivious to her own cliched nature. She tosses her hair over one shoulder and looks at me in challenge. Starts at eight. Can you get us some rock candy to play with? She bats her lashes at me and I narrow my eyes. Rock candy? I ask. But I already know what she wants. Drugs. It's pretty fucking obvious. You mean like those colored sugar sticks kids make in science class? I mean Coke, Dina says, popping out a hip and looking at me triumphantly. And I don't mean soda. Nobody calls Coke rock candy, I reply in a low, sultry tone, flicking my cigarette into the bushes. One of the administrators pauses near the entrance to the courtyard and looks suspiciously in my direction, but I just smile politely at her, and she walks on. Even the teachers know who my father is. And no, I won't be going to the party. You can still get us some, though, can't you? Dina asks, but I'm already walking away. I don't know where I'm going exactly, but I feel the sudden need to move far, far away from this spot. Maybe I'll cut class early and head over to the vet clinic to check on Femme. He's doing okay, as okay as a dog who got his leg shot off can be. He'll forever be a three-legged dog, but at least he's alive, and that's what matters. Unconditional love on tap. I walk a little faster, but Dina keeps pace with me, Shardu and Amaya trailing along behind her. Come on, Gidget, she says, her voice getting this edge to it that says she rarely, if ever, hears the word no from anyone. We just want a little, just enough to get messed up for the night. It's senior year, for fuck's sake. I head across the hall and out the front entrance to see Granger waiting on his bike. Jesus. My head swims and I feel dizzy all of a sudden, but I'll be damned if I let him know that. Ignoring Dina, I march right up to him and meet those gorgeous eyes of his, waiting for him to push his shades up into his ruddy hair so he can stare at me. He was going to let me die. He stood there and watched as Kat pulled the trigger. The heat in my heart and the lust in my loins, those fruits wither on the damn branch. Take me to the vet clinic to check on my dog, I command, my voice full of quiet menace. Granger doesn't say anything, just looks past me to the three girls standing on the brick sidewalk in front of the high school. They're staring at him, like one might examine a brightly colored caterpillar with red stripes or a tree frog covered in purple spots. Exotic, pretty, fascinating, deadly. Do not touch, except for me. Except for stupid, stupid me.
Ruination, I grumble under my breath. Granger hears me, I think, but he can't possibly guess where the train of my thoughts is coming from or where it's headed. He waits for me to climb up behind him and wrap my arms around his heat-soaked leather vest. Catch you later, Gidge! Dina calls out, and Granger snorts. Really? Those are the sorts of girls you hang around with? He asks, and I get the strongest urge to throw him from his bike so I can take off on it by myself. I wouldn't get very far, though. No. I'd be hunted down like a fox racing from a pack of coonhounds. Well, I tell him as I climb on, and he kickstarts the engine, the rumble of the metal beast between my thighs making my blood sing. Fuck. As much as I hate to admit, I'm a daughter of the club, and no matter how far or how fast I run, it'll always be there, tainting my soul a filthy black. The thing is, if Cat or the Grey Wolf Mafia decide to kill them, I won't exactly be heartbroken. Granger snorts and takes off from the curb in a peel of rubber. The wind tangles my hair as I keep my cheek pressed to the patch on the back of Granger's leather vest, drinking in the rare and brief visit from the hot, hot sun, tasting a storm on the wind. It'll come soon and wipe away all the sunshine. For a while, I keep my eyes closed, enjoying the swerve of the bike beneath me, the way it hugs the road and kisses the curves. But when I open them, I realize we are in no way headed for the veterinary clinic. No, we're heading for the clubhouse. Panic overtakes me, like a bird fluttering frightened wings inside my chest. What are we doing here? I ask, as Granger pulls up to the front gate, slows, and waits for whoever's on duty to let us in. They know who the fuck he is, so we're waved through pretty quickly, heading up the winding driveway into the trees. Cat wants to talk to you. Grange says, as he parks, knocks the kickstand back with his boot, and turns to glance at me over his shoulder. There's a look there that's impossible for me to read. Not about us fucking? I ask, genuinely concerned, and a spark flares in Grange's eyes. For shit's sake, Gidget, why don't you just scream it? He climbs off his ride in a fury, stalking up the dirt path that winds behind the clubhouse while I stare at him. I know what's back there, what's up there, and I don't want to go. Once, when I was five, I wandered off into the forest during a game of hide-and-seek with my sisters. I stumbled upon the cutest wood cabin and my father dragging a body out the back door. A body that was not in good shape, covered in blood and still tied to a chair. I know what happens in that building, and I'm not going anywhere near it. Standing up from Grange's Indian Chief Classic, which I have to grudgingly admit is hot as fuck, I stumble back and end up slamming back to chest into crown. He doesn't look happy when he turns me around and looks down at my face. You're white as a ghost, he says, and he sounds concerned, but really, how much could he possibly care considering just three days ago he watched my dad put a gun to my forehead and pull the trigger? Are you okay, Gidget? What am I doing here? I ask. And I'm both ashamed and relieved to hear my voice shake a little. It means I'm afraid, sure, but it also means I'm not ready to give up and die. Not just yet. Not yet. There's still fight in me yet. My eyes meet Crown's soulful green ones, and I can see that he's not happy about me being here either. Club business is club business, and even as Kat's daughter, I'm not privy to it. So why am I standing on this dirt and gravel driveway with sweat pouring down my back? Don't be scared, Gidge. Crown says from beside me. And if I were a naive soul, I might just believe him. He's very convincing with his tousled brown curls and his stupid smile. But there's also a haunt in his eyes, a specter, a ghost of a future yet to come. Chills prickle across my skin, making my hair stand on end. I look between Granger and Crown, and I can't get a read on their moods. That's what scares me. I can fool myself all I want by pretending I know these two men. I don't. In fact, they're worse than strangers. Strangers are distant, figurative things, people that pass by in the night like ships. These men? They're the kraken that lurk just beyond the bow, monsters swimming in an inky black ocean. I swallow hard and brace myself. If my dad were going to kill me, he'd have done it already. 
doesn't mean there aren't worse things than death. Trust me, growing up in this community, I know there are. I've seen them. I want to go visit my dog, I announce, and I'm proud to say that I keep my voice even, strong, resistant. I still sound like that rebel girl that convinced Granger to lay out a line of coke for me when I was 16. He's a bad man. Beast is a bad man. Sin and Crown are bad men. Cat is the worst. You can see your dog after, Granger grunts, lighting up a cigarette. I really don't like the way he says the word, after. It's got an ominous ring to it that chills me to the very center of my core, my molten hot core that burns with so much rage. Wonder if there's really such a thing as spontaneous combustion. If there were, I'd very much like it to sweep over and consume me, burn me to ash in the wind. Come on, Crown says, as I look up at him into a kind and handsome face. I can see how he used to be a cop. I imagine that once upon a time, he thought he could save people. Now, he's nothing but an outlaw among outlaws. My hair blows in the wind, obscuring my view, and I glance away, toward the old cabin where my crazy Uncle Benny used to live. My grandma had it built for him when she realized he was never going to be able to live on his own. The trees sway like dancers, getting jiggy to a tune that I can't hear. All I can hear is the violent throbbing of my pulse, making my ears sound like the ocean. Jesus, I grumble, but Cade Granger just makes a sound under his breath, drawing my attention back to the tumultuous umber of his eyes and his hair, bathed crimson in the sun-dappled shadows, turning it the color of blood. He can't help you now, Granger drawls, and maybe he thinks he's funny as he drops his cigarette to the ground and crushes it out with his boot. He's smiling, but there's nothing pleasant about his expression. I should have stayed safe in the cocoon of the high school. This is my lesson right here. Stay the fuck in school. Because I know they'll drag me if I resist. I start up the hill at a brisk pace. I don't even have to open the door to smell the copper tang of blood. Please don't let this be the end of me, I think. And I know there are a million ways beyond death for me to lose my soul. Granger reaches around me and unlocks the door, his warm body far too close to mine. Crown will notice. Cat will absolutely notice. Get your ass in there, he says, his mouth so close to my ear that his breath stirs my hair. I can still feel him inside of me, still feel his hands gripping my ass, his mouth on my neck. My heart races and my chest feels suddenly tight. If we were somewhere else, anywhere else, maybe the raft of our hatred would carry us away on wild waves. The acrid reek of blood keeps me from getting too excited, though. Instead, all I feel is terror when that door swings open and I'm shoved inside it. I toss my hair over my shoulder and level a pitying glare on Granger. There's a reason I've always hated him. He has no manners. He's a rude, crude asshole who has no idea how to treat a woman. No idea how to treat any other human, for that matter. I don't know anything about him, except he always seems hell-bent on making me as miserable as possible when he's around. Too bad all that hate makes me want to fuck him. Turning back to face the gloom in front of me, I blink through darkness and shadows to see a kid tied to a chair. Fear lances my chest as he lifts his head to look at me tape across his mouth, ropes on his wrists and ankles. His gray eyes meet mine and I almost topple over. He can't be more than a year older than me at most. He's just a kid. A kid. A fucking kid. Baby girl, Cat says, his voice saccharine sweet and full of mocking derision, both a disgusting dichotomy that makes my stomach roil. Slowly, I redirect my attention his way. Beast is here, so is Sin, and a handful of old-timers that I know are even more cruel than the handsome men standing on either side of me. I'm a lamb in a wolf's den. Daddy, I reply, carefully, and my tone is just as mocking. He's used to that. I know what I can get away with. Come here. Cat grunts, waving me over to stand beside him. I can see the mangled tips of the kid's fingers, 
but he doesn't look scared. Instead, he stares at me with a stark defiance I well recognize. This kid is me in a different body. I'm fascinated by him at the same time I know he's scheduled for the guillotine. If he's in this cabin, he won't survive the night. Not unless the club thinks he has information they need. And even then, he most definitely won't survive the week. It makes sense all of a sudden. I know why they brought me here. This sight, the smell of blood, they're shackles. Shackles to keep me tied to death by daybreak. So far in my life, I've managed to avoid being in on any situation that might threaten the club. Even when the mafia attacked the house and killed my sisters, I didn't see anything that could incriminate the club. Nothing. This right here, I can't walk away from this. I can never run. It's a trap. My breath starts to come faster, my head swims, and I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to stay standing. They're going to kill this boy in front of me, aren't they? Why am I here? I ask. Because I've never been included in club business, not for anything. This is not my world, not even if I wanted it to be. I don't, of course, but that's not the point. The point is, now that I'm here, I'll never be able to run. The kid's hair falls across his brow, the sandy color that reminds me of the beach under a stormy sky. He's looking right at me, through me almost. I feel like glass. I need your help with something, Kat says, sitting in a chair next to me. He reaches out and takes my hand, making me stiffen. It's been years since my dad's touched me for any reason other than to beat my ass. The last time I had a hug from him was... Has he ever hugged me? I have one memory of being five years old and riding on his shoulders, laughing and laughing a sunny summer day away. That's about it. Everything else is a blur. Cat presses a handgun against my palm, and I feel the blood drain from my face. Oh. Oh. No. Fuck. Sweat drips from my brow, stinging my lips with salt. I'm not just here to watch, am I? And I thought things couldn't get any worse. Silly me. Idiot me. This is all my fault. If I hadn't snuck out, I might not be standing here. Cat makes sure I've got a firm grip on the gun and then lifts my hand so that the barrel is pressed up tight to the kid's forehead. Doesn't seem to scare him, though. He's still glaring at me like I'm Satan. Well, Satan's daughter, but same thing, right? Put him down for me, baby girl. Cat oozes, his voice dark and woven with threats. Show me that you know how to follow orders. I look around to see a good dozen men staring at me. They're waiting, watching, a captive audience to my descent into hell. If I don't kill this boy now, something bad is going to happen to me. I'm not sure if Cat will kill me or torture me, if he'll let his men have their way with me, if... He killed your sisters, Cat continues. And it was his brother who raped Queenie, put that baby in her. My throat gets tight and dry, and the cabin begins to tilt and shift around me. I search the room for a friendly face, or at least one with a few less shadows in it, and find Sin staring at me. He looks sorry for what I'm going through but not enough to step up and say anything, just like he didn't when Cat had a gun pressed to my forehead. He looks away first, and I turn my attention back to the boy, rock and hard place. My bones are being crushed to dust between them as I stand there and frantically search for a way out. There must be a way. There's always a way. Slowly, I reach out and pull the tape from the boy's mouth. Great, he gasps and I realize that he's giving me his name, looking right into my face and holding my gaze. My name is Grey Wolf. Stupid name considering my father's profession, but it is what it is. He tilts his head to look at me, and that sandy hair of his falls across his sweaty forehead. How about yours? It's Gidget, right? Fucking hell. He's humanizing himself for me making me face the reality of what Katz just told me to do. I don't answer him. Kat wouldn't like it if I did. Did you kill my sisters? 
I ask. But the boy is already shaking his head. He looks me right in the eye. Panic zings through me. If I shoot him, I will never forget that look. If I don't, I may not have much time left to do the remembering. I didn't have anything to do with that, Gray tells me, scowling. I imagine he's telling the truth, though. He's my age, so he would have been 15 or so at the time. It's unlikely he would have been involved. And Gian, he continues, triggering my memory. For the first time since Kat handed me the gun, my hand starts to shake. Kian. Kian, Kian. This is for Kian. That's what the asshole said just before he killed Queenie. But who is Kian? Kian? The kid continues, and he looks sad as hell. He looks like I do when I brush my hair with Queenie's antique brush, or when I put on Poppy's favorite beach hat. My brother, he didn't rape Queenie. He was in love with her. Blow his head off, Cat says, but he doesn't say it with any sort of heat. It's all ice and wicked cold wind in his words. They chill me to the bone. He in loved Queenie, Gray repeats, looking at me, pleading with me to accept the truth. His face says he understands he's going to die, but he's desperate for someone to know before he leaves this earth. They had plane tickets, a house, cash in the briefcase. They were going to leave together. Your club killed my brother before they got a chance to go. I look at Kat, but I don't have to ask. If he believed Queenie was raped, he would kill the man and attack the organization responsible. The thing is, I don't know if that's what he really believes. For all I know, Queenie was in love with this guy. The silence stretches hot and sticky between us. I can feel the eyes of the men in that room like heavy weights around my shoulders. My knees may very well buckle. Bile rises in my throat and I'm just suddenly filled with so much rage and frustration that my vision blurs. Gray must see it. That boy strapped to a chair with a voice made of charcoal and heat. I'd like him if he weren't stuck in this cabin with the angel of death curling wicked fingers around his throat. I'd like him if he weren't a part of the mafia that killed my sisters. I'd like him in a nice, normal world that I'll never inhabit. Shoot me then and get it over with, Gray growls after a minute, curling his bloodied fingertips under. He looks away from me and closes his eyes, preparing for the worst. He knows better than to plead, and he's already said what he needed to say. I must look like the least receptive person in the world, sweating and shaking and filled with hatred. In that moment, however, most of it is for Cat. How dare he? How fucking dare he do this to me? My finger is on the trigger, my heart is in my throat, and I feel like the seconds are ticking away to my doom. Either I kill this boy, or I dig my grave right next to his. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? He's just a boy, I say, breathless and desperate. Cat grunts. Law says he's grown at 18. He ain't no kid. He stands up from his chair and crosses his arms over his chest. That's how I know I'm running out of time. My eyes flick up to find crowns, and there's a sadness and an acceptance there that I don't find on any other face. Doesn't change things. He's not going to help me. Beast with his cool indifference isn't going to help me. Sin won't even look at me. And Granger? He's the worst one of them all. He's scowling like he's fucking put out by having to be here. Don't feel bad, Gray says after a moment, his eyes like stars and his sweaty, bloody face. He turns back to look at me. My dad's the same way. Gray swallows and lifts his chin in defiance. You can kill me and feel no regrets. It's okay. He looks at me like I'm the one who needs the help. Hell, I doubt my dad will even leave the casino when he finds out I'm missing. My finger tenses on the trigger but I don't think I can do it. I think that even if it means I'll die, I can't shoot Gray in the face. Gray Wolf, that last name, that association, he's the son of the Don of the Gray Wolf Mafia. By all rights, I should want him dead. But he wasn't there that day. He didn't kill my sisters. This isn't 
justice. Casino? Kat asks, exchanging a look with Rene. And then the miraculous happens. He reaches down and pushes the gun away from Gray's face. What casino? Triangle Lake Resort. Gray replies, nostrils flaring. He has an entirely new operation running out of there. It's why he wants your club gone. Gray looks at me with a bit of relief in his face, but not because he thinks he saved his ass. He hasn't. No, the club is a double-edged sword. Either Gray dies for not talking, or he dies because he's a rat. The club hates rats. Either way, he's screwed. But I think he believes he's saved me. I know Kat far too well to believe that. My father grunts and gives me a look. When our eyes meet, I realize I still have a loaded handgun clutched in my fingers. I could point it at him and shoot. I'd die afterward, but I'm going to die anyway, because Kat will bring me back here, and he'll ask me to do this again. And next time, there won't be a magic out. Looks like this is your lucky day, Gidge, he says, reaching out to curl his fingers around my upper arm. I can't look away from him from the dark shadows in his eyes that I don't remember being there before Queenie and Posey died. But luck don't last forever. Get your ass home for the night. Cat grabs the pistol back from me and then takes a seat, leaning in and waiting for Gray to continue his story. I back up slowly, trying to avoid attention, and end up bumping into Crown's chest. He steers me around and out the door. I have never been so fucking happy to smell the cool fall air like pumpkins and frost and maple syrup. I end up rooted to the spot, watching the trees billow in the breeze. Their leaves aren't quite the brilliant orange-red of autumn. Not yet. I'll take you home, Crown says, and I turn back to look at him. He's a beautiful man, but I don't feel anything when I stare into his green eyes. Lie, 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 lie. I try to focus on his mouth instead, but that doesn't help. It's too full to think about anything other than kissing him. Hot lips and tongue tentatively tasting mine, testing, searching, claiming. Memories flood my head and I shake them away. I brought her here, I'll take her home. Granger interjects, stepping outside the cabin and making sure the door is locked behind him. He turns to Crown and I feel the shiver of tension between the two of them. The air no longer tastes like crisp fall and apples. Instead, it reeks of violence. I've got it under control, Crown says, voice smooth and cool but threaded through with just a dollop of violence. He runs his right hand down his arm over the tattooed badge that graces his bicep. Doesn't take a genius to figure out the meaning behind that one. Ex-cop, current criminal. I said... I'll take her home, Granger repeats, and the two men stare each other down with wicked intent. I can hardly even believe what I'm seeing. Are they fighting over me? I'm not looking to be anybody's old lady, I choke out. Remember what I said? A fate worse than death. Being strapped to the club for the rest of my life is an unimaginable horror. A sickness crashes over me when I realize that, no matter what, these idiots are thinking, I'm already trapped. Forever caged. A bird with broken wings. I clamp a hand over my mouth. Old lady. Granger scoffs, choking on his own bitter laugh. He rakes tattooed fingers through his dark hair. Are you kidding me? You're 17 fucking years old. Who the hell said they wanted you as their old lady? If my age is such an issue, why'd you fuck me the other night? I ask and I feel Crown stiffen beside me. The look he throws Granger is too nuanced for me to pick apart. I'm tired, and I just want to go to sleep for the next ten years. But that violence in the air? It begins to boil. If Cat finds out... Crown begins. But Cade Granger is already stalking off into the darkness, throwing me an awful, awful look over his shoulder, one that's half poison and half lust. Our eyes meet, and it's like the slash of a knife. I wonder if I'm bleeding from that glance. Cat isn't going to find out unless you tell him, Granger adds, pausing 
and prowling back a few feet to get in Crown's face. If you do, I've got other stories I could tell. Are you threatening me? Crown whispers, but I step between them before they can start fighting. There's a tightness in their shoulders, the taste of pain in the air. Inside that cabin, there's a kid who's about to be tortured. Even if he talks, they won't let him off easy. I'm going to fucking puke. You're not sinless, Crown. Granger snaps, getting out another cigarette and lighting up. He looks at me like this is all my fault. And neither are you. Go to hell and eat a dick, I tell him, just before he turns and storms off into the darkness. I fucking hate that man. That'll never work, you know. Crown says, drawing my attention back to him. His green eyes are soft but patronizing. Makes me want to punch him. When he smiles, it isn't nice. No, it's the sort of condescending smile you give to helpless person while you watch them flounder. You and Granger, he's just not that sort of man. My turn to snort a laugh. Are you kidding me? I ask, looking him over in his tight white t-shirt, brown hair catching the light from Granger's bike as he turns his headlights on. You think I'm interested in that asshole? I shake my head and turn away, looking up toward the distant sky, bathed in orange and red. It's still only early afternoon, and I have a few classes left I could attend. Only, I don't feel like going back. No, if Dad has decided to take things this far, I need to get out, and quick. I need to run. But if I'm going to run, I'm taking that kid with me. It was just a fuck crown, get over yourself. I start off toward the row of bikes, but he reaches out and grabs my arm. I can't figure out for the life of me what he's doing, but he pulls me back and turns me around to face him. Leaning over, Crown overwhelms me with his scent, like violets and suede, and I find it suddenly hard to swallow past a tight throat. Maybe it was just a fuck, but he's still no good. Crown continues, sliding his fingers down my upper arms. It feels so good that I get chills, especially when his mouth gets up close and personal with my own. There's a split second there where I feel like he might kiss me. He doesn't. No, even when Crown is bad, he's good. He's a rule follower, if I've ever seen one. I scowl as I turn away from him. Why am I even thinking about kissing this asshole anyway? Why did I ever think to kiss this asshole in the first place? That was what started it all. That night I'll never be able to forget. No matter how far I run, no matter how fast I go. Take me to the vet, I repeat, wondering if Crown will. He might, if Cat hasn't explicitly told him not to. He stares at me for a long time, the green of his eyes as rich as the needles on the evergreen trees around us. They feel like they're leaning over us, like they're closing in on me. Okay he says, finally, pulling away and shaking himself like he's throwing off a cloak of useless emotion. Whatever Crown might feel for me, it's just as shallow as what happened between Granger and me the other night. It's nothing deep. It's not meaningful. And yet, I'm still fucking ruined. Chapter 11. One and a half years ago. The soft blue petals of sadness bloom into the fiery red of anger with just a few tears. It's astonishing how quickly it happens, and all without the soul even noticing. It's like, one day, you wake up and you don't just want to lie there anymore. One day, you open your eyes and you're full of energy with no outlet, energy that makes you want to hurt something or someone. Mostly, it makes you want to hurt yourself. I dress in thigh highs and a plaid skirt, a top that's just barely a bra, and enough makeup to join a circus, and then I go out looking for trouble. Where do you think you're going looking like a fucking whore? Gaz asks, standing outside the front door, smoking a cigarette. He looks me up and down like he doesn't know who I am anymore. The ironic part of all that is that Gaz has never known me. He never knew Queenie or Posey. He was always treated differently for having a penis. I've hated him for it since I turned 10, and he stopped wanting to wrestle or roughhouse with me. 
Eat a dick, I snap, turning around and walking backwards so I can flip him off. Gaz glares at me, but he doesn't move to stop me. We're not at that point yet, where he's using his anger and hatred for me to exert control. Not yet. We'll get there. Cat will get there. But everyone is still grieving, frozen in time, stuck in melancholy like Pompeii was forever frozen in ash. But I'm tired of being stuck. So I leave and head for the old foreclosed Victorian, where all the good parties are. Being drunk or stoned or fucked has got to be better than being sad. Nothing is worse than being sad. My bodyguard of the day is Colton Young, a.k.a. Sin, and he doesn't give me much of a head start. At first, when he was assigned to watch over me, he tried to stay back and pretend he wasn't there, like he was giving me some semblance of privacy, or just avoiding me, maybe. Where are you going? He asks, and I shrug, smoking a cigarette and thinking how at 16 I'm so goddamn cool. The wind lifts my skirt, but I don't care because I've put on panties that I want everyone to see. To party, I say with a shrug. I can feel that white, hot anger surging through me. I know why it's there and where it's come from, but I don't know what to do with it. I just miss my sisters. I just want my sisters back. My life thus far, it hasn't been pretty. But even with all the shit my parents put us through, we had each other. Now, I'm all alone. And it pisses me off. At the artifact? Sin asks. And I pause, glancing over at him, idling on his bike next to the curb. His hair is shaved short, but only because the guys in the club have been mercilessly teasing him for the purple mohawk. I miss it but I'm not about to tell him that. How do you know about the artifact? I ask suspiciously, and Sin laughs. Are you fucking kidding me? He snorts, kicking the brake into place and leaning back, crossing those finely muscled arms over his chest. He's tattooed in glorious Americana, a Route 66 sign in the crook of one arm, the Statue of Liberty on the other. I can't look away from the swells of his biceps, the wicked curve of his smirk, and those eyes, charcoal-flecked silver that burns with hidden embers, long doused but still piping hot. I'm not that old. I used to party there, too. Sin shakes his head and looks away, in the direction of the old house. The brass plate near the crooked front door reads Jensen Manor and Inn, an artifact of historic downtown Ashbury. But artifact is spelled all weird, like it's British or something. I don't even know. Besides, you think the club doesn't know where all the seedy hotspots are? He looks me up and down, like Gaz did. But his assessment is decidedly more pleasant. Less hatred. More appreciation. He thinks I'm hot, huh? I wonder with a smirk, doing my very best not to think about our kiss in the cemetery. That wasn't flirtation. That was something darker. That was desperation. You want a party, huh? Duh, I say, thinking I'm seriously fucking killing this. I probably look like an idiot. Sin gestures with his head for me to climb on his bike. If you want a party for real, get on. He waits for me to take up the spot behind him, wrapping my arms around his waist and breathing in his scent. Sin smells like hot leather and cinnamon gum laced with tobacco, cloves, and fresh male sweat. I fucking love it. He smells like trouble, and I'm all about trouble right now. I could bottle your smell and sell it, I murmur, sitting up a bit and leaning forward to press a kiss to his ear. Sin stiffens up and his tattoo fingers curl around the handlebars of the bike. You think so? He asks, his voice pitched in a deep purr, like he's getting ready to break into an angsty metalcore song, something written for his dead sister. My skin prickles and I feel this almost tangible connection between our broken souls. He has a dead sister. I have dead sisters. We're birds of a feather, me and him. I don't answer, and after a moment, Sin kickstarts the engine and we take off, turning around in the middle of the street and heading back in the direction of the Death by Daybreak clubhouse. The clubhouse. Oh, am I old enough to be invited to the clubhouse now? 
I feel a sharp thrill in my blood as we weave through side streets and then crawl through roads flanked by forests, sun dappled and cool with shadows. It's a decent drive, far enough from the city that the suburbs can't hear the parties. Or the screams. Half an hour later, we pull through the gates and head across the compound, towards the bar. Men and women mingle outside, under strings of white lights. There are kegs and empty hard liquor bottles, ruckus laughter and fucking, all under a cloud of screaming metal music. The California chapter of Death by Daybreak is in town, and they're having a bit of a celebration. It's only been six months since my sisters died, and the party feels like a betrayal. I turn that sadness into anger real quick, let it burn my blood to ash. Sin pulls up in a space near the front, and I climb off, noticing several of the club whores giving me wicked once-overs. Better not start shit with me, though. They know who my father is. I feel like a princess when I strut up those stairs and grab a beer. Cat is nowhere to be seen, but Beast is staring at me from across the room. He doesn't hesitate to make his way over. My heart thumps wildly, but I don't pay it much attention. Beast is hot. So what? There are, like, a dozen guys in here that fit that description. Maybe you're just scared of him, my unconscious mind whispers, but I brush her assessment off. Most of the men in Cat's Club are afraid of their enforcer. I never have been. Can't say why. He'd kill me if my father asked him to. That much I know for sure. And yet? I can't seem to summon up an ounce of fear for the big man with the ice blue eyes. What are you doing here? He asks, his voice like spring runoff, freshly melted and wicked cold. Doesn't bother me. I'm wicked hot. So all it does is cool my overheated skin. I pop the top on my beer and drink some while he stares at me. His hair is sandy like it was once light brown, but all that sun has bleached it. It matches his short beard while groomed compared to other members of the club. I usually hate beards, but it looks good on Beast. Partying? I quip. And later, when I remember this moment, I'll wonder if he thought I was beautiful or stupid, if he looked at me like a woman or a nuisance. Or it is, this is the best place in town. This is the best place in town for that. Beast replies smoothly, letting me drink the beer, even though he doesn't look particularly happy about it. But there's no place for you. Does Cat know you're here? I shrug, but I honestly don't care. My father's barely talked to me since the murders. Besides, this is how he brought me up, bathed in cigarette smoke and fucking and the stale smell of beer. This is what I know. It's what I'm destined for, so why not embrace it? I finish my beer and grab another, and still Beast doesn't stop me. He watches as I walk away, looking for sin. I find him in the main room, up close and personal with a young blonde that I don't recognize. Seeing him leaning over her like that infuriates me, and I find myself marching across the room and grabbing him by the arm. I wander off for a beer and you lose focus? I ask, and he blinks gray eyes at me, like he has no idea what I'm talking about. Of course, the confusion in his gaze fades considerably when I slide my palms up the front of his chest and curl my fingers together behind his neck. Lifting up on my tiptoes, I press my mouth against his. There's a slight hesitation at first, and I feel a zing of hurt travel through me, amping up the angry pain that's swirling around inside my chest. But then Sin's mouth opens, and I find it just as hot as my blood. His tongue slides against mine as he puts his hands on my hips and squeezes tight, pulling me against his chest. The men and women around us erupt in cheers and hoots. Well, everyone except the blonde, but fuck her. Sin's mouth claims mine in a way I didn't know I needed. He takes away my stress and replaces it with lust. It burns as hot as my rage, and I find myself pressing against him, encouraging him, begging him for more. He gives me what I ask for, kissing me and holding on so tight his fingers are likely to leave bruises. I don't care. It feels too damn good, like I'm losing myself in his embrace. And that's what I want, to let go of my emotions completely and never find them again. I'd happily drown in Sin's ministrations. We break apart for a moment, my breath fluttering like a butterfly's wings, my lips stinging. I need another drink. I whisper, 
as Sin releases me, a noticeable bulge in his tight, dark denim jeans. Maybe I can finally lose it tonight, I think, hating my virginity with a passion. No idea why. It just feels false. Like, it's supposed to be this big fucking deal. And yet, all I want is to know if I can find oblivion in sex the way I can find it in alcohol. But if I'm going to lose it tonight, I want another beer first. Makes it easier to hold on to my bravado and my anger. My melancholy is like a specter, flitting at the edges of my vision, threatening its intrusion. I refuse to let it in. I can feel Sin's eyes on me as I saunter away and grab another brown bottle, popping the top as he moves over to stand beside me. He even puts his forearm on the wall and leans over me like he was just doing to that other girl. A flip has been switched, and I love it. I'm not Kat's daughter right now. I'm not a kid. I'm a red-blooded woman in the DBD clubhouse in a short skirt and heels. I feel my lips curve into a smile. What's that expression for? Sin whispers, his voice barely audible above the din. I look up and find his face so close to mine, I think about kissing him again. But nah, I want to keep him on his toes. This whole flirting thing is seriously floating my boat tonight. It's the outlet that I needed, the one that I was looking for. I don't care if it's healthy or not, only that in the moment, I feel okay. And that's worth my soul right now. I'm tired of feeling sad and weepy and broken. I hate it. Just enjoying myself, I reply, shivering as he reaches down with a single inked finger and traces my clavicle. It feels so good. I can't stop myself from making a small sound, one that draws Sin's mouth to the side of my neck. He kisses his way down my skin, tasting me. Sensations overwhelm me, unfamiliar urges taking over my body. Despite my upbringing, my heritage, the fact that I was born of the devil, I'm still a virgin. Hey, I tell him, putting my palm against his chest and pausing our heated little moment. I need to use the bathroom real quick. Sin nods and steps away, watching as I scurry off in the direction of the back hall and the bathrooms. I've got my purse with me, so I slip into the first door I come across with the intention of refreshing my makeup. I'm not scared about what's happening with Sin. I'm excited. My virginity isn't a trophy I'm clinging to, waiting for some whitewashed jock asshole to come and win. No, it's just another part of my life, and I'm ready to move forward with something different. I pause with my back to the bathroom door. Sorry, didn't know this one was occupied, I say when I find Cade Granger leaning over the counter, cutting lines of white powder on a mirror. He barely pauses to look up at me, but he does smile as he lines up the coke with a razor blade. I've never seen that asshole smile before. It really throws me for a loop. You want a line? He asks me, his voice like the rumble of a beast, like one of those motorcycles outside the front door. He sounds mechanically vicious, but in a good way. I take a step forward, still holding my purse and my beer. I've smoked plenty of pot and cigarettes, had plenty of alcohol, but I've never moved past that threshold. I've never wanted to. Before Queenie and Posey, I wanted to get as far away from all of this as possible. But now, I couldn't care less whether I live or die. So what does it matter? Sure, I say with a shrug, stepping forward and setting my purse on the counter next to the mirror. Granger barely looks up at me as he plugs a nostril with his finger and snorts a line. I watch how he does it, so I don't look like a complete idiot. After he's done, he swipes the remaining powder up with a finger and rubs it on his gums. You new around here? He asks me as I lean over the counter and I pause, glancing up at him from behind a sheet of dark hair. Oh, he doesn't recognize me. The asshole seriously doesn't recognize me. Am I wearing that much makeup, or is he just an idiot? I decide I don't care either way. Instead of answering him, I smile mysteriously and bend down, mimicking Grange as I press one finger to my nostril and inhale. It's a weird fucking sensation, and I end up coughing as I step back and rub at my nose. I swear, I can taste chemicals in the back of my throat, 
Like that cleaner Queenie used to scrub the bathroom with that made me feel lightheaded. Or maybe like medicated eye drops. Yep, that's what that taste is. Granger laughs at me, hooking an arm around my waist as he leans down and snorts another line. Meanwhile, my head is buzzing and I feel like I'm swaying on my feet. You're beautiful, you know that? He tells me. And it's the only nice thing I've ever heard him say. I turn my head up to look at him, and even though I know it's a line, I don't care. When he bends down to press his mouth to mine, my lips are buzzing, and a groan slips out unbidden. It's not an inquisitive, questing kiss, or even a claiming mark. No, it's just a whirlwind of lust and heat and debauchery. Kissing Granger is like sipping shadows. I can feel that darkness flowing into me and taking over. Or maybe that's the cocaine working its magic. Granger turns me to face him and then pushes me none too gently against the wall, stepping in and leaning down with the practiced perfection of a man whore. It's nice, though, all this choreographed romance being thrown my way. I wonder how long it'll take this idiot to realize who I am. Wrapping my arms around his neck, I kiss him deep and I don't worry about sin. It's not like we're anything at all to each other anyway. He's probably already forgotten about me. After all, it wouldn't be the first time he abandoned me. If he'd been at the house that day, guarding me and my sisters. Remember to save most of your hate for Cat. My mind whispers, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that if sin, or crown, or beast, or even this asshole who's kissing me right now, were told to be at the house, they would have been there. It was Kat who called them off, who made a strategic error in this fucked up game against the mafia. Granger presses his scalding hot mouth to mine and slips his tongue between my lips, taking complete control over the moment and owning me with his fingers, the press of his hips against me, the tease of his cock against my stomach. I'm pretty fucking tall, especially with my heels on, clocking in at a healthy six feet. But Granger is even taller, and I love it. He towers over me, penning me in against the mirrors and kissing me until even I can't remember my own name. His hands wander down my curves, fingers clamping over my hips. He works my mouth with his dark magic until my nipples are pebbled to hard points and I can feel a hot wetness between my thighs that makes me want to squirm. He tastes like cigarettes and spiced rum, and when he slides his tongue along the side of my jaw and goes for my throat, I go weak at the knees. It's suddenly hard to stand up. In fact, it's suddenly hard to think about anything other than being on my back with this huge biker asshole between my thighs. As if he can sense the weakness in my knees, Granger wraps his right arm around my waist and holds me in place, using his left hand to sneak up along the fishnet tights on my thigh, teasing the strands with his finger. He snaps one against my pale flesh and chuckles. I swear that sound is of the devil himself. You want to do some more blow first? He asks, but he doesn't stop his ascent up the inside of my leg. Each movement he makes knocks me back into that velvety darkness, those shadows. My eyes flutter closed and my head buzzes with drugs. I feel good right now, so damn good, like I could take on the world. The club sergeant at arms teases the tip of one finger along the length of my silken panties, stroking wetness into the fabric until my clit is as hard and pebbled as my nipples. I'm wanting so bad in that moment. And I like it because it's a greedy, wild need that I'm feeling. Lust that obliterates my worries, my pain, my thoughts, shatters them to jagged pieces. When he slips a finger beneath the fabric and teases my opening, it's slick, hot heat that greets him. What a treat. He snaps, sliding into me and sending bursts of white-hot flame to burn behind my eyelids. It feels good this foreign feeling of entry, this newness that makes my whole body tingle. It's the first time anyone's ever touched me like that. I've had boyfriends before, but they never got this far. I never wanted them to. Compared to the weak flickers of flame they tease me with, Granger is like the sun, almost too hot to touch. 
He penetrates me with that first finger, and even though it's slightly uncomfortable for a moment, the pleasure soon takes over. My fingers curl together behind Granger's neck, tugging him close to me. He's kissing and sucking on my neck, encouraging my hips to work against his hand. When he presents that second finger, stroking my clit with his thumb, I gasp, and the darkness inside of me lights up with stars. At first, I struggle against the brightness of that light, but then it gets so hot, so white, so fucking intense that it blinds me to the world. Granger lets out this breath that tells me everything I need to know. It's thick with male triumph and barely suppressed need. Apparently, I'm going to have my first time in a dirty bathroom at the clubhouse. Seems fitting, considering my lineage. My eyes open and I focus on the sun and moon tat by Grange's right ear, feeling this inexplicable warmth swirl up from my spine and into my limbs, turning my fingers and toes numb. Don't stop, I whisper, and he smirks at me. I have no intention of stopping. Granger growls, pushing deeper, curling his fingers in just such a way that I lose all control over my own body. I'm a slave to that pleasure, and I'm happy to acquiesce to it. My memories are obliterated, my melancholy starved. I'm escaping into pleasurable oblivion, enjoying every second of that fucking ride. And then, strangely, unexpectedly, that feel-good emotion takes over me and I explode, showering Granger's hand with heat that confuses us both for a moment. My head feels disturbingly clear, even as aftershocks of ardent agony ripple through me. My red-brown gaze meets his, darkened with lust. Did you just come? He asks me, sounding both bemused and triumphant at the same time. Granger's eyes bore into me, sharp as tacks. That's when I see both his brows go up. Wait, what the hell? He starts, just before we both hear the sharp rap of knuckles on the door. It opens up before either of us get a chance to answer, and I find myself staring at Sin with Granger's hand up my skirt. He steps back for me, but he doesn't do a damn thing to hide the shiny wetness on his fingers. It's awful. One of the most awkward moments of my life. What the fuck? Sin snarls, gritting his teeth and running his palm over his shaved head. His muscles are tense with violence. It's in the air. I can taste it. And the strangest thing is, it tastes just like Granger's mouth. Kate, you piece of shit. The hell do you want? Granger asks, looking at the other man like he's a kid brother he's just barely putting up with. They're six years apart. Granger and I are 15 years apart. Have fun with that math. Cat's here, Sin says, his voice hard as iron. He glances over at me, and there's a narrowing of his eyes that almost looks like a challenge. Part of me wonders if he might fight Granger over me. The idea is thrilling. I wet my lips, and Sin looks away sharply. You think he might freak out if he caught you giving his daughter blow in the clubhouse bathroom? His. That's all Cade manages to say before it dawns on him and he whips around to face me, brown eyes widening, fingers raking through the silky rust-red strands of his hair. He looks at me like I'm the monster. Your gidge? It comes out like an insult. Gidget, I correct, making sure to enunciate the T. I'm shaky and weak all over and I can still see starbursts in my vision. Did I just have an orgasm? Seriously? I have no idea, but it felt really, really fucking good. Granger just stares at me like I'm the goddamn Antichrist while I turn and snort up a second white line. The two men watch me as I back up, wiping my arm under my nose and trying to resist the siren song I've just discovered, beckoning me toward a cliff of very sharp, very deadly rocks. The club, these men, the sex, the booze, the drugs. I move past them both and out into the hall, only to run right into Cat. He, too, looks at me like he's never seen me before. What the fuck are you doing here? He snaps at me, but there's literally nothing in this world he can take from me that matters, so I'm not scared. Fear implies that there's something to be lost, 
something that can't be gotten back. That's what fear really is, the gut-wrenching reality of discovering that not all wrongs can be righted, not all broken things can be fixed. So I'm not afraid, because I just don't care to be. I'm here to party, I tell him, and the way he looks at me then, there's a disconnect. He doesn't look at me like I'm his daughter anymore, but like I'm just another member of his stupid club. Suit yourself, he growls, pushing past me and heading down the hall. Crown follows along behind him, but stops when he sees me standing there, looking me over with a strange mixture of disappointment and shattered expectations, like this is the last place he ever wanted to see me. I remember all those nights of sin saving us from this mess, whisking us away to join the real world, helping with homework and making dinner, and... I throw a quick glance over my shoulder and see the youngest member of the club standing there with his hands curled into fists, his eyes focused on a torn, faded poster that's practically plastered to the wall. This is not where Sin wanted me to end up. Glancing back at Crown, I can see from his expression that it's not where he wanted me to end up either. Too bad. I didn't want my sisters to end up sleeping cold and buried six feet under, but that's what happened. Life sucks. Don't I have a right to seek my own oblivion? After all, these men are here for a reason. And let's be frank, it's not to make an honest living. They're as twisted, as broken, as I am. Gidget? Crown starts, and I can already hear the beginning of a lecture lingering on his lips. His moss-green eyes bore holes into me, but I don't flinch. I'm not afraid of the death-by-daybreak VP. Lesser men have crumbled under that gaze. But me? I'm young, dumb, and broken. I don't care enough to be scared. Why don't you have Sin take you home? I don't want to go home, I tell him, and I've never been more serious about anything in my life. Our eyes meet and there's a challenge in his that comes crashing right up against the challenge in mine. I'm not going anywhere. As the vice president, Crown starts, and I feel my hackles go up. I can decide who's allowed on club property and who isn't. I'm kicking you out. Granger appears in the hallway behind me as I curl my hands into tight fists, mimicking Sin's tense posture. Crown lifts his head to look at the two of them, and the way his full mouth curves into a frown is almost scary. What the hell are you two doing letting her run around here like this? Letting me run around? I echo. Because I'm starting to get furious, like a caged animal. I just want out. Out, out, out. And my claws are unsheathed and my body is quivering and I'm just righteously pissed off. You don't let me do anything. I make my own choices. I move to shove past him and he grabs me. Crown. It's my dad's voice, footsteps booming as he storms back down the hallway. I don't look back to see his expression, but I can hear the dramatic sigh. Don't even bother with her. We've got better things to do. If the little twit wants to be a whore when she grows up, let her. Sir. Crown begins, and it's the closest to defiance I've ever heard from him. My mouth pops up and my heart pounds. Not sure why. Maybe it's because I can still feel Granger and Sin behind me, their anger a palpable cloud in the smoky air. Or maybe it's Crown's long, warm fingers wrapped around my arm, making my flesh pebble with goosebumps. Crown, you stupid or something? I said leave the girl alone. Crown releases me like he's been burned, his nostrils flaring, full mouth flattening into a thin line. Now he's pissed at me, too. Well, good for him. He can deal. I rub my palm over the spot where he grabbed me, glaring daggers in his direction. Besides, the mafia's in town again. Wouldn't want her getting raped and killed like her sisters. My eyes widen, and bile rises in my throat. I spin to face Cat, but he's already walking away. I can hear Crown move up behind me. Gidget. He warns, but I'm already moving, rage pumping hot in my veins. How dare he? How dare he talk about my sisters like that? If I can reach Cat, I'll kill him. But Granger and Sin get in my way each taking hold of my arms as I let out a scream that's swallowed up by the metal music blaring from the speakers. Fuck you! I screech. But Cat is already turning the corner, ignoring me like he usually does. 
Crown moves up beside me as I tear my arms from Granger's and Sin's grips, unshed tears blurring my vision, my teeth gritted so hard my jaw hurts. Your president's a fucking monster, I snarl at the three of them, using my shoulder to shove past Crown and head back into the throng that's gathered near the bar. I've downed an entire beer before I realize that Sin is standing next to me again. Oh right, he's supposed to be my bodyguard. I guess you won't let me too far out of his sight tonight, huh? Curling my fingers around the neck of my bottle, I take a deep breath and hazard looking over at him. He's still pissed. I've blown my chance at fucking him, haven't I? Why don't you tell me how stupid I am for letting Granger get to me? I whisper, the colors and sounds of the room blurring into background noise. The coke has seriously set me on edge. I feel like fighting somebody. Mostly, I feel like murdering Cat. Mine's a blow, Gidget. Seriously? Sin scoffs, like he's disgusted with me, reaching up to run his fingers through his nearly non-existent hair. There's just a purple fuzz that's left. Seems to bother him, so he drops his hand by his side and shakes his head. Were you guys fucking in there? The question holds such a punch that I pause and look over at him. Sin's eyes are ringed in liner, the silver color that much brighter because of the dark, lurid shadows all around us. We were getting there, I admit, and he makes this frustrated sound that I can't quite place. You're 16. And just barely that. Sin snaps, as if that makes any difference. My mother is 15 years younger than my father. The rotten apple doesn't fall from the tree, right? This is my destiny. This hellhole of drugs, alcohol, sex, and crime. This is my future now. He's old enough to be your fucking dad. Really? I ask snidely, sneering. I don't mean to. But Kat's comment and Crown's overprotectiveness have really pissed me off, and I need someone to take it out on. And you would care? Why? What's it to you? Sin opens his mouth to reply and then snaps it shut at the last moment. He purses his lips and looks away from me, refusing to take the bait. I know that somewhere in his past, there's a tragedy lurking, digging its ugly claws into the edges of his mind. He lost a little sister. He used to see me as a little sister. But what does he see me as now? Pushing away from the counter, I weave my way into the crowd and try to lose myself to the loud music and the churning bodies, the stink of sweat and beer and weed. Several of the men find their way to me, admiring the new girl in the short skirt. None of them recognize me either, but at least none of the old-timers try to dance with me. Anyone over 35 that tries to touch me is getting a boot in the balls. Sin stays at the edge of the room, arms crossed over his firm chest, scowling so violently that none of the club whores try to flirt with him. In fact, he's putting off such ragey vibes that a small space clears around him, but I can feel his gray eyes watching me, taking in my undulating body with unwilling appreciation. He wants to hate me, to be mad at me, but he can't do it. Interesting. Every other song, I chug a new beer looking for an even greater high. But with the blow in my veins, I can't seem to get drunk. Or maybe I am and I just can't feel it. Sweat pours down my spine, pooling on my lower back and sticking the hem of my skirt to my skin. With all the dancing, my breasts seem half ready to pop out of my top. Good. Let them. I don't give a fuck. I feel light, weightless, like I've crossed the veil into another world. Everything in this shitty clubhouse is shiny, sparkling. Laughter bubbles up and out of my throat as the song ends and the crowd seems to draw away from the dance floor like a flock of birds. I shove sweat-drenched hair from my face and watch them go, curious to see what they're all looking at. Sin's eyes follow me as I push through the crowd, bottlenecking the narrow hall that leads to the front of the clubhouse. I walk right past him, flipping my hair as I go. It hits him in the face, but all he does is scowl and then start to follow along behind me, the dutiful little bodyguard. When I break through to the front of the cheering, screaming group, I find Beast, shirtless and flecked with blood and sweat. There's a circle in the center of the room, cleared of furniture and people, filled with Beast's big body and the body of his very muscular opponent, a man I recognize from around the club's compound. 
Pretty sure his name is Dozer, or something as equally stupid as that. Beast cracks his knuckles, rolling his head on his neck, his blue eyes an infuriating sort of calm. This isn't a random bar brawl right here. No, it's a match. I can tell from the money exchanging hands, the jeers of the crowd, and the look on the enforcer's face. If he were truly angry, we'd all know it. There's a reason his nickname is Beast. Those cool blue eyes focus on me, and I see one sandy brow rise up. It's the most emotion I've ever seen from the man. Don't you have a curfew or something? Granger asks, and I flick my gaze his direction. There's a reason I've always hated him. We've hung out several times in the past few months, had a few beers together at the house when he was on guard duty, and yet he didn't even remember my fucking face. Maybe. Do you have a short-term memory problem? He's staring at me with his mouth in a flat line, nostrils flared. I can see a muscle in his jaw ticking with anger. Scratch that. Do you have a short and a long-term memory issue? How could you not recognize me? You look different. He snaps, as if the whole situation in the bathroom was my fault. Something about your face. I lift both brows in surprise. There's nothing much different about me. I've been wearing leather and miniskirts and makeup for six months or more. But then I realize that's not what he means. My face. It's the anger he can sense. That violent churning that's taken the place of my melancholy. Or fuck. Maybe Granger isn't that deep at all? And he's just talking about my lipstick? Is that what made you stick your fingers inside of me? I ask. And he cringes, gritting his teeth hard and looking around like he expects Cat to pop out and confront him at any moment. Ignoring the idiot's frustratingly handsome face, I turn back to the makeshift ring and watch Beast face off against Dozer, his knuckles wrapped with red, his face a serene mask. Even though I'm not afraid of Beast, I wouldn't want to meet him in a back alley either. He's the type you don't see coming until it's too late, like a tiger on padded paws. Crossing my arms over my chest, I let a cocky, sweet smile fall over my lips, noticing that his eyes flicker over to me. That's the first time I truly realize both the power and the folly of my femininity, like a sweet honey that can bring both pollen and stings. Beast notices me, reaching up to scrub his hand over the golden stubble on his jaw. He doesn't smile back, but there's a shift in his energy that I like. He's noticed me, that's for sure. I put my fingers in you because I thought you were an of-age available groupie, Granger says, finally, satisfied that Cat is nowhere near us, that the rumble of the crowd is loud enough to drown out his words. My lips purse and I flick my attention back his way. Jesus, are you stupid? Do you know how much trouble you could have gotten me in? Are you fucking serious? I snap back, cheeks heating. After the intimate moment we just shared, shouldn't Cade be, like, nicer to me or something? He doesn't seem to give a crap that he just took a little bit of my innocence into his inked hands. It's not my responsibility to announce my age or apologize if you find me attractive. You could really use a woman's studies class or something. Pig. Tossing my hair, I move away from Cade and head around the inner part of the ring for a better view, finding one on the edge of a bar stool just as the next round begins. Dozer, the big guy with the salt and pepper beard, charges Beast as soon as the ref calls the match, throwing up a pretty impressive high kick that makes the muscles in his thighs look like rocks. My mouth pops open and I lean forward on my seat, but the kick doesn't even come close to hitting its target. Beast bounces back on his feet, making him seem a lot lighter than he looks. He ducks below the kick and then moves in with a swing. His opponent drops down and then throws his massive weight in Beast's direction, hitting him in the midsection and knocking him back a few steps. Looking at Beast's face, you'd think he was baking fucking cupcakes or something. There's absolutely no strain or worry in his face as he grapples the other man, pushing him back a good foot and then coming in, swinging. His first punch hits Dozer in the side of his head, buckling his knees. Dozer tries to recover, but Beast knocks him to the ground and takes several more calculated swings. Less than 30 seconds in, and the fight's over. The crowd cheers. Well, the part of the crowd who bet on Beast anyway. And money changes hands again. Anybody else? 
one of the old timers asks, looking around at the crowd. Really, no takers? You bunch of pussies. You fight them then, Ronald. Someone shouts, and laughter erupts around the ring as several women in short skirts and shorts approach Beast with towels and bottles of water. He accepts the proffered items, tossing back an entire bottle while they rub all over him, touching his abs, his sweaty chest, pressing sweet-scented kisses to the sides of his throat. I'm going outside for a smoke, Sin says, snapping me out of my trance. I open my mouth to ask him why the hell he's even bothering. The entire room is full of people smoking, but he's already pushing through the crowd, toward the front door, and I end up following after, emerging into the cool darkness of an Oregon night, stars spread out above me like twinkle lights. Beast is really good, isn't he? I ask. But Sin just grunts and lights up, leaning his elbows on the railing and looking out toward the woods. There are couples out here, some of them with pants pushed down or skirts up. My eyes wander to a tattooed hand cupping a bare breast, a woman's parted red lips around the base of a thick cock. Doesn't bother me. I've been seeing shit like this my whole life. Instead, I turn around and position myself on the railing next to Sin. He was a UFC champ, so yeah, he is. Why would someone with so much talent join this dump? I ask, and then pause as I realize that Sin stiffened up beside me. Not only is he the youngest current member of the club, but he's also the youngest to have ever prospected in. I think I just implied that his life's ambition is shit. Oops. I mean... I know exactly what you mean, Gidge. He snaps at me, the irritation in his voice reminding me of Granger. I could ask you the same question, you know. Sin stares into the shadows as I open my mouth and then close it again. I was about to say something stupid, blame my tragedy and my circumstance. But then, that's probably why Sin's here too, huh? His sister is dead too, and I have no idea what sort of life he lived before he became a daybreaker. Shit. Maybe this really is a step up from where he comes from. You're right, I say with a sigh, leaning my shoulder into him in search of camaraderie. I'm in no place to judge anyone. Standing out here in the quiet and the cool and the shadows, I can think a bit more clearly, past the blow and the booze. It was kind of fucked of me to hit on Granger after I, you know, kissed you. You don't owe me shit. We aren't going steady. This isn't fucking high school, Gidge. Sin smokes his cigarette, still not looking at me. When I reach over and run my nails down his bare arm, though, he shivers and flicks that silver gaze in my direction. There's a flare of heat there that he tries to hide, but I catch it and hold on to it, leaning close and putting my lips near the corner of his mouth. I want oblivion tonight, and I caught a glimpse of it in the bathroom with Granger. I need more. Nobody said anything about going steady, I whisper, trailing my lips down the line of his jaw and then working my way back toward his ear. I just want to fuck. My teeth nibble his earlobe as my right hand drops down and slides over the bulge of his jeans. Oh yes, he is hard for me. But he's been hard for me all night. Granger's inside. Sin says, his voice husky and dark with lust. He reaches down and captures my wrist, pushing my hand away. I'm sure he'd be more than happy to help. Seriously? I choke thinking about that hot and wild moment against the tree. He damn near fucked me then, but I'm no good now. My lips purse into a tight frown and I reach out, popping Sin's button open before he has a chance to stop me. He turns to look at me, raising his brows, the lines of silver hoops he wears along the edge of his right ear catching the moonlight. Don't tell me you're not interested. Isn't that what I just implied? He growls out reaching down to capture my wrist. Screw off, Gidge. You're just being salty, I snap, refusing to budge from my position. If I told you I'd drop to my knees right now and suck your dick, you'd say yes, please. Sin's brows go up, and a smirk crawls across his face. Really? He asks, his voice darkening. Sin steps toward me, putting the toes of his boots right up against mine. Because I'm calling your bluff. 
His mouth curves to the side in challenge, gray eyes sparkling. You want to fuck me, Gitch? Then get on your knees and suck me off right here. Pretty sure Sin doesn't actually think I'll do it. Asshole. I don't back down from a challenge, especially not one that I started. Slowly, I begin to kneel down, but I keep my eyes locked on his, watching the silver moonlight play across his short, dark hair. When my fingers reach for his fly, he doesn't stop me. Sin stares at me as I free his cock from his jeans, taking him into my hands like I actually know what I'm doing. I don't, but it can't be that hard, right? Posey always used to say that men were the easiest puzzles in the world to solve. They only have one piece, and that's their dick. My fingers curl around the base of his shaft while my two red lips smear color across the head, teasing him with the barest flick of my tongue in his slit. His breath rushes out and he mumbles a string of curses that even I have to admit are creative. I continue my slow, languorous kissing and licking down his length, using my left hand to tease his balls. There's a salty taste on the tip of my tongue when I put my mouth around the tip and suck, keeping my gaze locked on his. Sin watches me with heavy-lidded eyes, his breathing speeding up as I take as much of him as I can into my mouth, surrounded by other daybreakers and their, for lack of a better word, dates. And by dates, what I really mean is groupies, club whores, and old ladies. The club isn't exactly the best place for a young feminist to find her footing. Only, I don't care about that anymore. I don't care about anything except running from the sadness and obliterating the anger. Everyone keeps saying that I need to deal with my feelings, that things will get easier, but they don't. They fucking don't, no matter how much I try, no matter how long I lie in bed wishing for a life worth living. My sister's absence in my life isn't getting filled. Instead, it's gaping, the sides caving in, until there's nothing but a wide-mouthed hole to hell in the middle of my heart. Closing my eyes, I take Sin all the way in, until he bumps the back of my throat. The sounds he makes are criminal, delicious, as rich and thick as molasses. His fingers curl in my hair, not rough, but needy. There's a different sort of pleasure in working him, one that distracts me from my dark thoughts, but not enough. Not quite enough. So I drop my hand between my thighs, reaching up beneath my skirt, and finding the molten heat that Granger left me with. Using my own excitement as lube, I tease and play with my clit until it's swollen and hard, an aching nub beneath the rough whorls of my fingertips. Moans escape my throat and get lost around the length of sin shaft, and I end up working him as hard and fast as I'm working myself. I get so lost in the pleasure that I almost miss that critical moment when his hand tightens on my head, his hips bucking, his hot seed spilling across my tongue. As soon as Sin comes, he pulls back, almost like he's in shock. He looks down at me like he's never seen me before, watching as I lick the last of his taste from my lips, shaking with need and still desperate for more. 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 I don't care what it is. Drugs. Alcohol. Cigarettes. Sex. I'm not done for the night. Sin fixes his pants as I rise to my feet but neither of us gets a chance to speak because suddenly Crown is just there, and I'm praying to whatever dark and decrepit gods will listen that he didn't see anything. Based on his expression, I don't think so. He'd be a lot more pissed off if he had. We've got orders from Cat, he says, looking from me to Sin. Full escort for Gidget back to the house. Too little, too late, I murmur feeling my heart crash to my stomach like a block of ice, frigid splinters cutting me to pieces. The last thing I want to do is leave the wild energy of the clubhouse and all its vices so I can head home to the place my sisters took their last breaths. Who else? Sin asks, but he doesn't have to wait for an answer because I see Granger and Beast making their way toward us. The full cavalry. All of my father's officers. If he's sending me home with four bodyguards, there must be trouble brewing around town.
I almost hope it kills me this time. Chapter 12, That Same Night My head is swimming, and it takes every bit of focus I have to keep my arms around Sin's waist on the ride home. A princess, surrounded by her honor guard, I think, as the bikes keep a tight formation down the length of our suburban street. The thought makes me chuckle, and Sin stiffens up a bit. Maybe he's remembering what an amazing fucking BJ I just gave him. Or maybe he's remembering that he promised to fuck me if I did it. Though, how we're going to get a moment alone with Beast, Crown, and Granger here is beyond me. I groan as we pull into the driveway, and I see Nellie's new Cadillac Escalade sitting there. Damn it. I hadn't seen her at the clubhouse party, but I was hoping she'd be there so I could avoid her unnerving stares, uncomfortable touches, and tangible desperation. Maybe you should have been a better mom when all your kids were alive, huh? It's too little, too late with Nellie. And really, it's just wrong. Selling her two-seater convertible and getting an SUV like she still has three daughters to drive around instead of just one? Hey. Sin says, after we come to a stop, pulling his helmet off and turning to look at me over his shoulder. We should keep what happened at the clubhouse between us. My brows go up. Really? You don't want me telling my mom and dad that I sucked your dick tonight? Shocking. With a dramatic eye roll, I climb off and toss in my helmet, heading for the front door with Crown on my heels. Beast, check the property. Granger, secure the doors and windows. Crown is barking orders, nothing unusual about that. I found the front door unlocked and roll my eyes. Nellie is such an idiot. The mafia that killed her daughters is in town, and the bitch couldn't bother to lock the damn door. Not that it matters. My sisters and I had all the doors and windows locked, the security system on, a whole host of guns at our fingertips. Didn't matter. Queenie still bled out on that floor. Posey still died from three gunshots to the chest and abdomen. Sin, take Gidget to her room. I turn around and walk backwards toward the kitchen, giving Sin a look that he returns with a glare. He's not enjoying himself, and it's pissing me off. A frown creases my mouth as I spin and head for the fridge, pulling out a six-pack of beer before making for the stairs. Yes, sir, Sin says, and I swear there's a bit of sarcasm in that. Crown chooses not to acknowledge it, waiting for the two of us to ascend the steps. Sin closes and locks the door behind us, putting his back to the wood and closing his eyes as he exhales sharply. When he opens those beautiful gray eyes of his, I offer up a beer. There's a slight hesitation on his part before he takes it. What are you doing, Gidget? Taking the party home with me, I tell him, turning Eminem's Kamikaze album on full blast. It's just angry enough to soothe the writhing demons in my soul. That edginess, that... Itch I felt earlier is still there with melancholy crouching on the balcony, waiting to strike at the first sign of weakness. No, I want to stay angry. There's no way in hell I'm dropping into the dark hole of pain again. Besides, you owe me. Owe oh, you? Sin asks, scoffing as he sips some of his beer. He's always so angry with me, but not like Granger. It's a deeper, more personal anger with Sin. Why? What the fuck did I ever do? I don't owe you shit, Gidge. You said if I sucked you off, then you'd fuck me. I tell him, popping the top on my own beer and leveling a dark look on Sin. He returns it like he thinks he's so much more badass than me. Lesson learned. He tells me without flinching. When a guy tells you he'll do something for you if you suck him off, don't believe him. 100% of the time, it's bullshit. My nostrils flare and I feel a hot, white rage come over me. Sin just glances away and mumbles something rude under his breath. You think you've got me cornered? I ask, slamming my beer down on the side table next to my bed. The sound draws Sin's eyes over to me. How about I call Daddy and tell him what happened tonight? Do you think he'd like that? To hear that you lie to get me to suck your dick? You'd bring his wrath down on you too, Sin says, narrowing his eyes at me. You wouldn't dare. Wouldn't I? 
He told me tonight I may as well be a whore in training if that's what I want. But do you really think he'll forgive you so easily for giving in? Because I don't. Sitting down on the edge of the bed, I kick off my boots. Somewhere inside of me, there's a teenage girl with tears on her lashes, wondering why I'm doing this, blackmailing some guy who doesn't even want me into taking my virginity. It's not fair. It's not right. And yet, I'm going to do it anyway. I lift my eyes up to sin. You will fuck me, I say, thinking that at 16 years old, I've got this 20-something a-hole wrapped around my little finger. Sin smirks at me, like he feels sorry for me. That anger inside of me amps up to unbearable levels, burning my insides and turning what little there is that's left of Gidget Kesselring into ash and embers. How about I don't, and we both see what happens when you tell Cat? Sin asks, pushing off of the wall and unlocking my door. He pauses as he runs into Granger, stepping aside to let the king of assholes into my room. I'm fuming, my eyes on the floor, my fingers curled into fists on my bedspread. Pretty sure my cheeks are bright as fuck red. Granger closes the door and locks it after Sin leaves. Standard procedure. I ignore him as he checks the windows, leaving the one behind my bed for last. When he puts his knee on the mattress, I'm thrown off balance and end up tumbling into him. I heard what you said, he tells me, and my heart freezes in my chest, eyes flicking up to his brown ones in a panic. Sin was right to call my bluff. I'm too wary of Kat's wrath to tell him anything about what happened between me and Sin. What are you doing? Are you stupid? What does me trying to get laid have anything to do with my intelligence? I fire back, as Granger grunts in satisfaction that the window's locked and stands back up. All the places I touched him when I rolled into him are burning, like my body's remembering the delicious press of his fingers into my core. If you keep trying to throw your virginity away like that, eventually someone will take you up on the offer. Granger changes his mind about the window cracks it open, and then proceeds to light up a cigarette. I used to smoke in here all the time with Posey, but after she died, Nellie started getting on my ass about it. Guess it makes her feel like a mom to bitch about shit like that. Doesn't change the fact that she's never really been a mother to me, not in the ways that count. Thanks for the advice, I schmooze, touching my chest in mocking deference. I mean, you are the consummate expert on offering sex to anyone that asks, But hey, at least I don't have to worry about you volunteering. I saw your face when you realized who I was. What was it you said to me? Do you know how much trouble you could have gotten me in? Alas, I'm still 16 years old. Granger cringes like I've struck him, scowling as if his face is permanently painted in unpleasantness. He runs his fingers through his hair. I don't know what that haircut's called. That's short on the sides, long on the top thing, but it suits him. It's handsome, but still edgy. And I hate that I'm paying so much attention to the bastard's hair. Would you stop saying that? He snaps, ashing his cigarette out the window. I popped the screen out a long time ago for that exact purpose. You might be 16, but you look 25, and you talk like a 50-year-old woman. You say that like it's a bad thing. I snort, wishing I had the guts to ask for more. More blow, more booze, more of what he gave me in the bathroom. Leaning back into my pillows, I tuck my legs underneath me, my skirt hiking up and revealing a whole hell of a lot of my torn fishnet tights. Granger's eyes catch the movement, and I see his pupils track the movement of my hemline. You ever heard the Bible quote about making man in God's image? Do I look like I've heard many Bible quotes? Granger asks, lifting his gaze from my thighs and letting it linger on the curve of my waist, the swell of my breasts, and then finally landing on my face. Is he checking me out? But nah, this is Cade Granger. He's a fucking jerk. No, no, he's the king of jerks. And yet, how could I possibly mistake the lustful glimmer in his eyes? Well, what the fuck does it say? Are you always this goddamn rude? I snap back, 
feeling heat suffuse my chest. It's a different type of heat from what sin brings, though, a burn that makes me slightly uncomfortable. I was getting to that. Exhaling sharply, I push my hair back from my face and try to imagine Reba's southern drawl in my head. Genesis 127. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, to rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock and over all the earth itself and every creature that crawls upon it. I exhale sharply, surprised that I remembered it word for word. Maybe I shouldn't be, considering how often Reba quotes it to me. She's a real character, that one, and one of only a few people who know how to sit beside me in my darkest moments and wait it out. If she knew what I were up to tonight, she would not approve. What does that have to do with you wanting to get fucked? Granger asks, and I grit my teeth. I swear I hate everything about him. The sound of his voice, the way he plays with his lip rings, the stupid shit he says. You are so frigging impatient, I grumble, as he pulls a silver bullet necklace out from under his shirt and unscrews the top. The hell is that for? Ignoring him, I continue on with my story. Let me make Gidget in my image after my likeness to rule over the depraved and the ruined, over the broken and over the darkness itself, and every asshole that crawls around in it. That's the devil's version of that quote. And by devil, I mean cat. Wow. Clever. Granger says with an eye roll. Is this what you do in your spare time? Fuck up the Bible with your sinful little tongue? You think you're poisoned because of your dad? If anything, you should feel lucky to be made in his image. The man's a legend. Granger gestures at me with a tattooed hand. Here, yeah. use those long witch nails of yours and make yourself useful. I narrow my eyes, but I have no idea what he wants, and my face must show it. He scowls and holds the open bullet necklace out to me. Use that long-ass fucking pinky nail of yours to pick up a bump and snort it. Granger spits the words at me, like I'm a moron, and mimes the motion. Oh, there's like fucking cocaine in there. Running my tongue across my lower lip, I do what he says, scooping up a bit of white powder under my shiny black pinky nail and snorting it like I do this every damn day. My brain lights up with colors, and the drug burns like fire through my sinuses. Oh my god, that feels good. My turn he says, voice low and dark. I dip my nail back into the bullet, scooping up another tiny portion. Butterflies take over my stomach when Granger grabs my wrist in a rough grip, lifting it to his face and running his tongue along the length of my finger before taking the hit. He releases me abruptly, snatching the necklace back and tucking it away again, like there's nothing brewing between us, no violent, turbulent heat simmering like virulent sin. There so fucking is. Can't too lenient with you, if you ask me. Did I? Ask, I mean? You can fuck all the way off. I lean back into the pillows and cross my hands over my belly, enjoying the fresh surge of a glorious, glorious high. I could float away right now, drift off and never come back, and I'd be happy to say goodbye to this hell on earth. What you need is a good spanking, Granger says, and I'm not entirely sure that when he says it, he intends the double meaning. It comes out anyway, and there's the sudden, tangible heat in the air. My eyes lift to his, and he glares right back at me. It's true, he growls, leaning in toward me. Somebody should throw you over their knee and give you a good smack. Are you volunteering for the job? I breathe without even meaning to. The edge of Granger's cruel mouth turns up in a smirk, and he leans even closer to me, until his lips are close enough to touch. When he talks, I can feel his words as much as I can hear them. You fucking wish. He snarls, pulling away abruptly and standing up. Why don't you start begging sin again? Maybe he'll take pity on you and offer up his dick for the sacrifice. You're a real piece of work, I snap launching myself to my feet and shoving him hard in the back. May as well have tried to push a dump truck up a hill. Granger turns slowly around to look at me, his expression edged with violence. 
Really, Gitch? He asks, when I shove at him again. He turns around in an instant, grabbing me by the wrists and yanking me close enough that I can smell that wonderful black pepper and vanilla scent of his. You like dicking around with grown men? I wouldn't know. None of you will give me the time of day, I retort, trying to pull my wrists from his grip. There's no way in hell I could get free from Cade if he wanted to hold me here. Keep pushing and somebody might just push back. He releases me, and I immediately shove at him. The reaction snaps him into action and he grabs me again, pushing me down onto the bed and climbing over me, one knee between my thighs. This isn't a game you can play and win. My face is burning with a hot flush, my heart hammering like crazy behind my ribs. But my body likes the feel of Granger above me like this. My core throbs with want, and I have to resist the urge to arch up into him. Screw you. Not very creative, but it's all I can get out. Granger's umber eyes move from my rust-red ones, dropping down to linger on my lips. My tongue slides out and runs along my lower lip all without my permission. I swear it just happens. I'm just reacting to Cade's presence without meaning to, like a girl possessed. Screw you, huh? He asks, almost contemplatively. Granger leans down and runs his own tongue across my bottom lip, making me groan. I struggle a bit, doing my best to free my arms so I can put them around his neck. He won't let me. Fat friggin' chance. He growls, biting my lower lip and making me groan. You want to test the waters, Gidge? I'll show you how deep they are. Cade captures my mouth, thrusting his tongue between my lips, taking over the moment completely. He destroys me with his kiss, crashing through walls I hadn't even known were up, and it's sublime, downright transcendent. Pisses me off at the same time that I'm letting this asshole twist me into knots like this, but I can already feel my body responding, promising me more of that hot white bliss, that decadent oblivion that I'm craving so damn badly. Granger pushes his knee forward, rubbing it against my aching heat. My body reacts against my will, back arching, cunt pushing against his leg in search of pleasure. The more I wriggle, the harder Cade kisses, like he's punishing me for my reactions. That's what I want right now, to be punished. Losing it to this prick, that seems appropriate. My life has never been a fairy tale, so why would I want a prince now? Unless that prince is dressed in leather, scented with tobacco, and packing serious heat, I'm not interested. Deep, deep down, I realize that I don't feel like I deserve someone to be nice to me. I don't deserve romance and love, gentle hands and soft mouths. Instead, I want hard and unyielding pain to crash up against my own, like waves against a rocky shore. Nothing but storm and salt and sea, unending and violent. Heat blooms between us, but like a rose with thorns, it's both soft and hard at the same time, silken petals limbed in blood. Granger uses his right hand to hold my wrists above my head, leaving his left free to roam over the curve of my waist and hip. His fingers are rough when they grip my pelvis, pushing his knee into my core hard enough that I gasp. I want more, and I want it quick, but Granger seems determined to teach me a lesson. His mouth moves along my jaw, tracing a hot line of fire to my ear. When he bites down on my earlobe, I just about lose my shit. Stop teasing, I snap. But he just laughs at me, and there's nothing at all nice about that sound. Spoiled little brat. Shut your mouth. Who begged who for this, huh? You're at my goddamn mercy. I hate you. The words are true, and they hang in the air like smoke, bringing a hazy, almost dreamlike atmosphere to the moment. Granger takes that in and grunts, putting his mouth against my ear as he grinds his knee into my throbbing heat. I've always hated you, Gidge. Cat has a soft spot for you that's gonna get the whole club in trouble one day. He needs to pack your ass up and send you to boarding school. Granger's left hand slides up and under my shirt, finding the lacy bra underneath, his fingers kneading the soft flesh of my breast through the fabric. 
I almost lost my shit when I realized it was you rubbing that sweet, wet pussy of yours all over my hand. Having you around the clubhouse would drive me nuts. I, I start. But Granger quickly covers my mouth with his right hand, freeing my wrists. I put my arms around his neck and he pinches my nipple hard enough to make me bite back a scream. Did I not tell you to shut up? He growls adjusting himself so that his pelvis is cradled between my thighs. I can feel the hard, thick length of him through his denim. When he moves his hips against me, I feel another wave of heat crash into my soul, sweat dripping down the sides of my face. I've never wanted a hit on such a dangerous drug, wanted it with every beat of my heart. When I see you, I feel sick to my stomach. Granger punctuates his words by licking his way down to my throat, his tongue as sharp as a blade. He kisses the pulse in my neck, and that's when it really hits me how dangerous he is, how reckless the whole moment is. Only makes me want it more. How sad is that? Every time I see you, I hope it's the last. His words piss me off, and I like it. I want more. I want to hear him tell me how much he hates me. Later, much, much, much later, I'll realize that Granger was saying something so much more than I hate you. He was telling me a secret he hadn't dared to voice to a single other soul, not even his brothers in the club. The sergeant at arms of the Death by Daybreak Motorcycle Club was trying to tell me how fine the line that separates passion and violence is, pleasure and pain, hate and love. Ditto. I murmur, but that's the last coherent sound that escapes my lips for quite some time. Instead, I get lost in Granger's kisses, the malicious darkness with which his mouth closes over mine. He doesn't let me talk, dominating the silence with his body, with hard, undulating motions of his hips. I'm aching on the inside, breaking into pieces, burning up and cracking with lines of molten heat. This is going to be quick, hot, and dirty, I think, as Granger pulls back and reaches beneath my skirt, tearing my fishnets and then pushing my panties aside. Shit, shit, shit. This is my last chance to pull away before he ruins me. And yet, I want nothing more than to be ruined. You're still soaking wet, he tells me, almost scoldingly, fingers sliding along my inner thighs. My breath rushes out in a gasp as Granger slides his thumb up my slick folds and over my clit, rubbing the hard nub in a slow, languorous circle. I imagine it's the only slow, languorous thing he'll be doing with me. You think you can take me? He asks, his mouth a wicked line of arrogant male surety. He undoes his jeans, letting his shaft spring free, the tip glistening with Priya Jack. Gripping the base of his dick, he smirks at me and waits for me to examine him. I hate to admit it, but he has a beautiful cock. It's thick and long and definitely puts the one dildo I have to shame. What kind of a stupid question is that? I snort as he slides a condom from his pocket and slips it over his cock, stroking the pre-lubed latex with a tight grip. You're a virgin, aren't you? Granger asks, raising one eyebrow. There's a mocking glimmer in his eyes, like this is all a fucking game to him. Good. That's what I want. Something shallow, something that burns hot and fizzles out quick. Romance isn't in the cards for me right now. Maybe not ever. Why the hell would you think that? I snap as he crawls onto the bed, putting his huge muscular form between my legs. Granger ignores me pinning my wrists above my head again before positioning himself at my opening. He looks me dead in the eyes for a long moment, torturing me with the feel of him so close and yet so unattainable. And then he thrusts in hard and deep, filling me up and driving the last scrap of innocence I had from me. It's like a cleansing, an exorcism of sorts. Pleasure courses through me in waves, and I can feel my body clamping down around Granger with a grip that's a hundred times harder than his hand. He makes the sound that can't be faked, 
this wild ecstasy that precedes his next thrust, sliding almost entirely out of me before ramming his hips forward again. There are no words left in me, no quips, no witty repartee. I'm full, completely and entirely filled with Granger and his heat, his cock, his hatred. And that last part, that's the most exciting bit of all. My lips quiver, but I can't get the words out. More, harder, faster. He seems lost, too, in total oblivion as he grinds into me like he's got a vendetta. There's a slight bit of pain edging the pleasure, but not much. I might be a virgin, but I know how to masturbate, and I've done plenty of it. Still, there's something so different about sharing your body with another person, this intimate edge that I resist at the same time I embrace it. The bed creaks beneath us as Granger moves inside of me with long, deep strokes, pulling all the way out before he moves back in again. I feel like a bowstring, pulled taut, ready to snap. And then, the door opens, and there's Sin, standing there with his mouth hanging open. Crap. Right before I pushed Granger, he'd unlocked the door. We never locked it again. What the fuck? Sin snarls, just as the storm picks up and the power abruptly goes out. Sin moves into the room, reaching for Granger like he plans on picking a fight. Granger slaps his hand away and gives him a look that I can just barely see, limbed in the glow from the solar-powered porch light. If you touch me, I will break your face. Cade snaps, his voice on edge. You don't interrupt a man while he's fucking. My face is on fire, but I'm turned on by his words anyway. I shouldn't be, maybe, but I really am. I must be a masochist and sadist, all wrapped up in one messed up package. Gidget isn't some club whore, Granger. This is Cat's daughter. Sin's voice drops to this low, dangerous point, turning the darkness into a shadowy pit of violence and need. There's some of that in his voice, too. Regret and want. I want oblivion, I whisper, my voice cracking as I strain against Granger's grip and find that he really means business. I'm not getting out of this unless I specifically ask him to stop for good. Even then, Kate is giving it to me. Leave us alone. My face flames as Sin gapes at the pair of us, looking like he both wants to kill Granger and fuck me. Lifting his beer to his lips, Sin downs it in one go, and I realize that the slight quaver in his voice is a sign that he's drunk off his ass. Granger turns back to me, looking down at me through the darkness, and then he begins to move again, mercilessly, hard and fast and hateful. He fucks me until his muscles tense with the effort of holding back. Sin watches the whole thing, eyes on me, as Granger comes with a low, violent groan, pumping into me a few last times before rolling off with a curse. Meanwhile, he leaves me rife with heat and want, desperate for another orgasm, like the one I had in the bathroom. Jesus, are you still here? Granger snaps, giving Sin a dark look that I can't quite read in the shadows. Thinking of taking a turn? He smirks snapping off the condom and chucking it into the wastebasket at the end of my bed. You deranged psycho. Sin snaps. But when I sit up, our eyes meet, and I realize with a thundering heart that I'd do it, that I'd fuck him too. He grabs my half-empty beer from the side table and throws that back too. His eyes, though, they never leave my face. Closing my legs, I rub my thighs together, feeling my own wetness slick and hot on my skin. You promised me, I whisper, voice broken with lust. Don't be a total dick about it. Sin stares me down and then curses under his breath, sharp, hot sounds that I can barely hear. But when he turns back to me, I can see it in his eyes. He wants to do this. He knows he shouldn't but he can't stop himself. If you touch her, Granger says, his voice tinged with malignant intent. I will end you. My blood goes cold with the sound of violence in his voice, and then white, 
hot with a bizarre mixture of rage and lust. That was hot, what he just said. I think, exhaling sharply, but at the same time, he doesn't own me, and he doesn't want me either. That much is clear. Granger, I start, but he's already standing up and tucking his junk away, like he's getting ready for a fight. Sin, the much younger and more inexperienced of the two, watches him warily. Like he'll fight if he has to, but doesn't think he can win. You said it yourself. You hate me. What do you care what happens between Sin and me? Cade's eyes are raw with violence. I can see the veins in his neck pulsing with adrenaline. She has a point, Granger. What the hell do you care? It's not like we haven't shared girls before. Sin speaks slowly, but there's a thread of steel in his voice. He's challenging Granger to fight with his words. Either Cade has to explain why he cares, or he has to let it go. He stares Sin down, chocolate eyes boring into silver ones. And then he snarls and shoves the younger man out of his way. You wanted to be a whore in training, Gidge? He sneers as he yanks the door open and shoves a cigarette between his lips. You're off to a real good start. Go to hell, you, I start. But Cade's already storming off, slamming the door behind him and cracking the glass of the framed family photo beside it. It doesn't fall off the wall, though, just shatters into pieces, cutting Queenie's and Posey's smiling faces into shards. I'm fuming now, absolutely bristling, but there's a storm raging outside and the wild huntsmen of the mafia stalking around inside of it. Let Granger stalk off. If God's still listening, then maybe he'll go outside and get himself killed. I couldn't think of a greater blessing. I'm gonna go. Sin starts, but I reach out and curl my fingers around his wrist. Lightning crashes outside, so poetic in its timing. For a moment there, hot yellow light limbs Sin's handsome face, but it doesn't last, and we're both plunged back into darkness, our night vision killed. I yank him toward me, and even though he's a million times stronger than I am, he lets me pull him close, stumbling just a little from the booze. Gidge. Sin starts, his voice burning like hot coals. He reaches down and cups my face with two big hands. You're too good for Granger. So I hear, I whisper back, loving the way his thumb traces over my lower lip. Poor drunk Colton. Tattooed in Americana, from a time he'll never see, looking down at me like I confuse the hell out of him. At least he's a lot nicer when he's drunk. I hadn't even realized he was getting there, that he probably drove us home buzzed, and then went straight to Wasted after arrival. I must have been up here entertaining Granger for longer than I thought. What does that have to do with anything? We're not exactly an item. I swallow hard as sin straddles me trapping me underneath him. When he leans down to kiss me, I get butterflies. It's not at all like the way he kissed me at the funeral or in the clubhouse, but something different, something foreign. You don't mind that I'm drunk? He asks, but he tastes like whiskey, and I find myself licking my lower lip for another taste as he pulls back again. Because I get reckless when I'm drunk. And screw groupies on the hood of Gaz's ugly sports car? I insert, trying not to get jealous. Jealousy would imply that I care, and I don't. Not at all. Sin is just some guy who used to give me a ride home. There are no fucks to give in regards to this idiot. And yet, when he smirks, the motion tugs at the scar on his lip and makes him look for the briefest of seconds like he's the boy next door. I mean, we're only like eight years apart. It's not that big of a gap. Reaching my hand back, I grab the edge of the curtain and yank it closed, blocking out the porch light. Oblivion requires darkness, the complete and total absence of light. Seeing sin look like that almost reminds me that there's life outside of pain, and I don't want to remember that, because it makes it all hurt that much worse. If I go on pretending that the whole world is dark and cruel and broken, that I don't have to remember that I can't be fixed. Kiss me and make me forget, I whisper. But Sin just barely gives me a brush of lips, like he can't bear to taste whatever it is that's between us. Instead, he climbs off of me and then grabs me by my hips, flipping me over, 
His fingers curl tight against my pelvis, yanking me toward him. I'll make you forget, he says, his voice sounding surprisingly sober all of a sudden. But I'm not going to kiss you again. I close my eyes, which makes no difference because it's dark, but it helps calm my frantically racing heart. I'm never going to kiss you again, Gitch. It's too risky. Risky. My voice trails off as Sin pushes my skirt up around my hips, his hand caressing the curve of my ass with a dark reverence that I wish I could see. What must his face look like as he feels me up with those hot hands of his? When he cups me between the legs, I bite my lower lip and curl my fingers into the bedspread. One of Sin's fingers traces along the wetness of my core, slicking up to my ass and teasing that opening too. I wonder then if he might spank me the way Granger teased, Part of me thinks I might punch Sin if he does, while the rest of me thinks I'd love it. Spank me. The words come out before I even mean them to, making me wonder if I have even more fucked up psychological issues than I realized. But a small, wicked chuckle sounds from behind me just before Sin's hand slaps my ass hard enough to hurt. There's a sharp crack of flesh on flesh and the burn of a fresh sting. There's a brief moment of reprieve, and then Sin is spanking me again, even harder. He runs his palms up my sides and under my shirt, finding my breasts again and yanking down the lace of the cups until they spill free into his hands. My back is arched, my ass pressed back against the denim of his jeans. I can feel him through the fabric, straining for me, wanting. Sin uses both thumbs to rub my nipples and my back arches with pleasure, like a cat, rubbing my ass against his crotch. He palms my breasts in his rough hands, kneading them and groaning as he moves his hips against me. I could spend all night doing this, he murmurs. But then he releases me abruptly, and I can hear the sound of his zipper coming down. He could spend all night doing this, but he's not going to, because he knows that temporary is the only option for us. Cat could be here at any moment. Hell, the mafia could be here at any moment. Instead, we're just gonna fuck and forget all about it. Sin sounds almost sad when he says it, but he doesn't give me any time to respond. His cock teases my folds, sliding against me and making me groan, my nails digging into the bed. When he puts the tip to my aching core and pushes in, it's a much slower, easier motion than Granger's thrust. Sin slides in balls deep, gripping my hips for support. Sensations roll through me, delicious waves of pleasure that I can taste on the tip of my tongue. That's how good it feels, like every single sense is activated and on fire. And oh, Sin is good. I figured Granger would be better because, well, he's an experienced man whore. But both men know the strength in their bodies, the power in their cocks, and they know how to use it too. Sin moves against me, the rain outside the only sound besides the wet joining of our bodies. He rides me hard and fast and dirty, and I let myself fantasize that I'm just some nomad chick, looking for a place to stay at the clubhouse, interested in quick, raunchy flings. My fantasy extends to my feelings, pretending that I'm whole and healthy emotionally, that sex is just sex and not another drug I've decided to hit up. My body buys this bullshit, and I feel myself tighten around sin. Filthy, filthy pleasure winds through me, the wrongness that crashes up against my pain and makes me come. Yeah, more than anything, my own fucked-up feelings are what brings me to orgasm, shuddering around sin and tearing a ragged groan from his throat. I come first, but I'm so wrapped up in my own pleasure that I barely notice sin getting his until he's pulling out and collapsing beside me on his back. He's got the used condom in his hand, which is sort of gross, but I don't care. I just stare at him, my ass still in the air, while he stares at the ceiling. Shadows dance across his face as the porch light flickers and then goes out. No, no, that's not ominous at all, right? But the monsters tonight, the demons, they aren't external. They aren't these guys or the mafia or even Cat. No, they're inside of me, fighting for purchase. Tonight feels like a turning point, 
like I should hit rock bottom so I can either drown or kick off the stony surface and swim for light. Colton? I ask as I climb onto the bed. When he doesn't answer, I poke him with my foot. My body is throbbing alive with need. Fucking two men hasn't changed that. I still feel all over, tingles and prickles running across my skin like electricity. Do you miss your sister? His body goes stiff, and he sits up, chucking his condom into the same wastebasket that Granger used. I'll have to empty it before Nellie sees. The last thing in the world I'd ever want to do is have a heart-to-heart with that woman. My sister? He starts, and then he grits his teeth in anger. I don't have a sister. Not anymore, but the glare he levels on me cuts me right off. We just fucked. I don't owe you anything. He snaps, but his voice is rife with hurt. At first, I think he's going to storm out and leave, but he just fixes his pants and leans back on the bed, covering his face with his hands. When he drops them by his sides again, his face is empty. Or maybe I do. I should have been there. Cat told you not to be, I say with a shrug, feeling my own wetness on my thighs. I'll need to shower before too long. Sitting in this cocoon of darkness with sin is nice, though. Unexpected. What could you do? I... He starts, and then sighs, closing his eyes again. He didn't expressly tell us to stay away, just that we no longer had to be here. And I... Thought about stopping by that day. Why didn't you? I choke out, my voice rough. I'm trembling now, and I'm not sure I can bear to hear what he has to say. And yet, I make myself endure it anyway. It doesn't matter now. He continues, keeping his eyes closed. We can't go back in time, now can we? His breathing evens out, shallows. I lean closer and poke at his shoulder, but he doesn't move. Either he's asleep or he's pretending to be, so he doesn't have to talk to me. Whatever. He's drunk anyway, right? Pursing my lips, I fix my skirt and settle myself in the pillows, content to watch and wait for him to wake up. But after a while, I fall asleep. It's only for a minute or two, I swear. But when I open my eyes, sin is gone. I slip off the bed, stumbling a little and realizing I'm still drunk or high or whatever. Between my legs, there's a sweet soreness but I don't mind it. It's a good reminder that it all actually happened, that I managed to bag two of my father's officers in one night. The hot water of the shower helps soothe some of that ache, and when I get out, I change into a black silk nightgown that hits at mid-thigh. Beast is sitting in the living room when I finally come downstairs for some water, a solitary figure limbed in darkness. He glances over at me, and I get chills all over my body. I pause in the doorway to the kitchen, my hand on the archway. For a week after my sisters died, I didn't think I'd be able to come back to this house. Shit, I didn't think I'd be able to drive in this neighborhood again. But as my pain grew and twisted inside of me, I realized that I was desperate for any little piece of them. A glimpsed memory here or there, even a horrible one, is better than no memories at all. Where's everyone else? I ask but not because I actually care. The last two people I want to see right now are Sin and Granger, weird as that may sound. After sharing my body with them, I feel like I just need space. Taking turns canvassing the property in the neighborhood, he says, voice low and quiet. I'd be afraid of him if I had any sense in me or if I had anything worth living for. Did you need something? I shake my head, and he turns away, breaking the tension. Well, at least there's tension on my part. Maybe not so much on Beast's end. Padding across the floor in bare feet, I get a glass and fill it with ice and water from the fridge. It's sort of surprising how much sex has taken out of me. I feel exhausted, thirsty, and hungry. At the same time, I feel energized, like I could take on Cat if I had to. Any sign of trouble? I ask as I grab another beer and move back into the living room to sit opposite Beast on the couch. He turns to look at me again, one brow just slightly cocked in surprise. Sitting casually on the sofa with the club's sanctioned assassin while in my nighty is a little weird, even with my fucked up upbringing. I know that. 
Nothing yet. I nod and sip my water, watching Beast over the rim. The storm is still raging and the power's still out, but I'm not worried. With these four men in here, the mafia would need an army. And even if they bring one, at least I won't be going out a virgin. I lean back into the pillows, making the hemline of my nightgown crawl up my thighs until it's damn near indecent. Beast, surprisingly, is still watching me. I saw you fight tonight, I say, finishing my water and going for the beer next. Very impressive. He nods, acknowledging my statement without reacting to it. Damn. This man has ironclad control. When I reach up and undo the top button on my nightgown, his eyes remain stoic. Makes me wonder how far I can push him, or if it's wise to. Whatever. This reckless streak flares to life inside of me, and I lean even further back into the pillows, running my tongue across my lower lip. Beast watches every motion I make. You are hot as hell, I tell him, wondering if I sound sexy or just stupid. He doesn't even smile at that, just keeps watching me. It's infuriating, his lack of action, his silence. Biting my lower lip, I swallow back some of my beer and then set the can on the floor. With a fresh surge of alcohol in my veins, I pretend it's the booze making me crazy tonight, and then I spread my legs wide. Beast still doesn't say anything, just reaches out and puts his warm, rough palms on my knees. He closes my legs while I gape at him. Is he really telling me no? You should go back upstairs, Gidge. He tells me calmly, like I didn't just flash him. The thing is, with a little bit of light from outside, I can see a tenseness in his neck and shoulders, like maybe I really am having an effect on him. Why? What'll happen if I don't? I sound like an asshole, I know that, but tonight has been interesting. I woke up angry, and I'm still roiling with emotion. Losing my virginity didn't change that. Maybe nothing ever will. If you don't? He starts, turning toward me. Then I can't promise you you'll make it out of here unscathed. My cheeks flush and I find it suddenly hard to breathe. Are you going to ravage me? It's a cheeky thing to say, but I can't help it. I am my father's daughter after all. I'm not some blushing teen who can barely say the word cock without losing her shit. I might be a little sore between the legs, but there's a challenge to seeing if I can get Beast to lose his control that I like. Is that what you want me to do? He asks, voice still neutral, but threaded through with a hint of primal need. It's there, base and animalistic inside of him. Spreading my knees wide again, I watch as his pupils dilate. That's the only sign that he's interested. Just that one little tell. Maybe. I wait there, my muscles tight, sweat pouring down my spine. I can feel my nighty sticking to my chest, my nipples pebbling to hard points. Mm. That's the response I get from him. He pulls out his phone, checks his messages, and then slips it away again. I'm still sitting there, feeling like an idiot, the aching heat of my core right there for him to see. Instead, he focuses on the quiet darkness of the fireplace. You should go back upstairs and get some rest. Are you serious? I choke out, so shocked by his refusal that I'm shaking. At age 16, I'm sure that I know everything. He can't tell me no. Guys don't say no. Dropping my hands between my legs, I tease my clit with my fingers, using my own wetness as lubricant. It feels good. Not as good as if Beast were to touch me, but... A moan escapes my lip, but he still doesn't look at me. You're going to sit there and let me masturbate in front of you? My only job is to protect you, Shug. Shug. Like Southern for sugar. That nickname kills me. I love it. Do whatever you want to do. I want to do you. I whisper back, my voice husky and broken. There must be something to it because he finally glances back over at me my hand moving in rhythmic circles, my breathing coming in shallow pants. But if you won't touch me, I'll just do it myself and imagine it's you. I ain't easily tempted. 
but when I break, I shatter. He says this as cool as a cucumber, no emotion whatsoever. Holy hell, his words spiral through me along with the pleasure. Tempt the beast, get the claws, Gidge. I'm not afraid of you, I tell him, voice steady. I never have been. He stands up, like he's going to walk away and leave me to it. Don't leave me alone with my thoughts, I add, voice cracking. It's dark in here. The things inside my head? Darker still. I swallow and lick my lips. Please? Still, he stands there, completely and utterly unmoving. But then my fingers reach out and brush against his. Heat flares between us, and I know I'm not the only one that feels it. Our eyes lock, and even in the darkness, I can feel him staring into my soul like he's seeking permission. Finally, finally, Beast turns, climbing onto the couch on his knees and reaching out to put his palms on my legs, sliding them down the soft flesh of my inner thighs. He pushes my legs even farther apart, and I gasp, throwing my head back as he drops his own down low breathing against my tender flesh. What is it about tonight? I wonder, and I can't decide if it's the storm or the threat of the mafia or months of sadness and anger and pain all coalescing into one single evening. My breath rushes out as I throw an arm over my eyes, letting the pleasure answer whatever questions I might have about what Beast's doing. He presses his lips to the inside of my knee, making me shiver and shake all over. It's a sweet, filthy torture, what he's doing to me, kissing his way along the sensitive flesh of my inner thighs, his stubble a rough counterpoint to the heat and warmth of his lips. When he gets to the pulsing spot between my legs, I move my arm and look down at him, my eyes wide as he puts his mouth to my folds, his tongue a much harsher master than his mouth. It almost feels too good, like I'm not sure I can sit here and just take this. Fuck me, I tell him, but he says nothing, just adjusts himself on the long expanse of the sectional so that his head is between my legs and his big arms wrap around my thighs to hold me in place. His grip is rock solid. I'm not going anywhere. Beast works dark magic on me, his mouth teasing places I hadn't even realized were quite so sensitive. It's a completely different experience from Granger's hard, angry thrusts or Sin's almost melancholic fucking. That bergamot nectar and musk smell of his teases my senses as my fingers play in his sandy hair. I can hardly believe I'm touching the man, let alone that I have his face between my legs. We've barely spoken a dozen sentences to each other, and he's going down on me? He's the first one to go down on me? How did that happen? I don't question the direction of the moment. What's the point? If I'm doing this, then I'm not thinking about other things. I'm not contemplating the future and seeing how bleak and empty it looks without my sisters. Instead, I'm in the moment, and I'm not immediately suicidal. Yay, for small miracles, right? My fingers dig harder into Beast's hair, nails scraping his scalp. He doesn't seem to mind, turning my body into a sloppy mess of pleasure. I've never paid so much attention to my clit, not even when I was touching myself. Instead, it feels like Beast knows more about my body than I do, and that irritates me. I try to push him back, but he ignores me. After the third or fourth time, his head finally lifts up. Do you want me to stop? He asks, completely stoic. It's too dark to see his eyes. They're just black pits right now. No. I want you to fuck me. He grunts and then puts his face down again, making my eyes tear up with pleasure. It feels too good physically. Emotionally, it hurts too good. Beast stays right where he is, bringing me to climax with just his mouth, no fingers needed, no cock. My heart is pounding so hard and so fast that it feels like it might burst right out from behind my ribs, soak the room in blood. That'd be poetic, for me to die here too, bleeding out. Instead, Beast lifts me up into his arms, letting me hook my own around his neck, his hands gripping my ass. 
He carries me outside and sets me next to the pool in a chair before bringing me another beer. He has one too, and we end up sitting in silence and drinking, watching the endless darkness of the water. Without the lights on, it looks like it goes down forever, a depthless fathom of secrets. We finish our beers and B sits beside me, close but not close enough to touch. He does, however, reach out and put a hand on my knee. I meant it, I tell him, but he's not looking at me. Instead, he's staring at the spot where Posey died. I'll always remember that exact spot, the way her blood ran into the inset drain. A few times since that night, I've come out here and laid on my back, positioned my limbs the way hers were, just to see if I could feel what she might have felt in those last horrible moments. They raped her first, but I tried to tell myself it was over quick. It doesn't help. Meant what? Beast asks finally, several minutes later when I've almost forgotten what I was talking about myself. I turn to him and he finally looks at me. I wonder what I tasted like to him, if he liked it, why he did it at all. That I want you to fuck me. He stares at me for a long time, almost too long. I get uncomfortable and turn away. But he reaches out instead and takes my chin in his fingers, turning me back. Get naked and climb in, he says, standing up suddenly and shedding his shirt. His boots and pants follow next, and then he's leaping into the water in a soundless dive. As big as he is, he hardly makes a splash. I only hesitate for a moment before I shed my nightgown and join him using the steps to get in. The water's still warm even though the power's out and the heater's not working. The cool rain against my scalp is a nice contrast. For a while, Beast does laps and I swim around in lazy circles. I'm not sure what we're doing in here, but later, when I look back on the moment, I'll think that maybe he was burning some of that primal energy of his, making himself safe for me. When he finally swims over and pins me against the wall with his arms, I'm ready for him. My arms go around his neck, my legs around his waist, and before I can even think of condoms, he's sliding into me, and I'm turning to liquid desire in his arms. His hips move against me, sloshing the water gently around us. My ass is being scraped against the cement wall of the pool, but none of that matters. Instead, Beast lowers his forehead to mine, and we fuck, quietly but eagerly in the darkness like we've done this before, like we could do this again. This might be the greatest mistake I've made all night, I think. But it's happening. Consequences be damned. Beast feels bigger than the other two men. Either that or I'm just sore. For a virgin to go three times in one night, it's to be expected. And yet I feel like I could go forever, that I could fuck these guys until the sun comes up. Speaking of... I have no clue what time it is. For all I know, maybe the sun is about to come up. (sighs) Shit, Gitch. He whispers after a while, panting like crazy. It's the most unhinged I've ever seen him, and yet, he's really not that unhinged at all. Our eyes lock and Beast moves inside of me, watching my facial expressions, somehow knowing exactly what I need and want before even I know it. He pushes me toward a climax, lets me fall over the edge, and then holds me there for a moment before breaking away. This time, when he goes, I can see in the stiffness of his muscles that his control really is slipping. Wait! I swim after him, arms crossed over my chest, legs weak and wobbly. I follow Beast back to his pile of clothing, but he refuses to acknowledge me. When I reach out to take his arm, he jerks away like I've burned him. Where are you going? Switching places with sin, he tells me, but I grab onto his arm again, his muscles flexing and tensing beneath my fingers as he turns back toward me. His actions are slow and deadly, dangerous like he's walking a tightrope, but knows better than to fall. My right palm splays open against his chest and trails downward toward the firm length of his cock. He's not finished, not by a long shot, and I'm not letting him leave. Tonight, I have all the control, regardless of what the guys actually think. Gidge, you don't know what you're doing. Beast tells me, his frantic breathing slowing to a steady beat. That's the scariest part, watching him lock down his emotions like that. 
Let me go. No. My eyes lift to meet his, and there's a tension between us that burns. My skin aches every time a raindrop hits it, these cold spots taking over all that heat. I can feel each and every one. Hell, I could count them. He tries to pull away from me again, and I remember Granger's words. Keep pushing, and somebody might just push back. Beast stays stone still as I wrap my hands around his biceps, trying to keep them there. When he doesn't react, I feel fury swipe its dirty claws across me, and I start to hit him, as hard as I can, right in the chest. He takes it for a little while, and the more frenzied I get, the calmer he is. Fine. I let go, and take an abrupt step back, my mouth pursed, my skin flush with heat. I'll go find Granger again. He'll fuck me if I ask. Moving away from him, I grab my nightgown and head for the back door. I don't even make it inside before he's on me again, fingers curling around my wrist and yanking me back. Beast pushes me against the wall, cups the side of my face, and kisses me in a way that brooks no argument. My knees go weak from the feel of his tongue sliding against my own, and Beast scoops me up in his arms, laying me out on the pavement on my back. And then he covers me with his body, sliding his naked cock into my throbbing heat and fucking so hard that it almost hurts. Almost. My hands curl around his shoulders as he rides above me with rough, brutal movements, his strokes deep and long, hitting the end of me. Another climax hits me, and I squirm, crying out and clawing at Beast's chest, but he doesn't stop. He fucks me into the pavement and then lifts me up, slamming my back into the rough stucco wall and pounding me so hard that I'm sure I'll have bruises on my ass. We go at it like animals. There's nothing gentle or romantic about it. Beast takes me in every possible way, adjusting our position several times until we end up on the ground again. His big body is soaked in sweat and I can hear his breathing, turning ragged and uneven. When he tenses up and tries to pull away from me, I wrap my legs around his midsection and squeeze hard, pulling him deeper inside of me. In the back of my mind, I know what he's trying to do, that he's wanting to pull out before he comes. My mind is too clouded with passion to care. Instead, I writhe against him, lifting my hips to meet his. My vision is blurry with pleasure, but as I'm raking my nails down Beast's back and whispering for him to finish, I see something. There's a person standing in the doorway, cloaked in shadows, watching us. As Beast finishes with a growl, my legs keeping him trapped inside of me, I can see the figure tense up with raw anger. Before he turns and storms off, I know exactly who it is. It's Crown. I don't move to follow him, though, and I don't say anything to Beast. We just lay there for a while before Beast gets up and looks down at me, face unreadable. When I start to stand up, he rises to his feet and helps me the rest of the way. There's the strangest sensation of liquid running down my thighs, but I ignore it, waiting for him to say something, anything at all. He reaches out to touch my chin again, lifting my head. If Cat ever gives his blessing... There's gonna be a battle royale. He drawls, in that thick southern accent of his. It reminds me of hot summer days and iced tea and the buzzing of cicadas. I swallow hard as he moves over to his clothes, puts them back on, and then pulls out his gun. I wouldn't allow myself to lose. My mouth pops open, but I have no idea what exactly he's getting at, so I say nothing. I'll be back. He tells me heading for the gate in the brick wall that surrounds the pool. I watch him go, but then head inside to clean up. This time, I put on proper clothes, well, what I consider to be proper clothes, white mini skirt with the black stripe on the bottom, tank top with corset lacing, and boots. That's my usual attire, basically my version of business casual. Then I go looking for Crown. He's nowhere to be found inside the house, although Granger's sitting in the living room now, smoking a cigarette and staring at his phone. He doesn't even acknowledge me when I walk in. The jerk. So, I search the other rooms, ending with the garage and the side door that leads out to a patio we never use. Crown is there, sitting on his bike and watching, as the very first blushes of morning light taint the horizon a soft pink. 
He looks over at me, but his face is as hard as iron. Nothing I say to you sticks, does it? He asks me as I dig my hands into my pockets, resisting the urge to twirl my skirt in a circle and loudly proclaim, but it has pockets. I'm feeling good. Actually, the best I felt in months. I think my psyche is on overload. Memories of Granger and sin and beast overshadowing all the rest. Once the drugs and the booze wear off and I wake up tomorrow, I'm sure I'll regret some of this night. Maybe all of it. You're too bossy, I tell him. And he just makes this sound under his breath. This scoff that irks me the wrong way. And you're so self-righteous, even though you've got no moral high ground to stand on. Why should I bother listening to you? He looks at me for a long, long moment, and then he smiles. It's not a happy expression, but it softens his face anyway, makes him look for the briefest of seconds like he's approachable, a nice guy with open ears. It's all bullshit. At least Granger and Sin and Beast, they don't try to pretend to be something they're not. They're murderers, outlaws, assholes at best. I think Crown really does consider himself to be different somehow. You're not the first person to ignore my advice, he mumbles, turning away again. Huh? I take a step forward, but Crown doesn't look at me, doesn't bother to explain himself. I don't really expect him to, but my interest is piqued. Instead, I sit down on one of the two chairs and try not to think about Queenie, sitting here and singing nursery rhymes under her breath as she rubbed her belly. I swallow hard and clench the sides of the chair, but Crown doesn't seem to notice. He's just sitting on his bike, straddling the seat like he's about to take off. It's a beautiful bike, too. An Indian chieftain classic, in teal and white. I have the strongest urge to run my hand across it, but I know better than to simply touch someone else's ride. Motorcycles are sacred in club culture. You're... Not going to tell Kat what you saw, are you? I ask, and I hate how weak and young my voice sounds. I don't care what Kat knows. There's nothing he can do to me that matters. But I don't want Beast to get in trouble. His life is his own, and I wouldn't be able to forgive myself if I fucked it up. You mean you and Beast fucking? Crown looks back at me like I'm crazy. It's still pitch dark out here, but even though I can't see his face... I can tell he's pissed off at me. I'm the vice president, Gidge. So? I ask, and he scoffs at me. So? Cat has a right to know what his officers are getting up to, especially in regard to his own daughter. Beast knew the risks when he touched you. He'll have to face the consequences. What is wrong with you? I snap, standing up from the chair, my hands curled into tight fists. Can you ever think outside the rule book? Try to judge a situation with the filter of gray instead of straight black and white? The world is black and white, Gidge, he says, eyes narrowing, but lids heavy and soft, like he's in a whole other world. He's barely listening to me right now. You pick a side and you follow the rules. That's it. There's nothing else to it. What a sad, pathetic life you must lead. I grind out, my pulse throbbing. I've got the beginnings of a headache going on, but I'm too wired to sleep. Not yet. Well, if you're going to report Beast, then you better add Sin and Granger to that list. I feel a bit like I'm snitching, and I don't like it. Then again, Crown's essentially threatening to snitch, isn't he? All I'm doing is protecting my own interests. Mine, and Beast's, and Sin's. Fuck Granger. I couldn't care less what happens to him. What exactly would I be telling Cat about Sin and Granger? He asks, his voice strangely calm, controlled, but tinged with anger. I fucked them too, I say, and the words surprise the shit out of me. I haven't processed it yet, that it actually happened, that I'm not a virgin anymore, that for the rest of my life, I'll probably remember this moment. Crown just stares at me, and I'm pretty sure he thinks I'm full of shit. Granger was first. Sin was second. If you don't believe me, go ahead and ask them. They might lie, but then you're all really good at that, aren't you?
Crown frowns, caught between scolding me and exploding with self-righteous rage. What the hell is that supposed to mean? He asks, voice quiet and steely. It means that I want to know more about Kian. I want to know why those men came here, and I want to know why we were all alone that day. I've never seen Crown snap to attention quite like that. You know what happened, he says, almost softly. But then he stands up and swings a leg over his bike, and I know I'm in trouble. Kian was the Dom's son. You know that. He raped your sister. What happened to him was righteous retribution. Was it? I ask, my eyes getting salty and sore from unshed tears. But I won't let them fall. I refuse. Because the way those men spoke, it just felt like cold-blooded murder. And either way, was it worth it? Was getting that revenge worth Queenie's life? Her babies? How about Posies? Crown doesn't say anything. He lets me vent standing there in the dark and staring down at me. Sin and Granger. He starts, and I nod sharply, feeling my body start to shake. I don't regret what I've done, but it was a lot. Tonight was a lot. Before I even realize what he's doing, Crown's got his arms around me, and he's hugging me. My brain doesn't know what to make of it, so I just stand there, quivering and holding back tears. I'm not even sure if I know what the tears are for, if they're for my sisters or if they're for myself, a girl who died in spirit the day they died in body. I just slept with three outlaws tonight. I partied at their clubhouse. I did their drugs. Is that what I want with my life? Is that what my sisters would have wanted for theirs? Because I know Queenie didn't. She didn't want it for me or for her or for her baby. Crown holds me so tight that I start to get confused, emotions bubbling up inside of me that I don't want. I push him away. His hug shouldn't mean anything. I barely know him. When he does step back, his compassion is edged with anger. Gidge. He starts, but I shake my head. I'm not about to listen to a lecture from him. It's my body. I can do what I want with it. I'm not questioning that part of the equation. I'm just wondering why that's what you want. His mouth tightens, and he looks up, gazing past me toward the side door, like he's looking straight through at the three other officers. He drops his moss-green eyes to mine, and my heart catches in my throat. You have more to your future than being a club whore. Are you calling me a whore? I choke out, my voice caustic. I keep my eyes locked with his. There's no way in hell I'm looking away first. No. Just that one word, said with such force that I decide I actually believe him. But I don't want to see you at the clubhouse anymore. His mouth tightens. Your father and I just had a chat. Things are going to change around here, Gitch. For the better. I shake my head because I've heard this crap before, and nothing ever happened. Besides, even if it did... Too little, too late. It's just me here now, so what's the point? When I don't say anything, Crown rakes his fingers through his curls, mussing them up. Sin, Granger, beast. He starts, looking down at me. I'm sorry, I just need a fucking minute. Are you jealous? I ask him as he turns away and moves back over to his bike, leaning over and putting his hands on the handlebars. All he does is laugh at me, though, like I'm ridiculous. What? That's how you're acting right now. Jealous, Skidge? I'm disgusted. He spins back to face me, this cruel hardness coming into his voice. You're 16 years old. The three of them are going to face Cat's wrath. He grabs a bottle off the table next to me, but it's not a beer like all the other guys are drinking. It's straight whiskey. Of course it is. I should have waited until you were 18. He mumbles under his breath, and my skin prickles with goosebumps. Can you really fight off the mafia with a drink in your hand? I ask as he slugs back several shots worth. They've left town. He says, 
swiping his arm across his mouth and looking at me over the top of it. Their entire entourage rolled out about an hour ago. If they want to send some assassins, have at it. I'm a straight shooter even liquored up. Is that why you got kicked off the force? I've heard random mumblings from Cat, Nellie, Sin, Granger. Supposedly, Crown didn't choose to stop being a cop, but the look he throws at me for that question is as hard as iron. His eyes get so dark that I decide I'll never ask that question again. I won't even think it. Please don't tell Cat. I continue instead, taking a step forward. Crown swigs some more of the whiskey, but he doesn't offer it up to me. He's too much of a rule follower for that. Why start shit over nothing? It's not nothing, Gidge. Crown starts. But I'm taking another step toward him, curling my fingers under his belt. My fingertips brush against the flat, hard planes of his stomach, and he sucks in a sharp breath. I've seen him fucking girls before, this smooth, confident rhythm that had my heart pounding and sweat beating on my lower back. The last time I saw him was on accident, when I walked into one of the dorms at the clubhouse looking for Nellie. He didn't see or hear, so he just kept going, his hands tracing over the club whore's full, round breasts. Lifting my face up, I meet his eyes again. What is it you hate about me? I whisper, truly curious. I mean, I know why Granger hates me, sort of, and Sin. Pretty sure Beast doesn't hate me, but Crown? He's a mystery. He laughs at me, and I frown, teasing his belly with my fingertips. I don't hate you. You act like you do, I continue, bringing my hands to his belt buckle. He watches me try to undo it and then reaches down with his free hand, pushing me away. With the other, he swigs the crown royal whiskey. If that's what you think, then you're either in the wrong mindset, or I am. My brows raise, but I can't quite figure out what he's trying to say. My fingers touch his belt again, but he grabs my wrist in a harsh grip. I'm not going to fuck you, Gitch. His voice is hard, almost painful to hear. I don't know what happened with the others, but they were wrong. This is fucked up. You think I should have lost it to someone my own age? I ask dryly, and Crown's face tightens up. You were a virgin before tonight? There's venom in his voice, and to be quite frank... It's almost scary. If I had to pick one of these four men that I was most likely to be scared of, it might actually be Crown. Are you kidding me? Wow. I guess you all just assumed I was as loose as Nelly? My nostrils flare, and I tear Crown's belt from its buckle. He lets me do that much, but then he shoves me away again, taking another drink. Why? If you'd known it was going to be you or Granger, would you have fought for the right? My mouth curves up in a mean smirk, but I'm only teasing. I know Crown doesn't like me, despite what he says. I just figured that he's a guy, and a daybreaker at that. Sex is like, well, alcohol to them. They don't mind drinking several bottles a night, even if the bar is out of the stuff they prefer. Anything will do. You let Granger? Crown pauses to drink yet again. I hope the alcohol gets to him soon. Considering the second empty bottle on the table, I'm guessing he started as soon as he heard the Grey Wolf Mafia was on their way out of town. Anyone but him, Gidge. It's not like we're an item or anything. I grind out, reaching for the bottle. Crown resists at first and then finally lets it slip into my fingers. A quick swig gives me the burn in my throat that I'm looking for, and I pass it back. He was proficient. Proficient? Crown asks, and then laughs, a slightly happier sound than before. He's clearly drunk, or on his way to drunk. Fucking please. That man is a sloppy fucker. You just don't have anything to compare him to. I have beast, I retort, lifting my chin and putting my fingers on Crown's fly. He looks down at them, but he doesn't stop me as I pop the button and lower the zipper. I have sin. My hand slips inside his jeans, and he groans, taking another drink. My fingers curl around his cock, and a hot flush colors my cheeks. I could have you. This. 
This is my father's VP right here, his right-hand man. Getting crown into bed is like kicking my father in the metaphorical balls. That's right, cat. You only think you own these men. My hand strokes him up and down, slowly but confidently. There's a feeling inside my chest that says if I act weak or unsure around Crown, he'll push me away permanently. After a moment, the bottle falls from his fingertips and shatters on the pavement, sloshing whiskey across our boots. When Crown takes my wrist and pushes it from his jeans, I open my mouth to protest. Instead, he sweeps down and kisses me. My toes curl inside my boots and my heart screams in my chest. Kissing an outlaw shouldn't feel this good. Kissing an outlaw should be like licking the sharp end of a rusty nail, not this liquid, molten heat and ardent, wild energy. It feels good, too good, like he's pulling me into him. Crown kisses me until my knees buckle, and then he wraps an arm around my waist and sets me on his bike, looking down at me. Could have me, huh? He asks. And then he's making quick work of my clothes, leaving me naked on his bike. I wiggle on the leather seat and it squeaks, making me swallow with nervousness. Crown puts his hands on my shoulders and kisses my forehead, my cheeks. It's almost nice, the way he touches me. It's confusing as hell. The sunrise is creeping its way into the world, but it's still too dark for me to get a good read on Crown's expression as his hands travel down to my shoulders, my arms, hands palming my breasts before he steps back and undoes his jeans. Unlike Beast, he doesn't forget a condom. He slides it over his cock and straddles the bike, turning me toward him so that my back is against the handlebars. When he pulls me forward and slides into me, a sigh escapes me my breath rushing out in relief. My legs go around him and we end up tucked together on the seat of his bike. Crown leans forward, breathing against my ear, stirring my hair with his breath. He kisses my earlobe, trailing his mouth along my jaw until he finds my lips again. His hands settle on my hips, encouraging me to move, and I realize that this time I'll need to do at least some of the work. My own hands curl together behind Crown's neck, fingers teasing his dark curls. He helps me settle into a rhythm, working my body against him in the cool morning air. It's still raining, but we're protected beneath the awning, our own private little spot for sex. Looking down, I can see our bodies joining, and it gives me this huge thrill, especially when Crown begins to explore my body with his hands, tracing his palms down my arms, cupping my breasts, teasing my nipples. He finds my ass next, squeezing and kneading the flesh, splaying his fingers against my back as he thrusts forward and fills me. There's this worshipful quality to him, like he can't get enough of me, like he's trying to memorize every curve of my body. It's so different from the other guys, like he's absorbing every moment of this to file away for later. We kiss again, mouths burning one another with ardent heat, the slickness between my thighs growing by the minute. I'm so turned on, I'm shaking, quivering with need. Crown feeds off of that, taking my breasts in his hands and sweeping his thumbs over my nipples before dropping his mouth to one and taking it between his teeth. I'm a fucking idiot, he murmurs. But then he grabs my hips and pulls me closer so that we're joined, fully and completely. He grinds against me in time with his moans, kissing the edge of my lips as I strain for his mouth, wanting more, needing it. When Crown comes, his entire body goes hard, my palms sliding down the inked muscles of his chest. I wish I could see him better, wish I could worship his ink the way he's worshiping my body. Gee, Gidge, that really sounds like a quickie, huh? You're getting too carried away. Even though I know I'm right about that, I keep going, moaning and letting myself get lost in Crown's arms. I bet hundreds of girls, maybe thousands, have gotten lost this way. And then been left to find their way home. I don't want to be like that. But when the orgasm comes up on me, I don't fight it, letting myself fall over that sharp edge with Crown, the mingled sounds of our pleasure loud in the quiet morning air. We sit there joined for quite some time, 
not moving. But then Crown clears his throat and pulls back, looking down at me. My cheeks flush with heat, but no words will come to me. None seem appropriate. I got what I wanted tonight, right? A method to forget my sisters, my pain, an outlet for my anger. It worked. Maybe too well. Crown stands up, taking me with him, and then slides out of me, setting me back on my feet and making sure I'm steady before he lets go. His face is almost sad as I pull away, but as I watch, it hardens up slightly. Gitch. Just that one word, and then Crown is turning away and fixing his jeans. In the distance, I can hear the rumble of a familiar motorcycle. That sound used to lull me to sleep when I was little. As I grew older, the sound changed a few times with each new bike Cat bought, but somehow they always seemed to be able to soothe me. Until recently. I don't remember when exactly, but one day, I just woke up and realized what a sham my life was. Cat is not a hero, riding to rescue his princess on a metal steed. His officers are not knights, sitting around a table deciding how to best protect me. They're all monsters. And while they'll protect their property, that's all I am to them. Property. Crown. I start. But the way he looks at me then, I can see it in his eyes. That's all I'll ever be to him. That's all I'll ever be to any of them. Go to your room, Gidget, and keep your mouth shut. His words are so harsh they burn. Yanking my clothes on as fast as I can. I turn and head back into the house, rushing up the stairs and locking myself in my room. My heart is pounding as I slide to the floor and cover my ears with my hands. I don't want to hear the sound of that bike anymore. I don't want to believe in bullshit. And I know that in my heart, I really have hit rock bottom. It's then that I decide I'm going to kick off that stony shore and swim. Swim as fast and hard as I can until I'm oceans away from this ruin. I might have been born ruined, but I don't have to die that way. Chapter 13 Tuesday night. Nellie is cooking dinner and Gaz is here. That's not good. It's quite clear in his gaze that he wants to kill me. I've never been more sure about anything in my life. Your mom's made spaghetti, Kat says, standing in my door next to Crown. The vice president's been watching me all day, looking at me with disapproving eyes, giving off little sighs of disappointment. Once, he opened his mouth to, I think, lecture me, but I shoved my noise-canceling headphones over my ears and lay facing the wall. Kat, though, I'm not allowed to ignore. So, I quip, because even though Femme's got a nub for a leg and I had a gun pressed to my forehead, there's no such thing as submission in my blood. As Eminem might say, I've got spite inside my DNA. The sperm donor frowns and rubs his hand over his beard, studying me. I don't like that, the calculating way he's looking at me. Usually, Cat is punch first and ask questions later. Right now, it seems as if he's testing my mettle. That's fucking scary. I lean back on my elbows and stare him down. If he thinks I'm afraid or that I might bolt, I'll be handcuffed to my bed. As things stand, it's going to be hard enough for me to get away from here. I'd be better off escaping during the school day, maybe. Although, that doesn't solve the problem known as Grey Wolf. Damn me for having a conscience. Life must be so much easier without one. Cat should know the answer to that. You know... All horses can be broken, Gidge. Cat smiles at me, and goosebumps spring up across my skin. I wonder if my face is as white as my knuckles, gripping my black bedspread. From the direction of the bathroom, I can hear Fem snarling. He hates my fucking dad, even after being shot. He'd go for the throat if I hadn't tied his leash to one of the bath's clawed feet. So? He repeats my quip with a sneer. Get your ungrateful ass downstairs and sit at the dinner table with your family. I don't have any family left, I whisper. But unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, considering the circumstances, 
Cat is already turning away, and he doesn't hear me. Dinner. Please. After he put a gun to my head and pretended to pull the trigger, mutilated my dog, tried to force me to kill a kid, my instincts are on high alert. Whatever happens tonight, it's not just going to be a spaghetti dinner, that's for fucking sure. Why do you insist on provoking him like that? Crown asks, spreading his hands helplessly as I stand up and watch his eyes slide from my face, past my breasts, and come to rest on that tantalizing bit of skin between my tank top and my low-cut jeans. I slip my thumbs into the loops and let them slip just a little bit lower. Swear to God, I can see his nipples pebble beneath his white t-shirt. Why? I query raising both brows and doing my very best to forget how good those hands of his felt when they were exploring every inch of my body. Shit, it was pitch black that night, but I feel like Crown memorized my every curve by touch alone. Because he's a monster. You know it, even if you won't admit it. Crown's face hardens and he looks away sharply, his chocolate hair catching the light and shining with auburn highlights. He's my president. I can't let you talk about him like that, Gidget. Really? But you can let him put a gun to my head and pull the trigger. You'd probably rush off to Costco to get him industrial cleaning supplies so the prospects could clean that shit up. Crown gives me a hard frown, and I feel this pang in my chest, wishing he was giving me that Cheshire Cat smile of his instead. I advised him against that stunt. He starts. But I've already heard this excuse from Beast. I don't care. I don't care if the boys knew the gun was empty. They all stood there and watched me suffer at a bone-deep level. I've never believed they actually cared about me, that the sex we had that night meant anything more. And yet, the sense of disappointment I feel towards them is overwhelming, a tidal wave of blue-black water crashing down on my half-dead spirit. And if he'd actually wanted to kill me, what then? I interrupt and Crown pauses, his green eyes taking me in, sweeping down to my feet and back to my face. There's shame in his gaze, and that tells me all I need to know. No, don't answer that. I put a palm up and push past Crown into the hallway. Gaz's obnoxious cackling echoes around the stairwell as I head down, my hand sweaty, slicking down the banister as I make my way to the living room. There's an archway behind the stairs that leads to the formal dining area, a room we've used less times than I have fingers on my right hand. And even then, we've never actually eaten in here. Kat has lectured me at this table, but that's about it. Nellie's wearing a pale pink dress with short sleeves that shows off the scars on her inner elbows, needle marks from all the drugs she used when I was a kid. Even though she's more or less sober now, the damage has already been done. Her face is drawn and tired-looking, and even with all the fancy dental work my father's paid for, there's a considerable lack of fullness in her lower jaw. Cat is sitting at the head of the table, of course he is, with my brother, Gaz, on his right. Crown follows in behind me and takes up the seat to Cat's left, out of habit. Just to be contrary, I sit at the opposite end of the dining table. It has six chairs which makes my heart hurt so goddamn bad that it feels like I'm about to throw up. Six chairs. Six family members. My eyes latch onto the empty chair next to Crown, and my heart skips and jumps inside my chest. That should be Queenie's chair, I think. And the one Crown's in should be Posey's. But my sisters will never sit at this table again, never smile at me over a bowl of Queenie's spaghetti. Never share a new shirt or critique a daring outfit. My hands curl into fists on my thighs as Nellie places a plate in front of me, and the familiar smell hits me in a rush. Where did you get this recipe? I ask, and my voice is so tight and strained that Gaz and Cat pause their conversation to look over at me. Even Crown is staring. Me? I'm too focused on the noodles with their red, red sauce. The color of blood. I... Nellie. Poor, stupid Nellie, who's always been the last person to get the joke. She looks at the food and then over at me, blonde and blue-eyed like my dead sisters. 
I found it written in a cookbook. I don't wait for her to finish, shoving up from my chair and racing into the kitchen to find Queenie's favorite cookbook, the one with all the handwritten notes lying next to the stove. There's a splatter of red sauce on one corner and a glass of wine sitting on the opposite page, blotting out my sister's words with a purple-red ring. Swear to fuck, I see red. Nellie follows in after me, thoroughly confused, and when I slap her, she has no idea it's coming. The harsh smack of my palm against her cheek rings loud in the quiet kitchen, my feet standing in the very same spot Queenie's body slumped when she died. I can see the pantry from here, the one I hid in, the one that saved my life and cost hers. You went into my room and you took this, I growl shoving the wine glass off and letting it roll onto the floor. It shatters to pieces and stings my toes, but I don't care. This book, it's one of the few parts of Queenie that I have left. To see it disrespected like this infuriates me, stirs up some of that wild rage I felt that night when I fucked four death by daybreakers until the sun came up. No, Kat says, appearing from around the corner and putting his hand on my mother's thin shoulder. I went into your room and took it. Everything you have is mine, Gidget. He steps toward me and reaches out for the cookbook. When I hug it close to my chest and move back, his rust red eyes flare with anger. Give your mother the fucking book. That's a direct order. Crown appears in the entrance to the kitchen, looking at me with a gaze that's almost pleading. What else did you take? I whisper, realizing that I haven't checked my dresser drawers since I got home from school. The smile that lights up Kat's face is not a pleasant one. You think I was going to let you off that easy? He asks me as Gaz appears beside Crown, staring at me with cold, dead eyes. My brother's hatred isn't burning hot anymore. Instead, it's like ice, and that's so much worse. My skin prickles with goosebumps, and the hair on the back of my neck rises as my instincts kick in. Fuck. Why couldn't I just play the good little submissive and bide my damn time? I keep challenging Cat, and instead of ignoring me like he used to, he's taking me up on every single one. Crown, Cat says, and his vice president comes to, like he's waking from a dream, tearing his eyes from me to look at his president. You're excused for the rest of the night. Sir? Crown asks, his voice low and cautious. When he looks back at me, I can see in his gaze that he doesn't want to leave. He knows as well as I do that as soon as he walks out that door, things are going to get bad for me. Gaz and I will be here all night. We'll be fine until Sin gets here in the morning. Go home. Crown pauses for a moment. It's just a split second, but Cat notices, and his face tightens, the deep wrinkles on his forehead pulling taut. He saw, and he doesn't like it. Unfortunately for me, Crown's hesitation is just enough to piss Cat off, but not long enough to make any difference in my fate. With one last look in my direction, the Death by Daybreak VP steps back, turns, and heads for the front door, locking it behind him. My focus returns to Cat. Gaz is a leashed dog. He won't lunge unless our father sends him for my throat. Apologize to your mother and hand over the book, he repeats, voice as cold as ice. He smells like leather and motor oil, a smell that used to comfort me. Once upon a time, I saw my father and his men as heroes, knights in black ready to fend off a dragon. In reality, they were tempting the dragon to our doorsteps. In reality, they breathe just as much fire, flay just as much skin. Apologize. My mind whispers as I move my gaze from Cat to Nellie. She's staring at me with wide blue eyes, her lips quivering as she fights back tears. I should feel sorry for her. Really, I should. But then I remember her fucking club members in front of me, shooting up with a needle while I cried and reached out for her. No, no, I don't feel sorry for her at all. I'm not sorry. 
I say, and already I'm kicking myself, wondering how far I can push Cat before he gives in and wraps his big, hairy hands around my throat. Some part of me wonders if I'm suicidal, if I'd like that, having the choice to live taken out of my hands and put into someone else's. How nice would that be? Getting a way out without having to make a decision, a leap of faith, without having to pull the trigger on myself. The only thing I'm sorry for is being born to the two of you. Gaz moves into the kitchen before Cat can stop him, hauls back, and hits me as hard as he can with his fist. The only blessing is that I drop Queenie's cookbook and it slides under the refrigerator, briefly saved from harm. Pain lances through my jaw as my teeth crash together, agony tearing up the inside of my skull. Blood is already pouring down from my nostrils. I taste crimson on my lips. You fucking whore. Gaz snarls as I smirk up at him, cradling the side of my face with my hand and daring him to hit me again. What do I have to lose anyway? At least if I die here, I won't have to kill Gray. If I die here, I can die clean. Always with the trashy, misogynist insults. Don't you have anything better to throw at me than that? My brother steps forward and grabs me by the front of my shirt, rending the fabric and throwing me as hard as he can into the fridge. My back hits the stainless steel and my breath rushes out of me. On instinct, I try to suck in some fresh oxygen, but he's hitting me in the stomach with a closed fist. The lack of air covers up the pain. It's hard to feel when you can't breathe. Meanwhile, Nellie screams and buries her face in Kat's jacket, but she doesn't try to stop her son, and neither does Kat. Gaz throws me to the floor and I land right where Queenie lay dying, my eyes staring at the crack under the pantry door, where all the blood oozed in. Is this what she saw in her last split second of life, my face peering out at her from underneath? A swift kick takes me in the stomach before fingers wrap in my hair, raising me up to my knees as my scalp burns. But I'm not completely helpless. I punch Gaz in the balls as hard as I can, and he lets out a satisfying grunt, paying me back with another hit to the face, one that's so painful that I black out for a brief moment. All right, Gaz, that's enough. Cat's voice is cold as he gives the command for my brother to stop leaving me bleeding in a crumpled heap on the floor. Gaz snarls and throws open the back door, storming outside to cool his head as our father squats down beside my face, his boots squeaky on the shiny floors. I'm shaking and coughing as he sweeps some hair back from my bloodied forehead. You'll fall into line willingly, Gidge, or I'll rearrange your limbs until you fit. Do you understand me? It's, I choke out, coughing up blood on the floor, hating the memories it conjures up in my psyche. Gidget. Never Gidge. Only people I like can call me Gidge. Only Queenie and Posey ever called me Gidge. I gasp, my throat getting stuck on the words. Cat frowns and grabs me by the hair dragging me out of the kitchen and across the floor while Nellie watches. Even though I feel like I'm about to pass out, I'm forced to scramble up the stairs lest I get dragged up them. My father throws me on my bed and stands there, watching me pant and bleed and glare. Last fucking chance, he says, eyes as cold as deep space. Last chance. He turns and leaves before I get the opportunity to speak. That is, if I can even talk. I'm hurting so bad that I feel like I might die. One day, I think, as I lie there and wonder, not for the first time, if Queenie's and Posey's deaths are just as much Cat's fault as they are the Mafia's. One day, I'm going to kill you, Cat. I don't believe in premonitions or foreshadowing, but a chill travels down my spine at that thought. And then, nothing. I barely remember the next few days. Chapter 14 Nobody gives a shit whether I skip school or not, 
so I stay home the next few days and lay curled in bed around my three-legged dog. He literally doesn't seem to notice or care that he's missing a limb, but I do. Every time I look at him, hopping around with only one front leg, I'll remember. I'll remember that I made a mistake, that I hate cat, that I hate this life, that I have to leave or die. Rolling onto my back, I groan and hear Beast shift at his position near my non-existent bedroom door. I ignore him and look up at the ceiling, imagining that kid's gray eyes looking back at me, ready for his own death, desperate to save me from a fate he perceived as even worse than his own. Cat is not going to let me get out of this. As soon as he's finished with the kid, he'll call me back in and make me kill him. And if not him, then someone else. Maybe someone even less culpable. Someone even less deserving of a shot to the head. Gritting my teeth, I push the heels of my hands against my eyes so hard that they hurt. My father is going to bind me to the club with strings so tight it cuts. I'll be a murderer. My soul will be tainted of filthy black, and I'll never really be able to escape. Once Gaz's girlfriend took off with 200 bucks in her clothes, left their apartment and moved three states over, because she'd seen things, knew things. They hunted her down and killed her. Someone that my brother claimed to love was executed for a mere infraction. Cat is going to reel me in like a fish on a hook that I can never remove. I have to take my dog and that kid, and I have to run. But to outpace the long legs of the club, I'll have to be smart. I'll have to run far and fast, and I'll have to go either somewhere they'd never expect or somewhere they can't reach me. That leaves me with two choices. The feds or the mafia. Fem flicks his tongue against my ear and I yelp dropping my hands and glancing over to find him panting and staring at me like this is any other normal day. He wants to go for a goddamn walk, and he's just had his leg amputated. It's time for antibiotics, I say, and he just licks my mouth as I try desperately to push him away. And your pain meds. You don't get a walk, not yet. Fem ignores me, hopping down off the bed and stumbling just a little before he regains his feet. He bares his teeth at Beast, but then settles down to lick the long fur of his tail. I stand up with a groan, meeting Beast's blue eyes from across the room. Do you want to learn to defend yourself? He asks, surprising the shit out of me. I cock a brow as I study him, standing there in his leather cut and tight black tee, his worn-out jeans and his steel-toed boots. I can still remember him in the ring kicking ass and taking names. It's a mystery to me why he joined the club, but probably for the same reason as everyone else. And really, it's not for booze and drugs and women. It's to feel like they belong, like they're part of something bigger. Too bad they're really only part of a gang, practically a cult in my opinion. You mean like hand-to-hand -hand combat or something? I ask. Because Beast knows damn well I can wield a gun or a knife like nobody's business. I can also throw a mean right hook, but it wouldn't hurt to learn from the best. Or the beast. His mouth curves up in a smile. It's not wicked or sinful or naughty, just primal. Like, primal as fuck. Like he could throw me against this wall and fuck me so good that I wouldn't even remember I was planning on running away. Oh, Gidget. Naughty. What can I say? Fearing for my life makes me feel reckless. Do you want to learn? He asks, and his voice is just dripping honey. Fuck, Beast's accent is so thick, it makes me want to start speaking in a southern drawl. I'll teach you, Gidget. And the way he says teach. Criminal. I might just take you up on that, I tell him, biting my lower lip before I even realize I've started flirting. I turn away and move into the bathroom to get Fem's pills, missing Reba so hard it hurts. I want to gossip so bad. I want to hear her tell me I'm an idiot, have her invite me to church. Well, she may never invite me to church again. Last two times she did involved fucking and bloodshed. As I'm dosing the dog's pills, I notice Beast moving over to look out my window. He glances down once and then turns his attention back to me. Your friends are here. 
That's all he says before I hear the obnoxious blaring of the horn and the hooting of three distinct voices. Gidget! Dina calls out, slamming the horn several times and then cranking up the music on her car stereo. We've come to break you out of prison! She's laughing, and she sounds drunk as hell, but it's just barely four o'clock, so maybe she's just crazy? Oh, or maybe she's here to hit me up for party drugs again. They want some blow, I tell Beast, and he doesn't twitch or scowl or lecture. No, he just looks at me and listens. It's absurd what a good listener he is. I mean, the man is huge and covered in ink and scars from his MMA days, but when he looks at me, I almost feel like I could open up. Almost. We don't sell to kids. Is the only explanation I get. Not that I care. I didn't plan on getting coke for the party or attending it. I won't ever touch cocaine again, not after that night. I shiver and close my eyes against the resurgence of the memory. I dreamed it last night, I think, because I woke up sweating and wanting. And yet, when I reached out and tried to take hold of it, the images broke up and flittered away like leaves on the wind. You might not, but somebody else will, I say the wheels in my mind tick-tocking away. I feel like there's a clock counting away the seconds of my life. I never thought my father would actually let my brother beat me up like that. I've always sensed his animosity toward me, but I never thought he'd carry it so far. Reaching up my hand, I touch the tender flesh near my right eye as rain starts to come down outside. Good thing they have the convertible top up, huh? Would have been funny to see them get soaked, though. Dina would lose her shit. Beast turns to look at me, his eyes sharp and keen, surveying me, taking stock. He reaches out with a thumb and smears my makeup, frowning. Yes, he says, and I nod. There's this stillness then that overtakes Beast that I can't explain. It scares the shit out of me, like all of that violence coiled and waiting inside of him might just come undone, that I might get hit with the shards of his pain. I take a step back. Why didn't you say anything? He asks, and I realize this is probably the longest conversation we've ever had. We might have fucked one fateful stormy night, but we're worse than strangers. Beast's ice blue eyes bore into mine, and I take another step back. He notices and moves away from me toward the door. I'm not a fucking snitch, I snap, reflexively realizing that I'm falling right back into club mentality. Didn't I just have a thought about visiting the feds and outing my entire family? Ruining the four horsefucks of the apocalypse? Standing here with Beast, staring accusatorily at me, I realized that I could never do that. Hatred of authority, of police, loyalty for club and family, that's been drilled into me since childhood. And the mafia? They killed my sisters. They raped Posey. I could never turn to them. Closing my eyes, I realize just how well and truly alone I am. You should go talk to your friends, Beast says, and I can see him shutting down, closing that anger away in a box for later. It won't stay lost, that pain. Eventually, it'll come out. Eventually, somebody is going to get hurt. Nodding, I head downstairs, past Nellie, asleep on the couch, and outside. Dina is pissed off now since, you know, I didn't jump at her beck and call. She rolls down the window, frowning at the rain as it cascades around my face and crushes my dark curls against the sides of my head. Are you coming or not? She asks. But the temptation is gone. Until I see Reba sitting in the back seat, arms crossed over her chest. She looks at me from concerned green eyes, tiny wrinkles appearing next to her mouth as she purses her lips like an old southern lady. What are you doing here, I ask, feeling this icy wave of fear overtaking me like a tsunami. Looking at Reba, all I can see is Posey's bloody face superimposed over hers. Just being here is putting her at risk. At this point, I can't decide if my father, brother, or the Grey Wolf Mafia are the worst threat. You are a prisoner here, Gidget, Reba says, and I feel that fear inside of me start to boil into anger, just like before. I never want to go back to that person again, 
that empty, broken person. But honestly, I feel worse off than I did before, just after my sisters died. Now, my dog has three legs. Now, I can't even hang out with my best friend. Now, I'm housebound, without a phone or a laptop, with bruises from my brother and a death sentence hanging over my head. You've got your self-righteous voice on, I tell her, trying to stifle my rage. And you know what? I'm sick of it. You don't understand what I'm going through, Reba. You don't understand the bullshit that I have to put up with. If you'd only tell me, she starts, her thick, honeyed accent dripping gold and beautiful. She's scared, sad, pleading with me. I want nothing more than to give in and fall into her arms, let someone who actually cares about me hold me for once. I'm trapped in a world you'll never understand, I growl at her, because frankly, I don't know who's watching this house. I don't know if the mafia is planning a hit on my friend. I just want her to fucking leave. Reba starts to talk, but I cut her off. You and I are from different spheres of the universe. Go read your Bible and leave me in the devil's embrace. I step back and slam the door on Dina's pouted pink lips. Reba follows me. This laugh, it doesn't have to be your laugh, she tells me, the rain turning her red hair crimson. I look back at her and I wish with all my heart that she was right. But this poison, it's in my blood. My only choice now is to run or die. That's it. She'll never be able to understand how the club works, not with her naturally forgiving nature. No, she'd believe the best of everyone until it was her tied to a chair, torture devices littering the ragged wood floors of Uncle Benny's cabin. Even then, she'd probably grant her abusers forgiveness and give in to the light. Not like me. I'm not healthy enough to have forgiveness in me. Not for anyone. Not even for myself. I turn around and walk right up to her, water sluicing between my lips. It's cold as fuck out here, and I'm shivering. My makeup runs down my face, and I notice Reba's eyes widening as she takes in the marks Gaz left me with. Gidge, she starts, reaching out to me. I slap her hand away. If anyone's watching us, I want them to believe I hate Reba Keller. That's the only way I'll be able to keep her safe. I channel my feelings for Gaz and Kat into my stare. You know what you are? I whisper, venom lacing my voice. It hurts me so goddamn bad that I almost quit and fall to my knees. This is harder than getting hit by Gaz. I'd welcome another beating from him if it would somehow get me out of this. An uppity little bitch who doesn't know how to connect with anyone else because she's too busy hiding behind her morals. Reba's throat tightens up, and I can see she's not buying it, not by a long shot. So I reach out and I shove her back as hard as I can against the car, hating myself even as I'm doing it. That gets her, that unexpected surge of violence. I wonder if she knows I'm doing it out of love. Don't fucking come back here again or you're dead. I choke, and my voice breaks on the final syllable, spinning away. My wet hair smacks me in the face as I head back inside and slam the door behind me, locking it five times over. For a moment, I just fall back against it, panting hard and wishing I could sink into the floor and disappear forever. Instead, I force myself up and stumble out the back door toward the pool. Without bothering to take off my clothes, I dive in and let myself sink to the bottom. My hair floats in front of my face, dark tendrils curling together like fog. I must be down there a long time because I start to feel this woozy, ethereal blackness taking over the edges of my vision. At first, I like it because it feels like it just might be the emotional eraser I've been looking for. But then, I remember that as far as I know, we only get one life, and I haven't really lived mine. Besides, if I let myself die down here, then that kid will die too. And for some reason, I feel like I have to save him. Maybe, because he reminds me of myself. I must be under the water longer than I think because suddenly there are two strong arms wrapping around my midsection and hauling me to the surface. 
beast yanks me right out of the water and puts me on my back on the pavement under the rain. When I roll to my side and try to cough, I find it almost impossible to get any air. I hadn't even realized I'd breathed in so much water. Beast pushes me back down and covers my mouth with his, breathing for me. It's a more intimate experience than I want, with his eyes looking onto mine, his breath becoming my own, giving me life. He pulls back and puts his hands on my chest, sending vibrant spirals of heat through me. It's not quite so romantic when I cough and turn over, spewing water onto the concrete. Beast doesn't say anything, just rubs my back in circles until I'm finished choking, sucking in sweet, beautiful lungfuls of air. Accidental or intentional? He asks me, and I glare at him, pushing my bangs back from my face. Accidental, I tell him, but maybe there are no accidents. Now that I'm sitting here with ice-cold rain pouring down from the sky, I feel like I've just been given a wake-up call from the universe. If you stay put, you will drown. I start to shiver, but my eyes are on Beast's mouth instead of wherever else they should be. I can't seem to stop staring at the droplets of moisture on his lips. He's still hovering over me on all fours, staring down at me. We look at each other, and even though it's a terrible idea, I lean up and kiss him. Our mouths are cold at first, from the rain and the pool water, but when he reaches up and cups the back of my head with one big hand, the temperature creeps toward boiling hot. That strange coiled energy in Beast comes toward me in a tsunami, and I find myself gasping as he pushes me back and covers my body with his own. I can't hike my skirt up fast enough, but at least he gets his dick out in record time. Beast hesitates for a moment, at my opening, and I make a low growling noise in my throat. I'm on the pill, I snap, and Beast gives me a look I can't read. His eyes are like arctic glaciers, cold and foreign, but quickly melting in the burgeoning heat, and his blonde hair, it's soaked through and dark like burnished gold. Someone so dangerous shouldn't get to be so handsome scrambles the brains of onlookers, you know? That's my excuse. He's so placid, too, in the way he looks at me, like there's not a thing in the world that could break his stoic tranquility. But that ironclad control of his is under a lot of strain. I literally watch it snap and shatter as he drives into me with a grunt. His body is hot, sliding into slickness until he's balls deep. His hand grasps the hair on the back of my head and tilts it back so that my neck is exposed. I groan as he starts to move, putting his mouth to my throat and licking, sucking, biting. I'll have marks for sure, but I don't care. Because when you're rock bottom and drowning, any little breath is pure pleasure. Beast rides me into the pavement so hard, I'm sure I'll have scrapes on my ass. He fucks me like he's choosing a mate, like he's some sort of alpha male wolf picking a female. It feels good, too, to be worshipped and wanted like that. The harder and faster he goes, the more I want. The more uncoiled and wild he becomes, the more interested I am. Our mouths clash and I can feel the roughness of his body against the smoothness of my own. His beard against my face, his legs against mine his rough hand sliding down my side and plunging beneath my shirt. He cups my breast through my bra, thumbs my nipple through the thin lace. My body is on fire, burning up from the inside, but instead of turning me to ash, it's burning away my pain and anger and frustration. It feels so good to lose myself like that, and it makes me wonder if the addictive personalities that run in my family have bled over to me if I'm addicted to danger and sin and ruination. It would only make sense, wouldn't it? I was born in shadows, and in shadows I remain. My hands grasp Beast's muscular arms, fingernails digging into his tattoos and making him bleed. He's dark from the sun, dipped in ink, and an integral part of the darkness that I'm running from. And yet somehow, all I want right now is him. Catcher Coffee beast, the enforcer 
for the Death by Daybreak Motorcycle Club, arguably the most dangerous and terrifying job there is. Beast kills people. He tortures them. He's fucking me, and I love it. I push against his chest and he rolls us over so that I'm on top. I feel like a princess up there, the princess to a throne of dirty deeds and motorcycles. I'm soaked in sweat, but it's hard to tell because the rain just won't stop coming down. Moving my hips, I find a rhythm that works for me, and I grind my body against beasts, making his back arch, bringing a growl from his lips. My climax is messy, ragged, and raw. It overtakes my body like a storm, crackling like the lightning in the sky above our heads. Beast flips me over, yet again, and crushes me in the best possible way, finding his own orgasm with an animalistic little snarl. Afterward, we lay there for several quiet moments before he pulls away and looks at me with the most cryptic expression on his face, like it's painful to be in my near proximity. I fix my clothes, giving him a defiant stare, and then stand up on shaky legs. We don't even get two minutes of peace before Gaz comes storming out the back door, looking to pick a fight. I thank a whole host of gods I don't believe in that he didn't actually see us fucking, although I'm pretty sure Beast could kick Gaz's ass. My brother makes his way across the pavement and gives us both looks, soaking wet and standing in silence. The hell is going on out here? He asks, and Beast rolls his shoulders, cracks his neck. I smell violence. I sense pain. Not good. Do you like hitting your little sister? Beast asks, and Gaz gives him a dark look. When she gets out of line? Yeah, I do. She's my responsibility, not yours. So why don't you fuck off? Gaz scowls and turns his attention to me. I feel my skin prickle and my hands clench into fists. I'll never forgive him for hitting me. And I'll never forgive Kat for watching, or Nellie for helplessly sobbing while I got the shit beat out of me. You've been running your mouth, Gidget? I've been covered in bruises, I reply, defiantly, lifting my shirt up to show the purple and black splotches underneath. Hard to hide, bro. I reach up and rub the runny makeup under my swollen eye. Gidget, would you mind going inside? Beast drawls voice so low I can hardly hear him over the pouring rain. I raise an eyebrow at the same time as Gaz. My brother is about the same height as Beast, but he's got a bit of a beer belly that the ex-MMA fighter definitely doesn't have. One-on-one, -on -one, it'd be interesting to see. But Beast can't start a fight with Gaz, not over me. As far as the club is concerned, I'm Kat's and Gaz's property. Beast is a part of the club, their brother, their loyalty is to each other, and nothing is owed to me. What are you doing, man? Gaz asks, when Beast takes a step toward him. He opens the French doors a little wider and gestures for me to go inside. I do, but only because I'm curious. Once I'm inside, Beast closes them and turns to Gaz. I'm still panting, still flushed with heat, and my heart is thundering. I watch as Beast and Gaz get into an argument that I can't hear, and then start to fight. Gaz is actually the one who swings first, but as soon as he does, the fight is on. Beast launches a fist into my brother's face and spatters blood across the glass. The two of them slam into the doors and crack the glass before I manage to pull the handles and let myself out. Beast! I scream as the bigger man knocks my brother to the ground and systematically keeps him there. It isn't hard, not for someone who used to make a living beating other people up. He puts his boot on Gaz's neck and holds him there. Wouldn't take much for Beast to shift his weight forward and kill my brother. I grab his arm and wrap my fingers around his bicep. He's fucking bristling with rage, quivering with it, but his face is still stoic, and there's no sign of that anger in his expression. No, he looks calm, cold, like a wolf in the snow, going in for the kill. He's not pissed off. He's calculating. Beast, listen to me, I whisper. And then I hear the heavy sound of Cat's footsteps. What the fuck is going on out here? 
His voice booms across the backyard as he pauses in the doorway and looks between his two men and me. Somehow, some way, I know I'm going to catch shit for this. Beast is going to catch shit. Gaz is going to walk away unscathed as usual. Cat looks right into Beast's eyes and barks an order. Get your foot off his fucking neck. Beast doesn't move. He's not going to. He's going to ignore his president, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why. Maybe all of that anger he keeps locked up so tight has escaped, and it's poisoning him? Turning his blood to fire? Or maybe he just doesn't like gas. I wouldn't blame him. I don't like the bastard either. Don't do this, I whisper, the wind grabbing wet strands of my hair. I'm freezing cold and I have cum soaking into my underwear. There's blood on Beast's arm and it's smearing beneath my fingers. The sight of it makes me feel sick to my stomach. Please let go of him. Beast stares down at Gaz and then after what feels like an eternity, he steps back. I'm not sure Cat heard what I said, so he grunts in satisfaction like Beast followed his order. He didn't, but only Beast and I know that. You get your ass upstairs, Cat tells me, nostrils flaring. The way he looks at Beast bothers me, but what can I do? I can't protect myself from Cat or Gaz. I couldn't protect Femme. I couldn't protect my sisters. Scowling, I turn away and march inside and up the stairs. I don't see Beast again after that. Chapter 15 I had no idea my loneliness could get worse. Yawning, open, like a void beneath me. I feel like I might fall down that hole and tumble forever. Reba isn't bothering me anymore, just like I wanted. But now, Dina, Shardu, and Amaya are ignoring me too. Beast's guard rotations have been taken over by Crown, and I know I'm running out of options here. Next time Cat calls me to club property, that'll be it. Blood in, blood out, right? I'm leaning over the railing on the top floor of the high school, watching the sky bleed tears that I won't shed. My eye hurts and my ass is bruised as hell. No matter where I go or what I do, I can't stop thinking about Beast and what he did for me. Because that's what it was, huh? I might embrace denial like a long-lost relative, but I'm not stupid. Gaz beat me up, so Beast beat him up. But why? Does he have a crush on me? I snort. A crush. Beast is a 33-year-old ex-MMA fighter who kills people for a dangerous motorcycle club. A man like that doesn't have crushes. That's the 17-year-old girl hiding inside of me. I get out a cigarette and light it, enjoying the dancing smoke. Those things will kill you, Crown says from below me, leaning against one of the porch's decorative columns. I wonder what he paid the campus cop to keep him off his ass. Must have been something good, because nobody in their right mind would let an asshole in a death-by-daybreak cut waltz around the halls like Crown does. That's the hope, I say, exhaling slowly. Glad I can't see his face. Besides, do you really have the moral high ground to be giving me sage advice? You get drunk every weekend, smoke mountains of weed, and fuck anything you can get your hands on. And you kill people, I think. But I guess I don't know that for sure, so I don't say it out loud. Crown doesn't answer me at first, but I know it's all true. Remember how he got his nickname? Do as I say, not as I do. He offers, and I snort, smoking my cigarette and enjoying every puff. When I'm done... I flick the butt over the railing and watch as it tumbles through the air and sizzles out next to Crown's boot. He glances up at me, and I smile tightly. Come down here and talk to me for a minute. Not a chance, I think, as I raise a brow, turn, and head back into the hallway. Lunch is nearly over, which is fine by me. I'm too sick in the head to eat, too rife with anxiety. My only goal today is to find out where I can go in this building that Crown can't or won't follow me. I come up with a familiar answer. The bathroom. Surely Granger told the others how I escaped at the church, so I'll have to be careful. 
Pulling a disappearing act from the toilets a second time is a slim to none chance. Not that escaping from school is an option if I want to save Femme and Gray both. No, I'm starting to think that to get away with this, I'll have to run from the last place in the world they'd expect it. The clubhouse. The sound of boots squeaking across the floor precedes Crown's appearance from around the corner. Wow, pretty ballsy of him. Usually, Dad's goons don't bother to actually come into the school. I let him walk up to me, drawing stares and wide, wide eyes as he moves past several students fiddling with their lockers. You're not supposed to be in here, I tell him, wondering as he gets up close if he knows what happened between Beast and Gaz, or if he knows why. I wonder if he'll be able to see past the thick layer of makeup on my face, right down to the bruises and the monster girl hiding underneath. My mouth curves into a sardonic little smile as Crown pauses and tucks his inked fingers into the pockets of his jeans. That violet and suede smell of his fills my nostrils, but I pretend I don't like it, leaning back and putting my red leather jacket against the locker behind me. To be frank, I'm wondering why the fuck I even have this jacket. Cat pretty much emptied out my entire wardrobe, leaving behind a single pair of steel-toed boots, three leather jackets, a handful of tees and tanks, and jeans. That's it. Well, I guess I have one skirt left that got jammed under the bed, a single pair of ripped tights that were hiding inside a sock, and a single makeup bag, courtesy of my locker. Slowly but surely, Cat is cleansing me of my autonomy, my individuality, and my freedom. If he really thinks he can break me, though, he has another thing coming. He might want to take a good, long look in the mirror and remember that it's his blood in my veins, his stubborn heart beating inside my chest. Cat made a deal with the administration, Crown tells me, giving me a surprisingly kind smile. His body is wide enough to block my view of the other students in the hall, but I can sure hear them, whispering, wondering. Nobody will dare say a fucking word, though. Even sheep know when a wolf's entered the pen. My mouth tightens, and I look away, past the blue and red tattoo on Crown's left arm, my eyes focused on the death-by-daybreak eclipse inked into his skin. He seems like a nice guy, but really, he'll never be anything other than my father's right hand, and anything attached to Cat is pure poison. I should know. I'm as toxic as they come. Is that a cop car? I ask, lifting my fingers and gesturing at the red and blue ink. It's hard to see with his arm bent the way it is, but I'm pretty sure the scene I'm looking at is a police chase. It is, he says, but I don't get any elaboration. At the very least, he straightens out his arm so I can get a good look. I make a genuine study of it, silently praising the artist for his attention to detail. Gidge. Crown starts after another moment of silence. Any moment now, the bell will ring, and I'll be spared this painful forced conversation. My eyes lift up and meet Crown's green ones. You can't run from Cat. You know that. What makes you think I'm going to run? I ask, stepping forward and sliding my nails up the length of Crown's bare arms. I'm not entirely sure why I'm doing it. Maybe a goodbye fuck wouldn't be so bad? I mean, I just got one from Beast. And then before that, Granger. May as well go all in, right? But Crown. Remember how I said that even when he's bad, he's good? He reaches down and takes my wrists, moving a step back before he releases me. I pucker my red, red lips and give him a look. I'll see what I can do about Gray, he tells me, his brunette hair curling slightly around his ears. As I look up into that handsome face of his, I have to resist the urge to brush some of it away. Clearly, Crown isn't interested in flirting with me. Nah, his tastes run more to lectures. Hard to believe we really fucked that night. But you have to promise me not to screw things up from your end. Cat wants me to kill a kid, I whisper, and Crown tenses up, eyes narrowing as he glances around for any possible eavesdroppers. There aren't any. Only an idiot would get this close to the devil. 
Then, of course, there's little old me wanting to fuck the devil. What does that say about my personality? When have you ever tried to talk him out of anything? Crown's face shuts down and he looks away, watching as Dina, Shardu, and Amaya make their way toward us. Fantastic. They haven't talked to me all day, and now that Crown is here, they can't seem to get over here fast enough. I cross my arms over my chest and watch them, waiting to see what this shit's about. Hey, Gidget, Dina says, flipping her blonde hair over one shoulder. Her outfit reminds me of something Posey would have worn, pink and tight and short. My stomach turns over, but I lift an eyebrow in greeting. And crown, was it? Dina looks at my bodyguard, or prison guard, depending on how you look at it, with an appreciation that can't be faked. She's just not that good of a fucking actress. What are you doing hanging around with a bunch of kids? Crown just gives her one of his big grins and says nothing, folding his own arms over his chest. What a pair we must make. Can I help you with something? I ask, wishing that damn bell would ring. Lunch break has never felt so long. You've been avoiding me all day, so clearly there must be something you want. Shardu and Amaya exchange looks, and the latter speaks up for her leader. You hurt Reba, she says, her lipstick too purple, her eyeshadow too green. Somebody needs to teach this girl how to put makeup on without hiding behind a mask of it. She flips her dark braid over a shoulder and pops out a hip. Emotionally? And physically. She has a huge bruise on her back. My heart clenches, but I don't give anything away. How can I explain that I have to push Reba away to save her? But, Dina interrupts, taking over the conversation again. That's what she's good at. Attention seeking. Never seen any other talent out of her. I stare down those bright blue eyes of hers, wondering what she sees in mine. Shadows? Darkness? Blood? I'm bathed in all three, wearing a dirty crown of chrome. She wants you to come to Trevon's party anyway. Dina pauses, like she's waiting for me to say something. When I don't, she happily fills the silence. It's after school tonight, but not at his place anymore. Trouble with the parents? I ask, feeling the burn of Crown's eyes on me. He's watching me, taking me in with those bright eyes of his. For the life of me, I can't figure out why. Clearly, I'm not about to bolt in the middle of the hallway, so he must be staring for another reason, right? Maybe he's wondering what happened between me, Gaz, and Beast? How his brother-in-arms ended up getting sent away? I push the feeling aside, refusing to let myself think about Beast. So what if he... fought Gaz for me? That doesn't change anything. These men and their feelings or lack thereof in the case of Granger, don't have any bearing on my decision. I have to run before Cat kills me or damages my soul in irreparable ways. Dina shrugs, her gaze on Crown. She can see that he's only got eyes for me and it's pissing her off. They came back early, so we're having the party at the Artifact. A shiver tickles my spine. The Artifact. It's been a while since I've even considered going there. You want a party for real? Get on. Sin's words echo in my mind, giving me a horrible sense of deja vu. Think you'll be able to make it? Shardu asks, playing with her ponytail of braids. She raises a brow in challenge, but it's Crown who answers for me. She'll be there, he says with a small smile, startling the crap out of me. I flick a wide-eyed glance his direction, but if he says I'm going, then there's a reason for it. More specifically, there's a cat-ordained reason for it. And cat? Well, he never does anything out of the goodness of his heart. I'm being used. My jaw clenches, but I force the tension out and make myself smile. Seeing the confused looks on the girls' faces almost makes it all worth it. Almost. But then I realize that Reba will be at the party, looking for me. My presence there is a threat to her. Fuck. I can't get a goddamn break. Finally, blessedly, 
the bell rings, and I back up a step, heart pounding. I won't go anywhere today. That'd be far too reckless. But what I am going to do is plan out an escape route. Whatever I'll be doing at that party tonight, it won't be fun. Cat is closing ranks, and I'm running out of time. I'll see y'all tonight, I drawl, mimicking a bit of Reba's southern flair. The girls back off, but Crown reaches down and grabs my arm, inked fingers curling around my pale flesh and sending flares of heat through me. I lift my eyes to his and find a critical expression on his face. Where are you going? He asks me, and I smile. Girls' locker room, one place you can't follow me. At least I'll get a moment of peace, a slice of privacy I've been severely missing this past week. To the gym, I quip, flipping my dark hair and pulling from his grip. My boots are loud as I walk away, and I can feel him following me, all the way to the door. But not inside of it. Nope. Just like he won't be following me when I make my great escape. I need to be careful, though. One mistake here, and I'm dead. Whatever Cat needs me to do at this party tonight, I'll have to do it, no matter how horrible it is. And that terrifies the shit out of me. Dance with the devil to escape the pits of hell. It better be worth it. Why did you tell them I'd be going to the party? I ask, staring down at my bed and the few pieces of clothing I have left. Hardly enough to put together a respectable outfit. Cat has seriously fucked my style. I don't look at Crown when he moves into the room to stand beside me, pointing down at the torn black Metallica t-shirt that I inherited from Gaz. The last thing I want to do is wear my brother's old tee, but its authenticity is unchallenged. This isn't a hot topic knockoff. This is real merch that Cat got from a concert in San Francisco, someplace called The Stone. September 18th, 1982. Best night of my life, save the night I joined the club. Cat has never included marrying my mother or having his four children in his best night of my life speeches. Piece of shit. Maybe that with the dark jeans, boots, and the jacket? I'm not sure if Crown is trying to be helpful or if he's mansplaining my outfit to me. Tossing some hair over my shoulder, I give him my best narrow-eyed look. It's a look I inherited from Cat. One that can crumble men like trees in a snowstorm. Not Crown, though. I think he's immune after all this time hanging around Cat. You know, I can't tell you why Cat wants you to go. Only that he does. Crown reaches under his vest and pulls a small plastic wrapped package out, tossing it over to me. It's an eight ball of Coke. My eyes snap up to crowns, and a spike of fear shoots through me along with Beast's words. We don't sell to kids. And as far as I've ever known, the club doesn't. Too risky. Kids start overdosing and dying. People start asking questions. Death by daybreak isn't above taking shots at law enforcement. But if at all possible, they practice avoidance first. What is this? I ask and then wave a hand dismissively when Crown gives me a sad, sardonic little smile. I know it's fucking blow, Crown, but why are you giving this to me? Makes me real suspicious-like, I drawl, sampling Reba's southern accent. Crown sighs and runs his fingers through his curly hair. Fuck that hair. It's begging for me to touch it. I smell leather and suede and violets as Crown circles around behind me, moving over to my desk and picking up a framed photo of Queenie and Posey. His knuckles are white as he clutches it in an iron grip, strength better reserved for holding a magnum or the handlebars of an Indian chieftain classic and not just a simple woodshot made picture frame. Something's wrong. I mean, the mafia's in town, and they're frequenting the casino. And they've lost their heir to the throne. Clearly, a lot of shit is wrong. But giving me an eight ball of coke and telling me to attend a high school party at the artifact? That's all sorts of messed up. You don't like this either, I continue, pressing the vice president of DBD. He's a good guy. 
underneath all the drug running and weapon smuggling and cow towing to cat. Huh. Or maybe not. Crown? What is this shit laced with? He glances over his shoulder at me, eyes shadowed with darkness, like the forest in a wild storm, evergreen at midnight. His curly brown hair tumbles over his forehead, and he shoves it back with an angry inked hand. I don't ask questions of my president, Gidge, and you shouldn't either. He sets the picture down, and then turns fully to look at me, spreading his hands in a helpless gesture. When is it going to be enough for you? How far do you really think you can push your father? The hope is I'll push him so far he'll finally end my misery, I quip yanking the Metallica shirt from the bed and heading for the bathroom. But then I remember that there's no door and chuck my jacket and tank top on the floor, exposing the purple lace bra underneath. Cat didn't touch my underwear drawer, thank fuck for small blessings. When I hazard a glance at Crown, I see that he's looked away, turned his back to give me some privacy. Shit, he's the complete opposite of Granger. Makes it a hell of a lot harder to hate him. You don't mean that, he tells me, but I think Crown underestimates the weight of my sorrow. I almost do. Except that if I'm going down, I'm going down with a bang. I've already decided to kidnap the mafia kid, and if that's not a death sentence, I don't know what is. Clearly, I'm a glutton for punishment. If you stand down, let Cat win a few quips, you'll be off the hook. He cares about you, you know. He's got a funny way of showing it, I grumble, as I shimmy out of the blue denim I wore to school and switch into a solid black pair of skinny jeans. Not my finest party outfit, but it'll do. I'm not really about this party tonight, but if I go, at the very least I can get drunk, and maybe, in a dark, dark corner, when I'm sure nobody's watching, I can find Reba and explain things to her, and... I flick a quick glance over to Femme curled up on his pink pillow. Going on the lam with a dog won't be easy. Besides, if I get caught, I'll be putting feminist in cat's scope along with me. It'd be better if I left him with my best friend. Your classmates asked for blow, right? Just give it to them tonight and save us both some trouble. You'll tell them all you're pissed at your dad so you bought it off some guy on Washington Street. I yank my pants up and button them staring at Crown as he turns around and narrows his eyes on me. Gidge, this is a direct order from Cat. Pass the blow out at the party, but don't take any. How many kids are going to die if I pass that shit out? I ask, but Crown just stares back at me with that placid mask of his. It's infuriating. Storming over to the bathroom mirror, I unzip my last remaining makeup bag and give myself a quick refresher. Crown moves over to the doorway, filling the entire space with his wide body and putting his forearms up against the door jamb. He leans into the small room, filling it with that intoxicating scent of his. You know I won't let a bunch of kids die off some bad blow, Gidge. Give me more credit than that. My brows go up, which makes me curse, because I'm only half done filling them in with some brow powder. Credit? How many people have you killed since you joined the club, Crown? Don't put the good boy act on for me. You may have been a cop once upon a time, but you're in a gang now. Get over yourself. Crown's face shudders, and he sighs, like I'm a troublesome child. It's annoying as fuck. Don't call the club a gang, Gitch, he says, his voice darkening. And if you think I did more good things as a cop than I've done as a daybreaker... You've got a very pretty view of the world. Here or there, in a blue uniform or a black vest, it doesn't matter. The whole world is about taking strength where you can get it and using it to defend what you want. I pause, looking at his face in the mirror. There's a darkness in his features that I don't understand, a past that makes this man that I'll never know. Part of me is glad. The last thing I need is the story of someone else's tragedy. And yet, a further part of me, something deeper and more twisted, is desperate to understand how Crown became who he is now. And what is it that you want? I ask, 
my voice far too husky for the enclosed space. I'm not even sure what I'm doing. Flirting with this man who let my father shoot my dog and put a gun to my head? I've made up my mind to run and to take Grey Wolf with me. What more is there? An old lady. Crown starts, tilting his head slightly to one side. My nostrils flare and I look away from the mirror and back down to the makeup bag on the edge of the sink. More than that, he continues, moving into the bathroom and towering over me from behind. Six foot five and muscular as all fuck. I want those big hands all over my body, I think. Feeling this hot flush spread from my chest and into my limbs, burning me up from the inside out. A wife. Crown doesn't touch me, but he does reach up and finger the ends of my hair. Someone to talk to, to start a family with one day. That's all I've ever really wanted. You'd best get far, far away from here then. I snort fiddling with my eyeliner and smearing black across my fingertips. Because any family you start while in the club is likely to die at the hands of a rival. Putting on a tight smile, I smear coal across my eyes and then switch over to the coral red of my lipstick. It's called Lady Danger, an apt description of my current state. We're dealing with the mafia, Gidge. Crown growls, getting angry with me. And if you'd stop making our jobs even more difficult, it'd happen a hell of a lot faster. He throws the plastic-wrapped bundle of drugs into the sink in front of me, and then grabs me by the shoulders, spinning me around to look at him. And once we're done with Grey Wolf and all of their bullshit, I'm gonna start working on my wants. My heart is pounding, and I feel this strange mixture of fear and exultation taking over me, making my eyes wide, stealing a considerable amount of my usual thunder. And which club whore is going to fill that niche, Calder? I ask, sneering at the use of Crown's real name. Calder Reed, consummate Boy Scout of the Death by Daybreak Motorcycle Club and serious pain in my ass. He looks down at me like I'm stupid for all of a half second before I raise up on my toes and crush my mouth to his, letting him take my wrists between his fingers and rub my suddenly thundering pulse points. He traces lazy circles with his thumbs, but there's absolutely nothing lazy about his kiss. Crown kisses me the way I imagine a white knight in a fairy tale might kiss a princess, with intent. It's all about intent with him. And as the cogs in my mind turn and click, I put his words up against his kiss. An old lady, a wife, a family. That's terrifying. I don't want any of that, especially not here, in the thorny embrace of the club. And yet, this feels too good to stop. Crown drops his hands to my ass, lifting me up to set me on the edge of the sink, reminding me of Granger in the most primal way possible. Granger fucked me here. Crown could fuck me here, too. It'd be reminiscent of that night, two years ago, when I let myself fall into the greedy hands of demons, let myself be twisted in manic, wild pleasure. I can feel Crown's cock, hard and insistent, pushing against the confines of his jeans. I've got my jeans on, too, making a quickie between us a substantially more difficult thing. Doesn't stop me from trying, though. My hands fumble with Crown's button, fingers slipping inside until I grip his velvety shaft. He moans against my mouth, driving his hips into my hand. His right hand cups my breast through the raggedy old fabric of the Metallica top, kneading and caressing in a surprisingly gentle way. Crown seems as into the moment as I am, until he's suddenly not. His eyes flick open, and he lets go of my breast reaching down to grab my wrist and pull it out from inside his pants. No, Crown says, voice hard, meaner and more forceful than anything Granger has ever said to me. We lock eyes for a moment, embarrassment filling my body in a warm flush. This is not supposed to happen like this. How dare he tell me no? 
Jerking back, I shove Crown in the chest and take off, through my bedroom and down the stairs, refusing to think about the smeared lipstick across his full mouth or the hard expression on his face. Thirty years old, and he's like a fucking love-struck teen with dreams of roses and romance. My cynical mind grumbles. He won't go all the way without some sort of feeling, will he? Being Crown's old lady, I'd be just as trapped as if I shot that kid in the head for Cat. No. Just no, no, no. Did you? Crown starts, following along behind me as I head for the front door. Yes, technically, Dina said the party started right after school, but any idiot at Ashbury High knows that only the losers and the band geeks show up before eight o'clock. Just wait. Don't bother asking my hand in marriage, Crown, I snap as I stop on the driveway and give his bike an unintentional but appreciative linger of the eyes. Crown has a hot ride, that much I can admit. Even if I'm not interested in riding bitch seat on the back of it for the rest of my life. If you ask Cat, and by some miracle he says yes, then remember this. I'm telling you, no. Crown pauses behind me, brow crinkling, one hand rubbing at the back of his head. Gitch. He starts, but I cut him off with a wave of my hand. Gidget, I correct but I'm pretty sure he's already called me Gidge like six or seven times today, and I've let it slide. Why? I'm not sure. Usually I'm pretty anal about that. Gidget. Crown amends with a long sigh, looking down at the steel toes of his boots. I never said I wanted you as my old lady. A cold front takes over my heated body and I frown. No fucking way am I buying this shit. You, I start and Crown looks up at me with a slight smile, a very patronizing smile. Gidget, when a pretty girl kisses me, I can't leave her hanging. He takes a step forward, and I take one back. I can feel tension between us, and I don't like it. With that look on his face, I'm even starting to wonder if it's all on my side. Cat would never... Crown pauses and exhales sharply. And besides, you know I've been dating Amber. Right. Amber, professional club whore. She's been living at the DBD clubhouse since I was, what, 12? Jesus Christ. Can we go to the party now? I choke out, feeling like a pitch just opened up beneath my feet and dropped me into it. A little booze, some harmless flirting, and blow for everybody. What a nightmare. You'll pass this out? Crown asks, placing the bundle in my hand. His fingers brush across my skin, giving me goosebumps. Damn him for that. I promise it won't kill anybody if you make sure to dose it properly. What's it laced with? I repeat, and crown sighs. Gidget, trust that there are people who know better than you. Crown releases the package and steps back, moving around me and over to his bike. He grabs his spare helmet and holds it out my way. I shove the cocaine into one of the pockets on my leather jacket, and then take it, sliding it over my head and pushing my embarrassment and frustration down along with it. Fuck Crown, fuck the club, and fuck Cat for trying to use me to further his interests yet again. First thing tomorrow, I'm getting the hell out of here. If that means I have to play along tonight, then fine. Good for you, Cat. For once... I'll do what you say. Just don't expect it to last. Chapter 16 The artifact is this towering confection of decay, a glorious urban blight in the middle of the woods. It's covered in graffiti and rotten streamers from parties long celebrated and gone by. It's been almost two years since I've been here, and I can't say that I've missed it. The cocaine in my pocket seems to burn through the fabric and into my skin as I saunter up to the front steps, noticing that the hole in the third stair has tripled in size since my last visit to the Jensen Manor. Because of my incorrigible luck, of course, it's Trevon Hunley sitting on the railing of the front porch, almost like he's waiting for me. Heard rumors you might be showing up here tonight. 
he says, looking at me with a steamy but wary sort of gaze, like he'd enjoy recreating that night at church camp, but doesn't know if he's willing to trust me again. I stomp up the steps, leaping over the hole and landing with a satisfying flutter of dry, dead leaves. Travone hands me a beer without my having to ask for it. Surprised you're willing to show your face. Oh? I ask, with a raise of my brows, popping the top on the bottle and slugging nearly all of it in one go. Travone looks on appreciatively and then grins, handing me another. And what rumors precede me now? Have I poisoned the volleyball team's Gatorade? Fucked the entire football team? Definitely not the entire football team, Travone says with a cocky half-smile. I swear, somewhere in the darkness, I can feel Crown watching me. For a moment, I'm tempted to kiss Travone and see what happens. Dating Amber, huh? Well, if Crown wants her as his old lady, I'm sure she'll jump at the chance. That woman's been slobbering for a position in the club for years with no takers. But rumor has it that all the craziness up at camp is your fault. Well, your father's fault anyway. Also heard you were bringing me a birthday gift. His smirk tells me all I need to know about that gift. My stomach twists into a knot, but I cover up the feeling by finishing my first beer and a substantial portion of my second. Travone watches me, but I'm cool as a cucumber. I've spent years perfecting the concealment of my emotions. A little thing like this, it doesn't mean shit. Especially since I'm not going to have to put up with it for much longer. That knot in my stomach gets a little tighter, but I can't think too hard about it. Running is my only option. Saving that, that kid, is my only option. Rather, it's the only option I have that I'll be able to live with for the rest of my life. Funny how rumors work, huh? I ask, feeling the beat of the music in the bottoms of my feet. Sometimes they get things dead wrong. I pull the cocaine out from inside my jacket and see Travone's eyes widen. And sometimes they get them dead right. He snatches the drugs in midair and grins at me. You know how to lay out a line? I'm guessing you can teach me? He asks, and I shrug, setting my beer down and getting out a pack of cigarettes. I smile with red, red lips as I cup a hand up against the wind and light up. Of course I fucking can. I'm an outlaw's daughter, aren't I? Only a noob lays out lines with a credit card. That much I do know from being around the club. Razor blades are where it's at, according to Kate Granger. Fucking Granger, I think, as I serve up lines of coke to the entire senior class of Ashbury High. Dina, especially, is excited to the point of squealing. You'd think I was passing out free Louboutins and not highly addictive and illegal narcotics. I am most definitely going to hell, I think, as I down another beer and light up another cigarette. Despite Crown's warning, I'm not at all tempted by the drugs. I'll stick to my lesser vices, thank you very much. Glancing up from the old coffee table, I spot Reba in the back of the room watching me. She is quite clearly pissed the hell off her arms folded over her white and red cherry dress, hair twisted up in a chignon. She looks like she's on her way to a cotillion, not standing in the crumbling living room of a long-abandoned house. Rap music blares from Johnny R's speakers, making what little glasses left in the window panes shake. When she turns away in a huff of red hair and skirts, I stand up and follow after her, certain that there's not enough blow left for anyone to get into too much trouble. Reba's waiting for me when I round the corner and I find her in the archway that leads to the old dining room. Leaning my shoulder against the rotting woodwork, I cross my arms over my chest, the alcohol buzzing in my head like a swarm of bees. I wish they'd sting my brain until I was so full of venom I forgot who I was and where I was going. To an early grave, most like. Stan comes on over the speakers, a little old-school M&M to rouse the crowd. I can hear them all rapping from here. The melancholy vibe of the lyrics suits my mood perfectly. Really, Gidge? You're a drug dealer now? Reba asks, spinning back around, red curls bouncing. 
Her green eyes are full of tears. They might as well be an ocean between us, a salty sea that capsizes every ship I try to send. I can't build relationships here, with the club and the mafia. That lesson's something I should have learned long ago, when my sister's shiny coffins were lowered into the dark shadows of the earth. Cat says jump, I ask how high. My voice is dry and far away, almost tinny. Too much booze, too much nicotine, too much bullshit. My heart feels heavy, my skin clammy. Tomorrow, it has to be tomorrow. Cat isn't going to give me much more time. You? Reba starts, cocking her head to one side, her pretty southern perfection contrasting against the ragged old glory of the Jensen Manor, all of that sprawling urban decay making her seem even more untouchable. But even the righteous bleed, that much I've seen with my own eyes. Goodbye, Reba, I think, as she takes a step toward me and pauses again. You've never once cared what your father had to say, she reminds me, and I give a tight smile. What can I really say? I still don't? That I'm going to disappear and never talk to her again? What's going on, Gidge? You know I don't believe any of that stuff you said to me in the driveway. She reaches up to touch the soft fabric of her white cashmere sweater, probably reaching for the bruises on her back. I'm sorry. I really am. I hadn't meant to push her that hard. Really? Because you should, I start. But my words are slurred. And it's not just the alcohol, it's the grief, too. Reba and Femme are the only people in my life that I still care about. What am I going to do without them? Jesus Christ, Gidge! Reba shouts, slapping a hand over her mouth. My eyes widen. That's literally the first time I've ever heard her curse like that. If this were any other situation, any other day, I'd be teasing her mercilessly. Instead, can you take Femme for me? I ask, and her brows go up. She reaches up to fiddle with her pearl necklace. Again, not the best time for jokes. I'll put him in the backyard tomorrow and let Nellie know you'll be by to pick him up. My mother's far too stupid to put two and two together. I'll just have to make sure that whoever's on guard duty in the morning, piece of shit Granger, I think, doesn't hear me tell her that. The asshole's too smart for his own good. Take fam for you? She asks, her voice high and tight. I notice her hand hovering around her throat. There was this true crime show I watched once, where the host broke down body language for the viewers using police body cam footage. A hand to the throat apparently means the listener doesn't like what the speaker is saying. Guess Reba isn't too happy with me right now. Why would I need to take your dog, Gidge? Standing up straight, I dig around in my pocket and I light up another cigarette. Is this because of the mafia? Lifting my face up, I look at Reba, really take in her every feature, wondering if I'll ever find a friend as good as her. I hope so. That is, if I live long enough to make new friends. Pulling the smoke from my lips, I exhale and close my eyes. Please don't ask me questions you know I can't answer. My eyes meet Reba's, but I don't know what else to say. Goodbye? No, I can't say it aloud. If I do, she'll hound me until she gets an answer. Passionate about the things she loves, that's Reba Keller. Huh, <laughs> the things she loves. Including me, huh? I'm sorry for pushing you, I whisper and then I turn and head down the hallway toward the staircase. Reba follows me, calling out my name, but the music's just switched to some awful mumble rap bullshit. Gross. Sprinting up the stairs, I check the old bedrooms until I find one that doesn't have teens fucking in it. That's a seriously hard friggin' task. The last room on the right, what used to be the master bedroom, I think, is empty. So I slip inside and slam the door, locking it behind me. There's a mattress in here, but it doesn't look near as old and decayed as the rest of the house. Probably got dragged in by some horny kids looking for a good time. Flopping down on the edge of it, I ignore the questionable stains and put my head in my hands, cigarette smoke trailing from my lips. What's the plan, Gidget? How are you going to get to Gray without anyone seeing? On top of that, how are you going to get away if you do free him?
My mind is working on overtime, desperately searching for answers. There is no alternative plan. This is how things have to go tomorrow. I have to leave, and I have to take that kid with me. If I don't, then I may as well have pulled that trigger on him because he'll be dead before the week is out. Fuck, I growl, lifting my head back up and tossing my cigarette in the corner. It's just my luck that it happened to catch a pile of debris starting up a small flame. Standing up with a groan, I storm over and crush the embers out with my boot, pausing as I notice the partially open closet door. There are names scrawled all over the wall in there. It's called the hookup wall for a reason. It's tradition around here to, after a hookup, come in and scrawl your name on the wall along with your partners. I've looked at it before, searching for Posey's name. It's on there several times. But maybe I was too drunk or high to realize there are names on the baseboards around the room too, and not just in the closet. Dropping to my knees, I shove piles of old solo cups and dried leaves away from the wall, wishing I had my phone so I'd have a fucking flashlight. Instead, I'm forced to rely on my lighter, the flame dancing as I crawl my way along the stream of names carved into the old wood molding. The dates in the corner are far too old to be from Posey's or Queenie's time, but I work my way around until I find some from their high school years. My fingers trace letters coming across Posey's name, not once, not twice, but three times. Jesus, I grumble, realizing that her name's in here a good dozen times over. I'm not one to judge. Hell, it really was Jesus who said that he who is without sin should chuck the first stone, right? And ain't nobody's free of sin. We're all draped, dressed, and doused in it. Me, though. I'm one of a few who revel in it. Just when I'm about to give up and head back downstairs for another beer, my fingers trace across a familiar cue. See, Queenie always wrote her name with a specific flourish, a cue whose tail twisted into a flower and a matching eye with a dot that bloomed the same way. My hands start to shake, the flame on the lighter bouncing around as I lean in close to look at the date and the name sandwiched between it and Queenie's scrawled signature. Kean. Fucking Kean. What the fuck? I whisper to the empty air, settling down next to the wall and splaying my palm over the words. There's more than just a date. A date that's about, uh... Seven months before Queenie's death? And she was eight months pregnant when she died, I think, tracing each letter with a fingertip. Queenie and Kean, like Romeo and Juliet, I'll love you forever, baby. Every eye is dotted with a tiny daisy. This is all Queenie's writing. Scrambling to my feet, I light up another cigarette and pace the floor a few times, those words turning over in my mind again and again. Like Romeo and Juliet. The club versus the mafia. Feuding families. Not unlike the Montagues and the Capulets. Letting my body fall against the far wall, I lean my head back and close my eyes. Queenie. Kean. Those words from so long ago echo in my skull like a trapped bullet, cutting me to pieces. This is for Kean. Kean, who died before Queenie at the hands of the club. Cat's doing. A memory flickers in the back of my mind. A fight between my father and sister that I blocked out with a pair of earbuds, just like Queenie had always taught me to do. The fight came right before she announced to the rest of the family that she was pregnant. Did Cat know first? Did he know the truth? Because if he did, and he went after Kian anyway. A choked off scream escapes my throat when Travone opens the door and stumbles into the room. My heart's pounding so fast I can barely breathe, my pulse racing too fast for comfort. It'd be so easy to close my eyes and drift away on a cloud of adrenaline and alcohol. What do you want? I ask as he grins at me and puts a hand up on the wall to stay upright. Tina has disappeared with Kellen. He slurs, naming his on-again, off-again girlfriend and best friend with a slight sneer on his handsome face. Thought you might want to hook up. 
With a roll of my eyes, I push off from the wall. No fucking way do I have time for Travone Hunley and all this high school bullshit. Not when I've just seen evidence that Queenie and Kian really were an item. Cat would have had to know. Queenie would have told him. After all, how else would Cat even know Kian was the father of her child? Fuck off, Trey. I say, pushing past him and then pausing as he stumbles and trips on the mattress, crashing to the floor, and not getting back up. Dropping to my knees beside him, I check his pulse and see that he's still breathing. There's vomit on his mouth, though, and his eyes have rolled into the back of his head. Holy shit, I whisper, as I hear footsteps on the stairs, crown sweeping into the room behind me. Get up. I've called the police. We need to be out of here before they arrive. What the fuck have you done? I choke out as Crown moves over to stand beside me, reaching down to wrap his long fingers around my arm. He pulls my shell-shocked ass up as I stare unblinking in Travone's direction. What have I just done? I knew the drugs were laced with... something. I mean, Cat didn't send me here for no reason. But Crown told me he wouldn't hurt kids. And you believed him? My mind screams as I allow Crown to drag me out of the room and down the hall. As we go, we pass several other students, passed out on the floor. One of them looks to be having a full-blown seizure. All we did was supply some of the mafia's dirty product, Crown says, mouth flat, face neutral, like he doesn't give a shit that kids could be dying in here. I try to jerk my arm from his grip, but he pulls me close and looks me dead in the eye. If you fight me, the cops will show up and we'll both be arrested. Or killed in a shootout. Is that what you want? If we leave now, the paramedics can get in here faster. You lied to me. You're supposed to be the nice guy. I whisper, hating myself because I knew. I knew. I fucking knew and I did it anyway. Just so that tomorrow I might get the chance to run. I sacrifice the lives of my classmates for my own. I really am thoroughly entrenched in the annals of hell. Crown pushes some of my hair back, tucking it behind my ear. His green eyes are dark and empty of emotion, just two shadowed hollows in a handsome face. That's your mistake, Gitch. There are no nice guys. Crown pulls me after him, and I don't resist. He has a point. What will I gain from staying here other than jail time or, more than likely, watching Crown have a standoff with the local cops? I'll get more people killed. And after Carol Briggs, I think I've already done more than enough of that. Chapter 17 Good thing I'm already planning on running away, or else I'd be a serious pariah. The other students, they'll never trust me not after feeding them bad drugs. I stay up all night, with Crown lording over me, denied a phone, a computer, a TV, so that I can't check the news. There's no way to know who's alive and who's not. You're as bad as the rest of them, just as much a monster, I whisper, my voice hoarse as I lay on my side and stare at that handsome face, just a mask for yet another one of my father's demons. Crown ignores me, his expression so blank that I start to wonder if I imagined that moment in the bathroom. Did that really happen? Was there truly fire between us? Shit, maybe he is dating Amber, maybe he doesn't give two fucks about me at all. After a while, I fall into a troubled sleep and wake to Cade Granger smoking a cigarette in my doorway. He doesn't look at me when I sit up, rubbing my sticky eyes and fighting off a hangover. Femme hops onto the bed and licks my face, giving Grange the side eye. If the asshole tries to come over, my three-legged dog will turn him into a three-limbed asshole. And here I was, thinking you were one of the worst ones. I grumble, drawing those brown eyes my way. Grange plays with his lip rings and then cocks his head at me, his rust-red hair slicked back in the center, shaved down the sides. What could have possibly changed your mind? he asks, but not like he cares. No, more like he's mocking me. 
Crown isn't the angel you thought he was? Granger's wicked mouth curves into a cruel smile. Isn't that fun? Now you know that behind all the lectures, all that upstanding citizen bullshit, he's just as bad as the rest of us. My eyes are narrowed, but between Queenie's posthumous message and the sea of bodies I saw on my way out of the artifact, I don't have a lot of witty repartee left in me. Turning my attention to the window, I can see Nellie's Escalade and Kate's bike in the driveway. That's it. Good. I might have a pounding migraine and a conscious rife with guilt, but hey, phase one of my plan should work out nicely. Get Femme in the backyard, talk to Nellie, get Granger to take me to the clubhouse. If there is a god out there somewhere, doubtful, then I guess he or she is listening because Granger turns to me and slides his smoke from his lips with two inked fingers, offering it up to me. I take it gingerly, careful not to make contact with his skin. Even with everything going on in my life, I can feel that tension between us, hot and sticky and ready to catch fire. My body throbs with remembered pleasure and my cheeks flush. Cat wants you at the clubhouse today. My brows go up. What for? Cade shrugs his muscular shoulders, leather vest crinkling, that spicy sweet smell of his causing my stomach to flip over in excitement. Guess you'll find out when we get there, he says, looking me over with a detached sort of expression that scares the shit out of me. Granger and I, we usually run hot. This faraway look in his eyes, I don't like. Today is the day, I think, sensing the energy in my father's sergeant at arms. Today is the day Cat wants me to shoot the kid. He's just used me to pass out bad drugs drugs that'll bring the feds sniffing around for the mafia. And now, he wants to cement my loyalty. Blood in, blood out. When I run, I hope I don't leave a crimson trail for him to follow. Because if I do, I may just very well end up with Granger's gun in my face or Beast's hands around my neck. The club, as sanctioned by Cat, won't hesitate to put me in an early grave. The Death by Daybreak compound is positively buzzing when we pull up around noon, the hot sun blazing its way through the sky and chasing away some of the forest's dark shadows. I can't see the cabin where Gray's being kept, not from here. Instead of heading up toward my grandmother's old house and Uncle Benny's cabin behind it, we're at the main clubhouse, where I first did blow with Granger, argued with Crown, watched Beast brawl, and sucked Sin's dick. Yep, all happened right here. Finally, Cat says when he sees Granger and me pull up in a front space. Granger, we've got church, he grunts, and the asshole nods, lighting up another smoke and acting like I don't exist. You stick around and don't get yourself into trouble. Wander off these grounds and I swear to hell if the mafia doesn't kill you, I'll do it myself. My dad stalks off, pushing his shades up into his graying hair and leaving me alone on the pavement next to a row of shining bikes, beasts of chrome and leather. Situated like that in a perfect line, they look too pretty to be used as instruments of death. I wonder how much blood they've lapped, how much death they've seen. Sin comes out the front door of the clubhouse with his blue faux hawk styled, new earrings in his ears, silver hoops that catch the light as he turns to look at me. The scar on his lip tugs up at the right side of his mouth and makes it look like he's smiling. Pretty fucking sure he's not, though. Actually, he doesn't look all that happy to see me. Whether that's because he doesn't want to see me, or because he knows what I'm in for today, I'm not sure. He has a beer in his hand, but as he comes down the steps, he passes it over and I take it. Where's Beast? I ask because Crown is tight-lipped as hell, and I'm pretty sure I hate him even more than Kate Granger. Huh, <laughs> what a surprise. I should have known all that Boy Scout bullshit was a game. He's my father's right hand for a reason, right? Thing is, I knew. I knew, and I did it anyway. Beast. Sin starts, pausing as Gaz appears from around the corner of one of the warehouses, black and blue in the face, one eye sealed shut, lips puffy and split. 
This sick thrill of pleasure courses through me, and without meaning to, a small smirk lights my face. Gaz sees it, too, and it pisses him off like crazy. You think this is funny, you little whore? He roars, coming right at me. He's got a whole group of guys with him that I don't quite recognize. Like, maybe I've seen them once or twice at most. Prospects, maybe. That'd be just like Gaz, to use our father's title to ingratiate himself to the new recruits. For a second there, I wonder if he's going to use his posse to beat me up, storming across the pavement with murder in his eyes. Makes you feel like a big man to beat up 17-year-old girls? I quip, as Sin steps in between us. His mouth pulled into such a tight frown that even that scar of his can't make him look like he's smiling anymore. Not today, Gaz. Sin says, his voice darker than usual. Like he's just aged ten years in the last week. He puts a palm up against Gaz's chest when my brother doesn't show any indication of stopping. But I don't need Sin or Beast or anyone else to stand up for me. I never have. Moving around to Sin's left, I glare at Gaz, my face free of makeup, and I try to get a grip on his hatred for me. I've never understood it. And yet, there it is, burning in his dark eyes, like a little cat clone. If we were at home alone, I'd be scared for my safety. Hurting someone lesser than you doesn't make you a badass. It just makes you an asshole. As soon as the words leave my mouth, Gaz throws himself at me, and Sin shoves him back and into the arms of one of the prospects. Really? Gaz snorts, finding his feet with a little stumble. My little sister's pussy is that good that you turn on your brother? You and Beast both fucking traitors. He walks a wide circle around us, but the way he looks at me, I know he'll be on the front line of the chase. And when he finds me... I probably won't live long enough to see anyone else. Sin doesn't deny Gaz's accusations, waiting for him to head up the steps and into the clubhouse. Speaking of beast, I begin again, and Sin sighs, turning to look at me with a detachment that reminds me of Crown. Fucking Crown. Where is he? California. Doing some work for the Las Gatos chapter. Sin shrugs, his muscular shoulders, and then pulls out a cigarette, lighting up and offering it to me. I take it and wait while he gets out one for himself. If he weren't so damn scary, I think Cat might have let Gaz and his boys beat him to within an inch of his life. The Prez was furious. Sin pauses, blinking silver eyes at me. What the hell happened, anyway? You were there, right? Swallowing hard. I look away, toward the trees. I have no idea where I'm going once I get out of here. I figure I'll ride as hard and fast as I can for as long as I can. I have my passport, some cash I stole from Cat's backyard stash, and the idea of finding an airport, any airport, and getting the hell out of Dodge. Not saying I'll be completely safe in another country, but almost everyone in DBD has a felony on their record so they won't be able to get into Australia. I wouldn't put it past my father to recruit a squeaky clean assassin and send him after my ass, but that's neither here nor there. One problem at a time. Beast didn't like that Gaz was gloating about beating me up. I reach up a hand, touching the tender flesh near my eye. Sin cringes and turns away, mumbling curses under his breath. I mean, I think that's what it was. Now I just sound like I'm hedging. Then again, no way in fuck I'm going to tell Sin that I screwed Beast again. No need to cause trouble for him when he gets back from California. What time am I supposed to visit the cabin? I ask. And even though I'm planning on running, I still feel this tight sickness in my chest, like I've got massive heartburn churning up my insides. Sin stiffens and looks at me with this horrifying amount of pity. Just after my watch, I think, he says, and then grimaces, like he's not even sure he should have said that much. Just fuck, Gidge, he curses, running his palm over his blue hair. This all could have been avoided, you know? Yeah, sure it could have, I say, my voice bone dry and splintering. There's this anger buried deep in sin that's desperate for release. 
One day, if he isn't careful, it's going to break free and split him in half, bleed him out on the pavement and leave his soul for dead. And what time is your watch? He pauses, smoke halfway to his lips, and looks at me critically for a long moment. I'm on my way there now. Eight hour shifts. Sin slips the sig between his lips and takes off, muttering under his breath, the Eclipse logo on his back catching stray shafts of sunlight as he moves between light and shadow. I watch him go, finishing my cigarette and my beer. How the hell am I going to get past Sin? He might have some sort of weird soft spot for me, some sort of lingering guilt from Queenie's and Posey's deaths. Doesn't mean it'll be easy to get past him, not by any means. So, my mind gets caught on Gaz's cruel words. Sex. It worked on Granger. Beast. Not quite as well on Crown, but I could probably distract Sin long enough to get the keys to the cabin. Maybe long enough to get inside to grab Gray. With an exhale, I sit down on the seat of Kate's bike and make my plan. Sin and Crown are on guard duty tonight. Not fucking good. I'm already cursing under my breath as I pick my way up the hill in my steel-toed boots, palms sweaty, knees weak, heart thumping a strange melancholy soliloquy inside my chest. I told Granger I was going to the bathroom and then made my way outside and up the dirt path toward the cabin. He isn't paying as much attention to me as he should because he knows I'm not going anywhere, not when I'm all the way out here in the middle of buttfuck nowhere Oregon, USA. I climb the path and find them, both engaged in conversation. They stop immediately when they see me standing there. Where the hell is Granger? Sin snaps, running his fingers through his blue hair. I like his faux hawk, and his earrings, and his tattoos. He's seriously fucking pretty for a biker. And Crown, as much as I dislike him, I can't deny that the soft sea green of his eyes, the rich chocolate of his hair, and the auburn highlights from the sun all give him a model-esque perfection. He belongs on a magazine cover or a billboard, not standing in the middle of the woods with a stoic expression of disappointment and distrust etched into his handsome features. I told him I had to go to the bathroom and then snuck out here, I say shrugging my shoulders and heading the last few feet up the hill to stand in front of them. My pulse is racing, and even though I knew I was coming out here today, I'm nervous. I'm scared. I'm excited. My nipples are pebbled to hard points, and when I shrug my jacket off, I hear them both make a sound of appreciation. I've torn that old Metallica shirt from last night into a midriff, widening the holes in the chest so that bits of my zebra pattern bra show through. The last skirt I found under the bed, the one Cat missed in his purge, I brought that with me in my purse and switched into it behind a tree. It's a nice, sexy mini, something to make this a little easier. But I was not betting on Crown being here. Idiot. He starts, and there's a warning in his voice. I don't know why he's warning me off, I haven't even done anything yet, and after last night, his words mean literally nothing to me. For all I know, half the senior class is dead, or at least hospitalized, and me? I'll be blamed for it. The mafia? They'll be blamed for it. Got a smoke? I ask, and Sin digs a pack from his pocket, pulling out a cig for each of us. He lights himself up, and then gestures with fingers covered in rings for me to lean forward. I do, and he monkey fucks my smoke to life. What are you doing up here? Crown continues, digging his fingertips into his pockets and looking me over. He seems to like what he sees, but I have a feeling he's not going to act on it. No, the only reason he fucked me the first time around was because he was drunk off his ass. That's it. Clearly, it didn't go over quite so well the second time we tried it. What the hell am I going to do with him? I want to know how many of my classmates are dead, I say, smoking and letting their eyes trail over me. Sin's face scrunches up, and he grits his teeth, glancing away sharply. Crown, though, that asshole, 
stares right through me with those green eyes of his. They're not so much moss green right now. No. Instead, they're bathed in shadows and a grim sense of duty that I'm sure he finds righteous, but which I just find downright annoying. Don't I at least have a right to know that? Your dad wanted them all dead, Sin says, and Crown turns a look on him that's hell frozen over. I would not want to be on the receiving end of that look. I realized that despite all my hard-won cynicism and skepticism, I underestimated the fuck out of Calder Reed. He's as scary as Beast and as mean as Granger. Worse even, because he puts a nice guy facade over the top of it all. But Crown argued against it. Nobody's dead. What was in that blow? I ask, frustrated to the point of tears. That is, if I were still the type to cry over things. When neither man answers me, I get frustrated and turn, punching my fist into the bark of a tree so hard that pain ricochets up my arm and into my shoulders, making my teeth hurt from the impact. Jesus Christ, you made me give that dope out? You shot my dog? You put a gun to my head? And now you're going to make me... That guy, Gray, he... Putting my palms over my face, I feel this layer of stress just evaporate off of me, this strange, cool sense of detachment. Huh. Maybe that's what Sin and Crown are channeling right now, this loss of control. There's nothing I can do that I'm not doing right now, so why am I letting myself freak out? What's the point? It'll either work out or it won't. And if it doesn't, I'll be heading for the long, long sleep, so who gives a shit? I'm already in this so deep. I don't understand why can't you just tell me this one little thing? I ask, lifting my face up and dropping my hands to my sides. All of my strength, all of this resistance, all of these quips. I'm running out of steam. Gidget Kesselring is fucking tired. Fentanyl. Just that one word from Crown, and then... Among other things. He looks at me without emotion, and I stare right back, trying to decide if he's really going to be the final roadblock, the nail in my coffin, if I'll be laid to rest next to my sisters because Crown won't get his stubborn ass out of my way. I need a minute. He grinds out after a moment, moving forward and stepping around me. Sin, don't let her out of your sight. Crown continues on down the hill, and I glance back, watching as he disappears through the trees. Wow. If I'd have known an emotional breakdown would shake him loose, I'd have tried that shit a long time ago. I turn back to Sin, but he's not looking at me, just smoking and staring into the woods. No noises escape the cabin. That shit is soundproof to high hell. But I bet Gray is still alive. Otherwise, why would I be here? What's his problem? I ask moving up to lean my shoulder against the wall of the cabin. Sin doesn't seem alarmed that I'm standing near the door, nor does he seem bothered or concerned that we're only a few inches apart. Actually, his eyes flick my direction and take in my long, pale legs, that flash of perfect thigh that shows beneath the pleats of the miniskirt. I think Crown wants you, he says, which is sort of the last thing I ever expected him to say to me. My eyes widen slightly, but I'm already shaking my head. He's dating Amber. He basically just told me he wants to marry her. Sin snorts, flicking his cigarette to the ground and crushing it out with his boot. For as worldly as you pretend to be, for as smart as I know you are, you can be a dumb, naive motherfucker sometimes. Sin turns to look at me, this frown pulling at the edges of his mouth. His expression reminds me of that day in the cemetery when we damn near fucked against the base of a tree. That's where we need to get right now. I need to catch him with his pants down, so to speak. That, and you're curious for another taste. One last fuck for the road. I ignore the cynical thoughts cycling through my mind and stab my own smoke against the wooden wall of the cabin, dropping the butt to the dirt. Crown doesn't want me. I say, and it scares the crap out of me how young that phrase sounds coming out of my mouth, 
kind of like how I felt stupid when I thought of Beast having a crush on me. He probably bends over and takes it from Cat. Sin chuckles, but the sound is dry and bitter. He tucks his inked fingers in his pockets, stiffening slightly when I push off with my shoulder and come to stand in front of him. There are a million ways I could approach this, and any one of them has equal chances of success and failure. The only way I'll know is if I try. Crown doesn't want me, I repeat, exhaling sharply, my rust-red eyes focused on Sin's silver ones. But maybe you do. He rears back like I've slapped him, reaching up to grab my wrists when I try to put my arms around his neck. Gidge, what the fuck are you doing? He growls, using that familiar anger of his to combat something I know we both want. Maybe he doesn't like me, I don't know. But he'll fuck me, that much I know for sure. You don't want me? I ask, moving my hips so that my pelvis undulates against the front of Sin's jeans. He's hard, I can feel it. And his eyes, they're rife with lust, but broken too, like he's fighting a losing battle against himself. I always thought that maybe you had a soft spot for me. You're the president's daughter, he says. But his grip on my wrists relaxes. As soon as I get a hand free, I pop the button on his jeans and his breath hisses out in a rush. Gitch. But Sin's words cut off abruptly when I get my hand inside his pants, finding the thick length of his cock straining against his boxers. Stroking him with slow, careful fingers, I lean up on my tiptoes and put my lips to that warm spot between his neck and ear. My tongue flicks out and tastes Sin's pulse, that cinnamon and leather smell of his consuming my senses. Jesus motherfucking Christ. He curses, but he doesn't go anywhere. No. Instead, Sin angles us toward the cabin and shoves me hard against it, putting his much bigger body up against mine, grinding my pelvis into the wood with a movement of his hips. His breath feathers against my ear before he leans down and captures my mouth, his kiss just as sharp-edged and dangerous as it was in the kitchen a few weeks ago. I can feel the blade of his passion cutting sharp lines into me, making me bleed. On the outside, I'm groaning and rubbing against him, gasping when his left hand finds its way under my shirt and pushes my breast out of the firm cup of my t-shirt bra. On the inside, though, I feel nothing. Nothing at all. I've shut down. Because if I don't, I'm not sure that I'll have such an easy time risking my life risking graze, running away from these men. They consume me like greedy flames, their orange and red fingers licking up my pure and aching flesh until I'm nothing but ash in their hands. Ever since that night, I've felt it, that little spark of addiction. I like being ruined, destroyed, Worshipped, fucked by these leather-clad monsters with their steel and chrome beasts, their skin of ink, their hearts of shadows. I like it, and that scares me. I like it, and that's why I have to run. Sin takes my tender nipple and rolls it between his fingers, sliding his tongue against mine in time with rolls of his hips. He moves his cock in my sweaty palm, seeking my warmth desperately searching for the hot core between my thighs. This isn't a lovemaking session, Gidge. I tell myself, get those panties off and get it done. And yet, I can't seem to hurry this moment any more than I already have. Instead, I focus on kissing Sin so hard and furious that I'm a match for his punishing passion, a force as capable of knocking him back as he is for me. I need him sweaty and sated and off guard. That's what I need. My life literally depends on how I fuck right now. Reaching down with my free left hand, I start to wiggle out of my panties, and Sin makes this sound of frustration like I'm getting in his way. With careless ease, he tears the thin silk off of me and lets the lacy remnants fall to my ankles. 
His fingers seek me out, teasing my core as I swipe my thumb over the head of his shaft, paying special attention to the slit, working it in time with his groans. Shit, I'm an idiot. He curses against my mouth, sliding one and then two fingers inside of me. Your dad is gonna kill me if he finds out. Better hurry then, and nobody has to know. I whisper, my left hand finding the pocket on his vest and pulling out his keys. I time that move with a swirl of my thumb around the base of his head, working Priajack from his cock to use his lube. Got it. The keys come into my palm like a magic trick, and I chuck them aside, right into the thick green fronds of a fern. I cover up the sound with a moan that's not entirely false. No, Sin's fingers feel good, his dick hot and heavy in my hand, and his mouth. It's a storm of wild heat that I want to drown in. I'd stand stone still in the pouring rain and open my mouth to the showers, let the lightning come down and destroy me. Releasing Sin's cock, I push at his jeans, until he pauses, the delicious curling motion of his fingers, shoving the denim down his own hips and lifting me up like I weigh nothing. A pleased and slightly surprised sound escapes me as he grinds his hips into me, moving my clit with the head of his dick. Need a condom, Sin mumbles. But when he goes to reach for his pocket, I panic realizing that he might figure out his keys are missing. Grabbing his chin with my hand, I dig my black painted fingernails into his flesh and kiss him so hard that it takes my own breath away. On the pill, is my response. And even though I know there are risks, my life's on the line here. And well, maybe I'm just a hedonistic little lush, and this is what I want. No hesitation on Sin's part. Now that he's got the green light. He cups my ass in a tight grip and lets me deal with guiding him to my opening. Our eyes meet just before he thrusts up and in, hard and fast, pinning me against the cabin door with a cry. My arms curl around his neck as his hips slam into my aching body over and over and over again. The door rattles in the jam, and I just know that Gray can hear us. Doesn't matter, though. Even a thought as sobering as that does nothing to cool the fire in my veins. No, it's an all-consuming rage, a forest fire destroying lives, just like the one that killed the forests the day of my sister's funeral. Pain, heat, ash, and flame. That's all I am right now, just a bundle of wild, throbbing nerves. Burying my face in Sin's neck, I let myself fall into the pleasure, tumbling into that shit like Alice down the rabbit hole, into another world, into a broken, dirty world of leather and blood and bikes and bullshit. Oh, shit, bitch. Sin moans as I wrap my legs tighter around him, my hips working just as fast and hard as his, pleasure spinning through me from both my clit and my cunt. I'm gonna come. Do it, I growl, digging my nails into the back of his head, throwing my own back so that it hits the wood of the door. Now, I want it, all of it. Sin makes a dark little masculine sound of pleasure and thrusts even harder, burying every inch of himself inside of me. I've always been good at controlling my own pleasure, and this is no different the signs of an orgasm prickling at the edges of my vision. It'd be so easy to give in and let myself go boneless with pleasure. No, I won't come. Unlike sin, I need my wits about me. My pussy clamps around him, pulsing in pleasure, and I feel this evil grin spread across my mouth as he groans, losing himself inside of me, his cum hot and liquid as it fills me and drips down my inner thighs. There's a long moment there, where we stay together, bodies locked, hearts pounding against one another. But then he's sliding out of me and stepping back, steadying me on my feet, before he lets go and backs up several steps, almost like he's scared of me. Well, maybe he would be if he weren't so pissed. 
That anger's lit up his eyes again, and I'm pretty sure he doesn't know what to do with himself. Sin. I start. But he's already shaking his head and turning away from me, running his fingers through his hair and then getting out a pack of cigarettes. I need to get him out of here, I think, as he just stands there and smokes. But how? Are you okay? Can I have a minute, Gidge? He snaps at me, and I frown. You're going to fuck me and then yell at me? I ask, bending down to dig in my purse for some wipes. Real classy, Colton. He spins back to look at me and sees me with the wipes in my hands, getting ready to clean up. I cock a brow. Can I at least have a minute to clean up before you start yelling at me? He opens his mouth and then snaps it shut again. Fine, but I'm not going very far. He snarls, moving over to the edge of the woods and leaning his shoulder against a tree. I wait for the span of a few breaths as he pulls out his phone, answering it with a noncommittal grunt. Fucking finally, I think. Grabbing the keys and unlocking the door to the cabin, I slip inside, taking a moment to slip in a tampon, best quickie cleanup tool ever, and pulling on a fresh pair of panties. The smell of blood stings my nose, and my nostrils flare as I take in Gray, slumped over in his chair, hands and ankles still bound, dirty brown blood all over his face and hands. He doesn't even look like he wants to live anymore, like the life's been sucked out of him. Knowing my dad did this, my brother, Crown, Beast, Granger, Sin, I feel sick. The smell is awful, like copper and urine, and it takes everything I have to cross between bars of shadow and moonlight to kneel by his side. Why am I risking everything to save the son of the man who ordered my sisters raped and killed? Why? 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 Because in Grey Wolf, I see myself. He's the son of an empire he doesn't want. By saving him, I save myself. That's why I'm here, because I don't want his blood on my hands. This isn't for him, it's for me. Even in my heroism, I'm intrinsically selfish. Hey, I whisper, trying to ignore the delicious whisper of sex singing a siren song in my blood. Fucking sin was mind-blowing, and I want more. I hate him, and I still want more. How screwed up is that? I must really hate myself but I'm not going to be that girl anymore. Gray. I snap his name off the end of my tongue like a whip, and he comes to, blinking bleary eyes up at me. He seems surprised to see me there, and then fear quickly overtakes his expression. He thinks I'm there to kill him. Digging my fingers into the pocket of my jacket, I pull out the army knife that Queenie gave me when I was 11 and start to undo his bindings. He's been strapped into the chair with plastic handcuffs, and holy fuck are they hard to cut. I think I nick us both a little as I dig into the plastic, but that's okay. If I have to wound us both to save our souls, that's all right. It's what I have to do. What are you doing? He asks me as his hands come free and his body slumps toward me, too weak to hold itself up. You're gonna get us both killed. Get the hell out of here. Do you want to die? I snap back at him, freeing his ankles and helping him to his feet. It's not easy. The kid, and wow, my perception is fucked because really he's about a year older than me, can barely stand. He's been tied up for too long, beaten and tortured for too long. I know how these things work, remember? He growls, gray eyes flashing. You do this and the club will never stop hunting you. I don't care, I whisper back, even though my blood is filled with icy shards of fear. This is it. This is really it. This isn't sneaking out to a party, wearing pants my dad doesn't like, putting on too much lipstick. This isn't even getting a girl killed at church camp. It's betrayal. Pure and simple. I can never come back from this. Never. Hooking Gray's arm over my shoulder, I help him toward the door, but our progress is excruciatingly slow, and I can feel my anxiety rising in waves. 
I'm honestly surprised Sin isn't in here already, sounding the alarm on my ass. The fear in my heart peaks as the cabin door creaks open and a figure walks in, tall and imposing and wearing a healthy frown. But it's not Sin. It's Crown. What the fuck are you doing, Gidge? He asks, his voice like ice. I stare at him, and for the first time in forever, I'm really and truly scared. Reaching into my jacket pocket, I grab Posey's tangerine-colored taser. She bought it when one of her exes started stalking her, but the club took care of him real quick. His body was found floating in Bay Creek, behind a cluster of apartment buildings. No leads. The cops don't care about some deadbeat, low-grade drug dealer. Huh. Pretty sure he used to work for the club, too. I mean, he wasn't part of the club, just a paid lackey. But still. I realize my mind's wandering, and I'm hesitating. Hesitation will kill me here. It's the absolute last thing I need. Gidge, it's not too late to fix this. Crown starts, holding his hands out toward me. I look him dead in the eyes, and then pull the trigger. Electricity makes my hair stand on end as the prongs make contact with his chest, dumping voltage into Crown's big body and dropping him to the floor of the cabin. But this isn't fucking Hollywood. Tasers don't knock people out. No, it's going to buy me a few minutes at most. Crown is groaning, his body still shaking with tremors as I lean gray against the wall and bend down, digging through the vice president's pockets. When I find the keys to his bike, I stand up and take hold of Gray again, leading him outside and into the darkening shadows of early evening. We don't have a lot of time, I grunt, as I do my best to support Gray's weight, eyes flicking across the horizon, looking for sin. He can't have gone far, right? Shit, this is never going to work, I think, as I drag Gray behind me like a broken doll. If I were to drop him and run, then maybe, but not at this pace. I need you to walk. Walk? He chokes out, the caustic bitter notes in his voice burning in my ears. They tore my toenails off. They embedded nails in my heels. They burned me until I passed out. How do you want me to walk? I swallow hard past the smell of him and the dark, dark thoughts tugging me down as surely as his extra weight. I keep us moving dragging Gray down the slope and then finally, sitting down and sliding us along the wet, steep curve of grass. It's a hell of a lot easier than walking, although I'm pretty sure I've got blades of green up my ass crack. Crown's bike is parked next to my grandmother's house, shining in the sun, a pair of helmets waiting like this whole thing was planned. I slump Gray against the seat and help him into his own before putting mine on. Glancing back, I see Crown, stumbling out of the cabin door like he's drunk. His eyes meet mine as I swing my leg over the bike and Gray uses the last of his strength to climb on behind me, his grip around my waist surprisingly strong despite all the shit he's been through. I'm worried about his ability to stay on the bike with me, but what else can I do? This is our only chance. Hold on like your life depends on it, I murmur taking advantage of the keyless ignition and peeling out of the space before Crown even makes it down the slope. It won't be long before he alerts Cat, and I'll have the entire club, Gaz in particular, on my ass. My heart pounds, sweat pouring down the sides of my face as I head for the north exit, knowing that it'll be closed and guarded, but also aware that it opens automatically from the inside only. When I zoom up on Crown's bike, Wearing his helmet, the barbed wire fence begins to creep open. As soon as there's a space large enough for me to get through, I zoom past it, wondering if the on-duty guard is going to shoot me in the back as I speed away. But nothing happens. Won't last for long, though. Once they figure out I've spirited Gray away, we'll have the entire club looking for us. Where are we going? Gray shouts over the raging wind. It whips the loose strands of my hair against my face, making my swollen lips sting. You're getting dropped at the nearest bus stop. I scream back as we continue on through the darkness of the woods, 
It's about three miles to the nearest public road, and then I'll officially be off club property and close to the freeway exit. <laughs> I can't believe I stole a Daybreaker's bike for my big getaway. That action alone puts a high price on my head. After that, I don't care what you do. Gray doesn't say anything for a while, but I'm not surprised. I know I've literally pushed him to his limit. I ignore him, focusing on controlling the massive piece of chrome between my thighs. I may have grown up in a biker gang, but I can count the times I've driven a bike on my own on one hand. Actually, I've never ridden one of the club's motorcycles. It's against the rules for a woman to drive her own bike. Bunch of prehistoric caveman bullshit. Instead, I took lessons with Reba's cousin, Ryan, when he came to visit last summer. That's it. I'm literally riding on a wing and a prayer right now. There's not much between me and wrapping this bike around a tree except for pure, unfiltered fear and a strangely desperate need to live. I didn't even know I had it in me, that I cared this much. It's a big fucking shock. Take me with you, Gray shouts after a while, his voice like gravel. I can barely hear him over the breeze, but as I pause at the stop sign, checking for semi-trucks before pulling out, I answer in the brief break from the wind. No fucking way, I snap, taking a right and heading for the freeway. Once I get out of here, I'm going straight to the Portland International Airport. I've stolen enough cash from Kat to get a one-way ticket the fuck out of here. Leaving the country is my best option. Maybe. I hope. But there's no other choice. There's no life here with Kat. There's no life for me if I murder some goddamn kid. I snitched on my fucking family. Gray chokes out, sounding much sharper, much more alert than he did in the cabin. He digs his bloodied, nailless fingers into the front of my leather jacket. His face is still pretty, even with his nose crooked and broken, his eyes swollen and purple, his lower lip split. I wonder if we were normal kids, in a normal school, with normal families. Maybe we'd have dated. Maybe he'd take me to the prom. Hilarious. No chance, I shout back, and he looks away sharply. He's right, though. He did snitch. And his family? They'll kill him as fast as the club will if they catch up to us. I'll take you to the airport, I amend finally, and give you money for a cab. I'm guessing you don't have an ID, so a flight is out of the question. Thank you, he whispers, his voice barely audible above the roar of the engine as we approach the main road and I flick the headlights on. I'm on edge, waiting for the sound of rumbling bikes, for my doom riding for me on beasts made of steel and darkness. I purse my lips, and I refuse to think about crown or sin, beast or granger. Who cares about them anyway? They don't mean shit to me. I may not ever have known how big of a lie that was if I hadn't turned the corner and run right into a roadblock. A roadblock made up of Mafia Men. Chapter 18 I squeeze the brake as hard as I can, but the road's too wet and I'm going too fast. We turn completely sideways and skid, but the bike ends up rolling anyway. Crown's beautiful, beautiful Chieftain Classic. I'm so sorry, I think as my head flies forward and hits the handlebars. All I can see are stars. I'm just not that good of a driver. Thank fuck I know how to handle a fall, though. Grabbing onto Gray's hands, I throw myself off the side of the bike and roll, my shoulder hitting the ground with a crack and a scream of pain that makes my entire body go numb. We scrape across the ground as the motorcycle flips up on its head and tumbles end over end with the scream of metal smashing into the black Cadillac that's idling in the center of the road. There's a small explosion, a rush of heat and bright orange light that chases away the shadows. Gray's grip loosens on my midsection and we roll apart, skidding across the pavement at such high speeds that I can feel my skin being flayed from the flesh on my legs and hands. If I weren't wearing a helmet or a leather jacket, I might have died. I still might die. There's blood everywhere. I can taste it. 
It runs hot and coppery down the back of my throat as I come to a stop on my back. It takes my head a while to realize that I've stopped moving, my eyes blinking up at a dark gray sky, watching as the clouds crack and rain comes pouring down in sheets. Footsteps pad across the wet pavement, shiny black dress shoes that I can barely see through the blood running into my eyes. I think I split my lip. Or worse. No, no, definitely worse. I think I'm in shock. The footsteps pause beside me, and their owner leans down, giving me my first look at Ivan Wolf, the underboss of the Grey Wolf Mafia, the most powerful man in the organization, save Grey's dad, the Dom. I know this is Ivan from pictures Kat showed me. He's always wanted me to know who my enemies are. Too bad he never showed me a picture of himself. This wasn't quite what I was expecting, Ivan says, in a silky, smooth voice, with just the hint of an Italian accent. I can barely make out his facial features, because I'm so disoriented, and I can hear Gray screaming from the other side of the road. All I can see, though, is Ivan's smile, far too white in the bloody blackness. But I'll take it. Arms reach under my elbows and yank me mercilessly to my feet. Since I can't stand, I'm thrown over a bulky shoulder by one of Ivan's goons, my last view that of Gray being dragged toward the back of the second caddy. Fuck. Shit. Damn. I've just thrown myself from one den of wolves into another, and unless my dad, or Gaz, or the four men I can't seem to stay away from, Unless they decide to come and search for a traitor, I am well and truly fucked. Ruination. I'm addicted to it. Always have been. Fuck. I was born ruined. I reveled in ruin. I slept with ruin. And this time, it's me that's ruined everything. I just hope to hell I survive this. We hope you have enjoyed this unabridged production of I Was Born Ruined, Death by Daybreak, Book One. Written by C.M. Stunich, narrated by Brooke Daniels and Alan Carlson. This program was produced by Audio Sorceress. Text copyright 2019 by C.M. Stunich. Performance and production copyright 2021 by C.M. Stunich. All rates reserved. For more information on our productions, please visit our website at audiosorceress.com. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this.